Hey y'all. Welcome back to another video. Here's part 3 of what if Naruto was Madara's grandson. As always, huge thanks to all of my Patreons. I really wouldn't be able to make any of these videos without your immense support. As always, the full story is already out over on Patreon for you guys along with a couple other stories as well. Anyways, enjoy the video. Chapter 13, Coming Home. Two years after Naruto and Karen's departure from Konoha. It's the beginning of the end of the world as we know it. Madara's voice is almost like a lance through anyone's confidence. His self-assuredness of everything he speaks of is so absolute that he can make the impossible sound like child's play. Pain does not like Madara. The prophetic wisdom of the century-old madman had correctly determined that the world would indeed remain an eternal conflict. The freedoms granted to those with power to rule over the weak and make them suffer is unjust and wicked. Something truly evil lies within the core of shinobi culture. The ancient Uchiha had warned them in the past and they hadn't heeded it. Yahiko's death was an inevitable happening if they'd continued to chase Jiraiya's pretty words of peace, and they'd fallen into it foolishly. Yahiko's dream lives on, but it has shed the weakness bound to it by the philosophy of peace through understanding. The shinobi world would never truly be free from endless hatred unless ruled with a fist and will so mighty that even a god could not twist fate to change it. Pain hates Madara for planting the seeds of this mess within him. He hates how right the man has always been. He despises him for dragging him away from his ideals and showing him the dark truth of the world. Pain's mind has been irreparably changed and he knows it, but can't for the life of him see what was ever good about what they'd been trying to do so many years ago. But a god in the making cannot falter. It is far too late to whimsically think that perhaps there is a good in people that can be used to bring peace. There will always be evil souls that cannot accept transcend their desire forevermore. He is a fledgling god. He has not come into his own power yet. That is the only reason that Madara still secretly has the reins. Pain is but a child compared to the legendary prowess of a virtually mythical warlord. But it wouldn't last forever, and soon Madara would understand that things will go the way that the god of pain desires them to. If Madara defies him, then he will regret opening pain's eyes to evil in the first place. You know what to do. Madara's every action is an order to those who interact with him. Whether it be a partonizing finger wag or slippery double meaning sentence, no one dares to refuse him. Yet. Madara vanishes into the rain and lightning of Amiga Kura's overcast sky. Out of the corner of his eyes, he sees Konan give a tiny slouch of relief. Pain activates his communication jutsu and soon every member of his Akatsuki is spiritually present. Akatsuki. We are now a mere few months from enacting our plan to capture the Jinchuriki and Baijuu. Make your final preparations. Zetsu's dual tone voice chirps and growls. We figured out who's good for getting the Jinchuriki. Listen closely kids Pain Sama agrees that the teams are appropriate for your tasks. Datara and Sasori will be taking the Aichibi. About time, Un. Datara gives a dramatic hair flip that can barely be seen through the holographic lens of Pain's jutsu. Pain continues without pause. Hidan and Kakuzu, you will continue to search for the Nibi Jinchuriki. Do not engage it while Jiraiya is present. Underestimating that man will result in failure. K. Hidan practically spits. Some old war relic shouldn't underestimate the power of Joshi. Shut up Hidan. Kakuzu nearly snarls in annoyance. Kakuzu you damn dirty heathen. Enough. Pain orders stoically. Some of them he'd recruited himself and they now know to listen when he speaks. Predictably, silence echoes. Itachi, Kisame. You will go to the east border of Tsuchi no Kuni and capture the Gobi Jinchuriki. We have received information that his training in the use of the Gobi's chakra has ostracized him from Iwagakur, so he is hiding somewhere in the mountains. Pain cannot see Itachi's face, but he knows there is something dangerous lurking in those eyes that are oh so similar to Madara's. Like a cornered animal ready to fight. Madara has promised to keep him in order. Understood, leader. Kisame speaks for the pair of them. He drolly gives out the order that they are not to engage the Jinchuriki until the previous one is sealed. The fate of the world is banked on this plan. There can be no room for failure. Land of hot water, forest outskirts. Karen doesn't like it when Naruto is frustrated. She knows that he gets frustrated when he hits a block in his training or anything else that's important to him. Everything shinobi related came to him with ease, with the exception of the ability to heal. His prowess with the Makutan had excelled, his Sharingan more refined than ever. His Taijutsu was so monstrous that she honestly doubted anyone could defeat him in the art at this point but the things that he couldn't do really mattered to him. He sees her scars as his personal responsibility and for some reason that she can't comprehend, 
resents himself for his failure to help her. There hadn't been anything that he could not conquer through his sheer will. Not once did he give up trying to master Senju Hashirama's jutsu. Never did he pause in his pursuit of mastery of ninjutsu. He never stops believing in himself, even when the chance of him being successful is to his mind, low. And without hesitation or fear of rejection, he'd asked her on their first date. The best day of her life, though he insists there are more to come once they're finally home, away from the brutal training regime he's putting the both of them through. Once he's confident that her battle senses are refined enough to protect herself without his or anyone else's help. Success is what drives him. And now he has met something that he has struggled to find even a smidgen of success. So she had been immensely happy to discover that his month-long moping mood had been completely destroyed after they'd gotten into a fight with Orochimaru's henchman of all people. Although it had taken a few days to discover why, and even now she didn't really understand. Naruto had rattled off on a ranting lecture about chakra interconnectivity that had flown over her head but it seemed to perk him up so much that she couldn't help but smile at his improved confidence. We finally found you, fucking shithead. The absolutely lovely and polite pinkish red-haired girl. Unfortunately you're too late to receive an autograph, Naruto drolls boredly. Please refrain from using expletives, my interviewer won't be able to record the contents of our conversation. He gestures to Karen, who rolls her eyes at him winding up his opponents like usual. Very funny, dickhead. Karen inspects the girl. Well, old enough to nearly be an adult at least. Her chakra is almost poisoned. Threaded together with a vile entity similar to the other three chakra signatures dotted around them. Their chakra writhes in synchronized restlessness, not battling its hosts as much as tempting them. As if the chakra is whispering to them, begging them to let it take control. The face of this girl is as restless as this chakra. Dark bags under her eyes her greasy hair led Karen to believe that she doesn't take much time to take care of herself. Cracked, pale lips and numerous creases on her skin are just a few features that make her look deprived of the self-help that she looks like she needs. And she's twitchy. Although that could be a side effect of finding Naruto, a chakra monster in human skin. Orochimaru's pets, hmm? Naruto drones without care. I suppose it makes sense that you were looking for me. Your owner is too scared of Jiraiya and the Nibi to go after Sasuke, so he thinks that I will be a suitable replacement for his perverse goals. The gun by strapped to his back clinks slightly, tied to his back around his waist with white fabric attached to the hilt. Although I suppose that as weak, pathetic and sniveling he is, of course he will seek out my power. He has a long history of failure, and I'll be glad to give him his last. His taunting has a predictable effect on the rabid and unprofessional strike team. Two more equally gruesome-looking men leap out of the trees and the third remains up in the trees. Deathly pale skin and sickly appearances are a bounty, but their demeanor is self-assured. They are truly delusional to think that they might be capable of defeating Naruto. But there's an unusual synergy between their chakra, and Naruto is seemingly curious. I'll give you some space. Karen leans up and pecks her enormously tall boyfriend on the cheek. Don't take too long, I'm getting hungry. She vanishes from sight leaving only a small pile of leaves floating peacefully to the ground. And a gigantic arrow where she'd been standing. She's getting quite adept with my substitution jutsu. Naruto comments, seemingly to himself. He inspects the arrow briefly and sees that it had some impressive velocity to bury itself nearly completely into the earth and leave a web of cracks. A song on a flute begins to play out and Naruto feels the chakra trying to manipulate his own. He finds some amusement in it. Such weaklings wouldn't be capable of affecting his chakra not when he has finally perfected his control of it. Naruto leaps back into the air, deftly jumping over the tall orange-haired one as he tries to take a shot at him from behind. It might take more than that to catch me. Naruto's mocking rendition of an encouraging tone resounds loudly. With his refined sense, he ducks under another arrow. That was close. The smile in his voice is equally clear. Just fucking transform already. The redhead screams at all of them. Without a hand seal or cue, the sound four are engulfed by the vile chakra produced from the joie. Their physical transformation is something fascinating, but more so is that they seem to be drawing strength from each other as well. Their chakra resonates, not unlike his and Karen's do when they're in a good mood and in close contact with each other. It is a phenomena that Naruto had originally chalked up to the natural resonance between them because of their Uzumaki lineage. But these shinobi are making him think that there might be more to it than that if they can artificially extend a bond to people of completely different blood and chakra types. Orochimaru's Junjutsu. I finally get to see it in action. Doten Kekai, Doro Domu Earth Release Barrier, Earth Prison Dome. A two-story high earthen dome forms around Naruto, 
dense and blocking out all sunlight. He feels the tug on his chakra, trying to drain it from him. Ghostly and demonic phantom worm-like creatures sprout out of the ground. The many mouths bite at Naruto and he feels no pain, but notices that they attempt to grab his chakra and pull it out more viciously than the Earth Dome is. He smiles, understanding their little game. Drain him of chakra to make it an easy capture, but they should be fully aware that they would need to come at him with intent to kill if they want him brought to Orochimaru. The snake should have come himself, he might put up a fight before Naruto skins him alive. Naruto uses only his willpower to drag his chakra back into himself. Something like this is juvenile compared to the powers of the Rinnegan, his current goal to awaken. He sinks into the ground like it's not even there. The four on the outside observe the dome impatiently. It's not working, Jirobo mutters, hands buried in the dome. He's not giving up a drop. Let us in Jirobo. He can't fight us and hold on to his chakra. Sakon stands ready, now separated from Ukon and both in their fully transformed states. Sakon and Ukon run into the barrier of earth and it lets them slip in. Unknown to them, Naruto observes this interaction and how the jutsu didn't need to be deactivated in order to let in the similar chakra wielders. The inside is pitch black but the twins' experimentally enhanced eyes allow them some clarity. Not that it did them any good seeing as Naruto isn't in the damn dome. Kitamaru is still perched in the tree when Naruto's head rises out of the branch. He doesn't have a moment to speak when Naruto's Sharingan forces him to stop. Sharingan, Fusi Koi Malfeasance. Kitamaru tries to scream out to them and protect them but the arrow fires at Tuya before he can muster any control over himself. But as it turned out he didn't need to. Tuya was already sending her Doki summons his way as soon as he was put under the Genjutsu. Not only that, but the rest of the team launches into action too. The barrier falls and they all converge on his location. Naruto is now more curious than ever. I'm positive that they couldn't all have sensed me in the tree. This is just a tiny Makutan bunshine. He lets the Doki shatter his wood clone and observes silently, close but with his chakra clamped down completely. They have no idea that I'm here, so they don't have any sensory prowess that goes beyond feeling my chakra. Naruto assesses their tactics. But as soon as I put the archer in a Genjutsu, they all knew where I was. Naruto places a hand on the branch he's standing on and subtly moves some chakra under the redhead's foot. A small stick pokes at her foot, unnoticeable to anyone but her but the archer is leaping away before the girl is. Does their curse mark make them have some kind of chakra hive mind? It could be plausible. The marks all emit the same chakra but take unique transformations tailored to its bearer's chakra nature, manifesting as a variety of body morphing. None of them have the same horns, skin tone and strange marks. But Naruto doesn't know of any chakra besides a Baijuu's that can not only serve as an extrasensory connection between a number of skilled shinobi but also physically transform them. And he knows for a fact that this strange and powerful chakra is not that of any Baijuu. Theoretically, he could apply this knowledge in his attempts to heal Karen's scars. By resonating his chakra with hers, he might be able to take advantage of her own special chakra and force it to heal her on his behalf. A union between their chakra could share the qualities of it. Of course, his chakra would completely swamp hers, but the theory is there for him to attempt. Now, if only he can figure out what this strange chakra coming from the shinobi is. There is a tinge of Orochimaru's foulness in there, but it mostly seems to be some kind of augmentation that boosts the power of its wielder. The sound four are jittering on the spot, always in motion or using ninjutsu or genjutsu. Like they're afraid to stand still. Well, Naruto just so happens to have the tools required to test them. He grabs his gun by, channeling sharp wind chakra to its edge and gives one wide swing. The sound four have a mere second before a colossal gale of wind erupts from behind the trees. A wide net of wind chakra spreads outwardly with tangible blades wisping around in it erratically. Tuya is hit first. Her flute shreds into pieces while tree trunks and branches are sent flying at her. The concussive force blasts her away and she receives deep cuts on her enhanced skin before she can get out of the cone of effect. Kitamaru tries webbing himself too but it proves ineffective against the gale. Jirobo proves to be the best at blocking it, creating a thick earthen wall that the razor wind only cuts through so much before being halted. The conjoined twins in the ground merge, and while they're cut up the most it's what happens next that gives Naruto's theory more validity. He's gone again. I can't feel him. Spider Guy reveals. He crafts a new flute from his hardened web with practiced ease and gives it to the bleeding redhead. Tuya barks out that she needs healing, and Naruto observes in fascination as Sakon and Ukon start healing themselves rapidly. The three other shinobi have no healing chakra nature. Naruto has discerned as much with his mind's eye of the Kagura, 
but they all start healing at exactly the same pace. You four are quite interesting. Naruto's voice calls out to them, hidden under the debris of trees made by the veritable typhoon. Come out and fight us fair and square you cocksucker. Tuya screams at him. Be careful what you wish for. This is your chance to flee and live another day. I can't guarantee that I won't kill you once you're at my feet and defeated. Naruto would kill them of course, but he can be merciful if they choose to leave of their own accord. Orochimaru-sama does not permit failure. Sakon and Ukon speak in eerie unison. What is Orochimaru compared to you? Naruto nearly coos to them. You could be so much more than just his slaves. All you need to do is take that power from him. Think of a life without slavery, without the suffering he inflicts on all those who have the misfortune of being associated with him. The freedom to choose your fate is the gift a very wise and powerful man gave humanity long ago. Do you think him to be a god? Do you think that he will not discard you when it suits him best? He sent you to die by my hands, to be nothing more than a distraction to gauge my power. Live for yourselves and you will truly be greater than he could ever imagine. Naruto feels the curse mark's power completely drown out their own. As he suspected with Sasuke's mark, it affects the mind too. Shut up you damn piece of trash. Jirobo seemingly loses his restraint and draws power from his allies for a ninjutsu. Doten, Domu Gormu Earth Release, Earth Prison Golem. The Earth Golem is much larger than he was expecting, possibly rivaling the size of his half-body Susano. It would have been more impressive if the orange-haired one had created it with his own strength, but Naruto supposes that when he breaks it with ease, it will be demoralizing for this little motley crew. Said group of which are all perched on its shoulders. It stomps forward, with the redhead's humanoid summons being beckoned by her new flute to attack him once more. How sad. Naruto sighs, rising up out of a branch and stowing his gun by. He catches an arrow fired at him with nothing but raw strength and throws it with the same velocity at one of the doki killing it and dispelling it for good. He forms a snake seal. Makuten, Mokujin no Jutsu would release, would human. A wooden hand sprouts from the land to block the earth golem's punch. It does so effortlessly, and the rest of his would human begins to rise as well. The chubby humanoid of wood is far wider and distinctly more muscular appearing than the Doton creation. Without pause, the wood creature crushes the earth with veritable ease. No one said that he could use the fucking Makuten. Naruto smiles at that. Of course no one did. But importantly, his wood human is unusually strong against the golem. In fact, it seems to be ravenously eating the chakra of the golem. He picks up the details with his Sharingan. The Mokujin's arm had grown ever so slightly and black leaves hung off of tiny twigs that Naruto knows that this jutsu doesn't create. Only two types of chakra interact with the Makuten this way. Naruto narrows his eyes. If it's not by Juu chakra, then it must be. Orochimaru is nothing if not a skilled scientist, it seems. Naruto comments idly. But now that he knows the secret to the power of the curse mark, there's no point in leaving this lot alive. Bastardized Sinjutsu. All this time, this curse mark had been a fragment of Orochimaru's power and a weak, easy-to-produce Sinjutsu mode. That's why they resonate so well with each other, because they're all using the same pool of power. The curse mark seems to be designed to provide the benefits of Sinjutsu Chakra to those without the capacity to learn true Sage Mode. If he can discover the condition at which Sage Chakra is normally absorbed, then he may just have a clue on how to finally learn how to use it for himself. The creepy jitters that the four are exuding may be the clue that he needs. Mukuten, Mokuryu no Jutsu would release, would dragon. Using the terrain, Naruto forces the fallen trees to melt and become massive serpentine dragons and chase the Otto Shinobi around. He only manages to capture Tuya, but he calls that a success. The dragon returns to him, slithering up the Mokujin. The mouth of the dragon becomes a strong set of stocks to hold her completely still. No. Tuya screams and tries to flail, but Naruto only tightens its grip on her to prevent any movement at all. Tiny branches worm into her mouth and nostrils, even keeping her eyes clamped open to stop her from blinking. For a moment, she is completely still. Naruto keeps his Sharingan on her while the Mokujin bats away the other three's attempt to retrieve her, and in that moment he finally understands why his father didn't use Sage Mode against Obito. Her Doki dispel instantly. She absorbs Sinjutsu Chakra from nature and it proves too much for her weak body to contain. She turns to stone and dies. The resonation between the other three weakens. Naruto's wicked smile is one of a man who has apparently made the greatest discovery of his life. Tuya's stone statue is released by the wood and it collides with the ground, shattering into pieces. 
Jirobo, Kitamaru and Sakon slash Ukon all give a final and insignificant stand against him. Without any further use of them, Naruto cuts them all but the big one down. You're too late. Jirobo reveals, curse mark receding as he spits out globs of blood. You'll cooperate with Orochimaru-sama whether you want to or not. I see. Naruto is unconcerned. So your owner wants to use Karen against me. He knows that I like to fight alone and thinks I'll give my body to him to save Karen. How naive do you think I am? I wouldn't have let Karen out of my sight if I didn't know she was capable of escaping. Naruto cleaves his head off with the wind sharpened edge of his gun by. Karen's face clearly shows her displeasure at the delay. Kabuto respectfully keeps his distance. Or rather, remains vigil in case Naruto decides to end things quickly. Now now, Uzumaki-chan. Orochimaru soothes. I'm sure that Naruto-kun will be happy to give me what I want in order to protect you. You are his one weakness, after all. Naruto's already got a girlfriend. Me. So maybe you can go find Jiraiya and beg him to take you back. How crude. Perhaps you will be more agreeable in my custody, Senai Jashu hidden shadow snake hands. Karen weaves around the many snakes sprouting from his shoulders with enviable grace. Two golden chains sprout from her back. Skiujin Red Yang formation. Crimson chakra forms between the two chains, wobbling like a flag in the wind between them. The chains sweep around and completely disintegrate anything that comes between them, including Orochimaru's snakes. That is a Hokage level barrier jutsu, Orochimaru observes with a sickly smile. Getting around the need for several strong shinobi to cast it is no easy feat and yet you trivialize it with your special chakra. Naruto has trained you well. Knowing that Orochimaru's snake style ninjutsu would be an ongoing problem, Karen creates seven more chains and plants them in the ground around the both of them. The red yang barrier shapes like an eggshell, and using these anchors, she suspends herself between them before elongating all of the chains until she's well over 50 meters above him. There is a great cracking noise as the chains connect under the surface of the earth, separating the arena from the rest of the ground with the extremely powerful barrier. Skyu Torikago Red Yang Birdcage. Karen announces, and wills the barrier to close in on the Sanin. The walls get closer slowly, threatening to obliterate him. Magnificent. Orochimaru praises, seemingly genuine this time. He leaps onto the barrier, but launches wind chakra off of his feet to propel himself off of it before he can touch the aggressive red shield. Orochimaru does this several times, getting closer to Karen. Karen responds by twisting the barrier as if it were a kink in a hose, completely separating herself from the Sanin. With no more options Orochimaru is forced to allow a snake to swallow him whole before they are consumed entirely by Karen's jutsu. The snake dispels, taking Orochimaru with it and away from the realm of humans. Kabuto summons the very same snake on the outside of the barrier. Marvelous, truly. Orochimaru says, leaving the mouth of the large snake. They observe the barrier externally as it dissipates, before the extremely long spider leg-like chains start crawling their way over to them once more. She wouldn't catch him again of course, seeing as this mode of transport appears to be no faster than running. But it does make quite an intimidating image when he knows how he could have been defeated by that barrier. At least it appears that the chains cannot sprout more chains off of them. Orochimaru takes off at blurring speed and runs up one of the chains. He is careful to keep on the outside of the effective field for her jutsu. Futan, Kazikiri no jutsu wind release, wind cutter. Karen weaves numerous hand seals. Oscillating waves of sharp wind chakra pulse down all of the chains in dense halos. The Sanin hurtles over them with his unnaturally flexible legs, rapidly approaching Karen long before she can retract the chains. Futan, Shinku Tobikamu wind release, vacuum dive. Karen plummets to the ground using Naruto's jutsu. Too late, little Uzumaki. Orochimaru taunts, elongating his neck and shooting an extending blade out of it. He hears a terrible shrieking noise far too late. Futan, Rasenshuriken. From the ground, a wildly spinning wind jutsu is thrown upwards and whizzes past Karen without touching her. It detonates in the air and creates a massive ball of grinding and shredding wind chakra that Orochimaru simply cannot comprehend for the time being. His blade pings off of the violent ball of chakra, before the shuriken bisects him through the middle. The one half of Orochimaru's body that isn't turned to fine dust and gruel sails down to the ground with wide eyes and lands with a wet slap. Naruto catches Karen in a bridal carry and sets her down. Thanks, Naru. She mutters, sucking in her lip as she comes off the adrenaline high of fighting a freaking Sanin. Don't let down your guard just yet. Naruto keeps his eyes on Orochimaru's fallen body, 
keenly watching as he seems to draw chakra from nothing before regurgitating another version of himself from his mouth. You continue to surprise me, Naruto-kun. Orochimaru licks his lips with his long tongue. It seems you've even mastered the jutsu that your father could not. I would have died if I were anyone less. Naruto pays attention to Orochimaru's rising chakra reserves, seemingly absorbing it from nowhere. Too bad he knows better now. The special link created between Orochimaru and the bearers of the curse mark allows him to draw power from them at any point. It's not just a discount sage mode inducer, it's designed to provide aid to Orochimaru whenever he needs it. If there is synergy between bearers, then it stands to reason that Orochimaru can exploit it better than they can. Perhaps Naruto can exploit it if he has a chat with that Chunin exams proctor. No. It's time to end Orochimaru once and for all. For too long he has been free to cause trouble, and he will continue to be a nuisance if Naruto doesn't put him down now. Oh please. Naruto nearly rolls his eyes. Too late for flattery? Kukaku Orochimaru asks audaciously with a chuckle. Naruto punches the ground, shattering it open with barely any warning. He drags Kabuto out by his neck and holds him up by it. I still haven't paid you back for the Chonin exams. You had potential and yet you wasted it with this creature. Hey, Kabuto chuckles as well. Maybe you just don't understand loyalty, Naruto. Kabuto's chakra scalpel flares to life and Naruto lets it hit his chest, above his heart. Predictable. Naruto mutters in contempt, before the wood clone unravels into many flexible but strong branches that wrap Kabuto from head to toe before he can even react. Makuten! Orochimaru exclaims in excitement. He looks ready to froth at the mouth from the mere thought of possessing Naruto's body. A light blue sword erupts out of the ground and skewers Orochimaru. He vomits himself out of his own mouth again, drawing power from the other curse mark bearers across the world. Finally understanding that Naruto is not to be taken lightly, Orochimaru kicks things off. Mandara no Jin formation of 10,000 snakes. True to its name, thousands of snakes appear from Orochimaru's mouth, seemingly replicating and surrounding him. Naruto rises up out of the ground, half-body Susano armed. Get going, Karen. Right. Karen dashes off at full speed as opposed to the leisurely walk that got her entangled in a fight. Naruto considers his course of action. He places his hands in another snake seal. Makuten Bunshine. Two of his own head appear out of his broad shoulders, each with a matching pair of arms. Snakes slam ineffectually against his Susano but still try to slither underneath. Each head and pair of arms weaves a horse seal and lets chakra flow to their lungs and throat. Katan, Goka Mekiaku Fire Release, Great Fire Annihilation. Three great walls of flame blot out any further attack against his Susano, but while the visibility is low, Orochimaru has taken his opportunity to ramp things up even further. Naruto reabsorbs his wood clone appendages and braces for impact from a large purple snake summon, Manda. Summoning me for one measly brat, your pathetic Orochimaru. Manda chastises viciously. He is no ordinary child. The Sani narrows his eyes. Naruto smirks. Maybe Orochimaru can provide some kind of ample challenge after all. In Kanahagakur, Hokage Tower Meeting Room. A small assembly of Jounin are discussing the next Chonin exams. Everything had been proceeding fairly normally until out of nowhere, one Mitarashi Anko started howling in pain and grasping her neck. She's dry retching and crying by the time everyone in the room comprehends what's happening. Mitarashi. Tsunade leaps out of her seat. She's diagnosing the Tokubatsu Jounin before. He's afraid. Anko rasps, curling into the fetal position with strain. Who's afraid? Tsunade asks immediately, finding chakra loss in her but with no obvious source. Anko wails but says one word before passing out. Orochimaru. Get me a Fuenjutsu specialist, now. Land of hot water, border forest. Naruto laughs joyously and Orochimaru does not share his appreciation of the battle. The full-body Susano stomps forward and meets Manda's attacks blow for blow, punching away the snake when it gets too close and throwing it off whenever it gets a tight wrap on the light blue engine of destruction. Naruto is still suspended in its belly while he weaves a tiger seal. Katan, Goka Mesitsu Fire Release, Great Fire Destruction. The flamethrower of enormous proportions touches the ground and Manda is forced to stop his attack. The flames burn at the feet of the Susano while Naruto remains unharmed and protected by it. Perhaps we need to prepare a new assault, Manda. Orochimaru suggests with a scowl. Now would be the time if you have any bright ideas. Orochimaru waves through a summoning. Kushios, Sanju Rashomon Summoning, 
Triple Rashomon. Three gates block the line of sight between Manda and Naruto. Naruto's grin is near face splitting. He clenches his fists and wills his Susano to grow in power. Behold, Orochimaru. My perfect Susano. It grows to the point that it dwarfs Manda entirely, with a wingspan probably equal to Manda's full size. Naruto rises up to the jewel on its head and unleashes a swing of unparalleled destruction. It smashes through the Rashomon with ease, but the concussive damage alone is surprisingly not enough to stop Orochimaru's creative collaboration ninjutsu. A giant sword of Kusanagi sprouts from Manda's mouth, begotten by the same principles that he used to abuse the bond between his subordinates. Naruto bats it away with the left arm of the Susano, but the Kusanagi shrinks instantly and spears out again. Show me what a master of snake-style ninjutsu can do. Naruto shouts. Another snake seal forms from his hands. He's toying with me. Orochimaru sneers hatefully, feeling fear for the first time since Tsunade had foiled his plans three years ago. Mukhutan, Jukai Cottonwood release, deep forest emergence. Innumerable massive roots form a bowl under Manda, lifting him up to the eye level of Naruto's Susano. Manda tries to dive off the cradle of roots, but Naruto quickly draws his other blade and sends another wave of cutting force. The snake summon's head falls to the ground before its entire body dispels. Orochimaru decides now is a good time to disengage. You're not getting away. Naruto taunts, taking flight with the Susano and swiping with such force that the air drags Orochimaru back down to the ground. Kabuto realizes that the likelihood of Orochimaru-sama surviving is little to none. The shockwaves caused by Naruto's Mengekyu Sharingan power have freed him but even he knows when to quit. Uchiha Naruto cannot be defeated by them right now. It's time to cut his losses and learn to survive on his own. As he always has been. Naruto retracts his Susano and pursues Orochimaru on foot. He is gaining on the Sanin quickly but he knows that given enough time, the pathetic snake will simply absorb everything left from his marked subordinates. He dashes towards him and slams his fingers into the ground, hissing red chakra speeding towards his enemy. Uchiha Kanjin Uchiha Flame Formation You didn't learn from Karen's mistake, Naruto. Orochimaru hisses. I can simply reverse summon myself out and live another day. Famous last words before light blue chains pierce his feet and anchor him to the ground. Orochimaru spots flicking chakra at Naruto's feet, making it known that's where the chains are coming from. Fusikoi malfeasance. Naruto mutters, dominating Orochimaru's chakra control with his own oppressive energy and holding him still long enough for the Uchiha to get close. The Sanin watches with gritting teeth. Stop this you fool. You would kill me for Konoha? A village that reviled your mother for protecting you? You call me the fool but you brought this upon yourself. Naruto's self-assuredness has Orochimaru shivering. I might have even left well enough alone if you hadn't bruff Karen into this. But you've been a thorn in my side since I had to flee from you the first time we met and I do not take kindly to an insult against me like that. Keiyaku Fun Contract Seal. Naruto slams his open hand against Orochimaru's chest. Orochimaru looks up. What did you do? Exactly what the jutsu is designed to do. Naruto smiles. It prohibits you from receiving help from summons or from anything else that requires a transmission of chakra to or from another being. No clones. No summons. Just you. And me. One last ditch is what Orochimaru gives, regurgitating the kusanagi and attacking Naruto with it. Amaterasu. The only things left behind are the Sanin's head and his precious sword. Twenty minutes later, Naruto catches up with Karen and they finally make their way home to Konoha. Yuck. Gross Naruto, get that thing away from me. Naruto swings Orochimaru's head around and his elongated tongue slaps Karen on the forehead. I'm gonna kill you. In Kanahagakur, the hospital. She's stable, Tsunade-sama. Sakura breathes a sigh of relief when the inexplicable convulsions finally stop. Tsunade is still watching Anko closely. The curse mark in particular. Her eyes widen when it starts to peel off of her skin in dead clumps of sickly purple chakra. Oh my god. She trembles. Tsunade-sama? What's this? Tsunade turns to her apprentice. The mark. If it's gone then that means the person who gave it was sealed before they died. They have no anchor to come back to so it's disappearing on its own. So that means Sakura is stunned, as are Anko's friends checking on her condition. Orochimaru is dead. Uchiha Naruto. Age, 16. Threat level, S rank. Affiliation, Kanahagakura no Sato. Officer status, Jounin. Known relatives, 
Namikaze Minato father, deceased. Uzumaki Kushina mother, deceased. Uchiha Madara maternal grandfather, unknown status. Uzumaki Karen partner. Appearance, fair skin. Thigh length spiky black hair parted to cover his right eye. Sharangan active at all times. Muscular physique, approx 195 centimeters tall. Typically seen with a high collared black coat. Bounty issue. Otogakur, 65 million Rio. Kumagakur, 50 million Rio. Iwagakur, 62 million Rio. To be paid on delivery of proof of his capture or death. Reason for issue. Otogakur, assassination of the leader of Otogakur, Orochimaru. Kumagakur, none provided. Iwagakur, none provided. Keke Genkai. Bengeku Sharangan. Makutan. Uzumaki Body and Chakra. Combat Capabilities. Katan and Futon Mastery. Taijutsu Master. Suspected control over all five basic chakra natures. Barrier Ninjutsu. Fuinjutsu Specialist. Chakra Masking Technique. Enhanced Sensory Prowess. Combat warning, flee on sight. Only engage with large numbers and by surprise. Do not engage with intent to endure. Uchiha Naruto's chakra capacity surpasses all known cage. Do not look him in the eyes. Jiraiya feels his knees give out and he drops the bingo book given to him by one of his spies one town over. I think it's high time that we make our way home. He says breathlessly. Jiraiya sensei? Sasuke questions holding a stick with a fish on it up to his mouth that had been cooking on their fire. Knowing that Jiraiya has been shaken, Sasuke opens the marked page and chokes violently on his bite of fish. Kakashi sips his sake benignly through his mask. Everyone assembled at the table in the restaurant is annoyed that he has somehow managed to circumvent the common thought that he'd need to take the mask off. Shizun bites her lip in not-so-disguised amusement. They're having a little get-together for Anko, who demanded a celebration at being free from Orochimaru's curse mark. Weeks of investigation and diagnosis yielded no result but with Anko in a better and happier mood than ever, they were happy to let her treat them to one of the more classy joints in Konoha. That's bullshit. Anko accuses, finger pointed directly at him. Ara? Kakashi drawls, I curling up in amusement. I'll take the damn thing off myself. Anko leaps over the table, only to be held back by Kurenai, Genma, and Guy. Shizun giggles and leans on his shoulder. Looks like she's had too much tonight judging by the flushed look. The glance she gives him makes him grateful that Sakura is babysitting tonight. Kakashi leaps up however when the door to the restaurant is slammed open by Hayate and Yugao, both looking deathly pale. What's going on? Anko slurs drunkenly, displeased at the interruption of her late guests. Hayate passes the dog-eared bingo book to Kakashi first. The copy nin scans over the page before looking up with a shaky hand. Kakashi? Guy asks, looking concerned. He passes the book to Anko. With trepidation, Anko takes it. Her mouth is moving but not a sound comes out. There's a minute of worried silence before Anko picks the jug of sake. Here's to you, crazy bastard. No one tries to stop her. Take my hands. Naruto says softly after promising not to chase her around with Orochimaru's head. Karen does so, sitting with her legs crossed in front of him. I'm glad that we encountered Orochimaru. It was revealing about the nature of chakra, and now I understand what exactly the religion of Ninshu is. Using our gift of chakra to create, not to destroy. What's going on, Naru? Karen asks him, letting the warmth of his large hands engulf her own. Listen. Naruto says quickly. Listen to my chakra. Listen to it echo within you, and yours within me. Karen tries to indulge him. She feels phantom tingles in her eyes and on her skin. Do you trust me? with your life? Always. Karen hisses at him for daring to question her devotion to him. Good. Because this might sting a bit. Naruto takes a deep breath. Pure white chakra engulf them both. Anakaryoku Seisei life force rebirth. Karen blacks out. She wakes three days later with a worried Naruto hanging over her head. Naru? Karen rasps and Naruto gives her a bottle of water. Are you alright? Any pain? blurry spots in your sight? Are you itchy? Yes, no, no and no? Karen responds confusedly, her hand slapping out clumsily to get her glasses in the same spot that she always puts them. Only to see that they aren't there. Only to see perfectly that they aren't there. No blurry blobs. Perfect clarity. 
she touches her face and finds that no, she isn't already wearing them. What? Karen whispers. Karen leaps out of bed and runs to the motel room mirror. She cries and cries, and cries some more. In her eyes, she sees two perfectly normal scarlet irides, complete with a black pupil in each. And she truly breaks down when she sees on her skin that there is not one single bite mark. Karen doesn't make mention of his ringed, metallic purple gaze. Chapter 14, Threads or Chains. Tsunade-sama. Two familiar chakra signatures have entered the barrier, but they haven't been tagged with our formula. The head of the sensor division presents his findings to Tsunade. Description? Tsunade asks, obviously not wanting to act hastily if they're just two returning shinobi that haven't been exposed to the new detection barrier yet. This is usually the case, but given the infiltration by the Akatsuki two years ago, she needs to review any intel and ensure that no one is at risk. We believe that they may be Jiraiya-sama and Uchiha Sasuke. Both have large chakra reserves, and one of them has a powerful seal inscribed on them. The division head pulls up a scroll report, showing a rough copy of the 8 trigram seal that had been used to contain the Nibi. He pulls up a second scroll, showing a number of generic seals used to contain items. One of which is labeled research. Tsunade's brow twitches nearly unnoticeable but she smiles slightly. All right, send in one team of Anbu and make them report to the sensor division first so they can get tagged with the passphrase. I'll meet them there. Understood. The division head dips his head and makes a hasty exit. Tsunade pretends that she's not relishing the opportunity to get up and stretch her legs as she meanders out of the tower. She leaves the menial work to her vetted subordinates. Besides, she deserves a break. Being a Hokage is mentally exhausting. As she walks through the streets of Konoha on a slow trek to the sensory headquarters, she dips her head politely from under her customary Hokage hat at each of the bowing greetings she gets from shinobi and civilians alike. Although the flattering feeling she once felt from such respect has dimmed somewhat, she often feels that she is alone in her desire to see the village truly thrive in this cold world of shinobi. Very few people openly admit their desire to become Hokage, with the vast majority of them being children who ultimately grow out of that goal or come to a realization that they aren't fit for the position. Through pressure from their peers and wavering faith in themselves to become one of the greats of Konoha, many often surrender their desire to become Hokage and chase other pursuits that hold significant meaning to them. She does not revile those choices. It does take a special kind of person to become Hokage, but she often wonders if the coming storms will forge a new soul worthy of becoming Hokage in time. Life has taught her that the unexpected can often wreak havoc in the village, and sometimes the lessons that those tumultuous moments create are not learned as well as they should be. But someday, she wouldn't be here to lead the village anymore, and Konoha would need someone to replace her when that day comes. In conflict, people can truly define themselves and their desires. Chasing after the position of Hokage is more meaningful when a person knows why they're doing it, and what purpose they're doing it for. It's easy for a young shinobi to scream to anyone that will hear them that they will become Hokage, the most recognized face in the village. But those who truly believe themselves when they say it's worth chasing for the result, are few and far in between. Those who see that shinobi conflict is centered on the concept of war and other such conflicts, understand that a Hokage is a status in the village that comes with a weight that is more than being a politician. It is to be a breed above the rest, to be someone who will meet that conflict head-on instead of letting it sweep them away. Konoha citizens often see being a shinobi as a job title. One that is deep-seated in their lifestyle, but merely a way to pay the bills and feed their kids at the end of the day. Right now, there are only so many people in Konoha that might be willing to replace her when the day comes. Two of which are Uchiha. The sheer drive in Naruto and Sasuke is something that hasn't been seen in about 20 years. Namikaze Minato and Uchiha Fugaku being the two who came before, and Tsunade doesn't miss the peculiar irony about that, one being a Hokage and the other being a candidate for it. She sees a lot of their fathers in those boys, both in wisdom and in strength. Naruto's strength certainly surpasses her own at this point, and he is young enough to lead a fulfilling term as Hokage. He's regarded as a hero by the younger generation for his instrumental place in stopping many of the casualties in the Otto Kumo invasion as well as his rescue of the academy students during Itachi and Kisame's infiltration. And now that word is spreading around the village of his battle against Orochimaru, he is beginning to grasp the legend status in the village. If strength alone were enough, he'd be Hokage already. But ever persisting, the wiser ones of her council question his actual loyalty to the village. The public adores him, he is a man with his heart set on his family and his own life, just like them. A champion of the people. Politicians are not so admiring. Kushina had been reviled for a short few years before everyone began to move on with their lives. 
Uchiha Naruto does not seem like a forgetful person, so it would take time to truly gauge how he feels about the older generations which he would also be charged with protecting as a Hokage. He has displayed wisdom in his acceptance of the importance of conflict in human growth and he has the strength to take the title, but his reactions to the villagers as a whole is still largely unknown. He is a man who cares about himself and his family, and that is all. Time may teach him to love Konoha, but that is a big if. Sasuke on the other hand is steadfastly loyal to Konoha, even willing to butt heads with Naruto about his suspect behavior. His love for the village has so far been unquestioned. His will to succeed and excel may match Naruto's, albeit with less potential than his clanmate. But that hardliner attitude only inspired faith in those who were equally devoted to Konoha, and it would be harder for him to garner the support of the general populace. But, an Uchiha's love can turn to even greater hate, and the higher-ups don't like the idea of an Uchiha holding the reins when something catastrophic happens to their mind. If he ever finds out the truth about Itachi. Perhaps she's being too hasty. Selecting an appropriate Hokage takes time, and the Uchiha remaining are quite young. There are a few people who can replace her in the worst-case scenario. Kakashi could ultimately do it if he works hard enough, and Jiraiya for all of his licentious behavior, is strong and wise enough too. Might Guy would honestly be her next choice. She has unwavering faith in his loyalty to Konoha, despite his eccentricities. As for Sakura, well. It's far too early to tell. She is principally too naive, for now. Tsunade shakes off the weary feeling and takes the Starwell into the Sensor Division headquarters. Tsunade Heim. Jiraiya cries out before she can even tell where he is. She is glomped as he falls down from his hiding spot on the ceiling, invisibility fading. Her brow twitches. I missed you. Jiraiya's overly dramatic fake sobs are like someone is dragging their nails on a chalkboard. She punches him into the ceiling and through the roof. The division gives her fearful looks and return to their work. It is then she spies the other one she'd been expecting. Taller and healthier than he was before. His hair looked much the same with the exception of the black ponytail at the back of his neck. A white Uchiha zip-up shirt with a blue and red crest on its back, stands out in contrast to his dark hair but his facial structure looks more like his father than his brother or mother, looking more masculine than before. He turns to face her after being branded with the invisible key to the new barrier. Tsunade-sama. Sasuke dips his head respectfully. Not too low. It's just not the style of an Uchiha. Welcome home, Sasuke. Tsunade smiles. It's good to be back. Sasuke smiles back. Sakura briefly moves her long pink hair out of her face as she tries to deal with yet another distraction by an unwanted charge for the day. Research on neural damage caused by seals is something unique and untouched to her before, but someone had piqued her curiosity about it so she decided to see if she could find anything that might be worth knowing in other fields. She gives a deadpan stare. Minako returns the stare with teary puppy dog eyes, silently begging. You should be in school. Having grown an immunity to it, Sakura doesn't budge. Please nay chan Minako is all but sprawling over Sakura's lap, and the young woman is forced to put her textbook down. The academy is so boring. I already know everything. True to being Hatake Kakashi's daughter, Minako is frustrated with Konoha's slow academic system. Only she isn't afforded the opportunity to graduate early like the old days, and neither Kakashi nor Shizun want her to. They tutor her of course, but they're also her parents which leads to some difficulty in teaching her without being frustrated. There'd been a phrase that passed her ear once, don't teach someone you like, because you won't like them afterwards. Naruto had gotten away with being truant, but even as a child his skill level had been leaps and bounds ahead of his peers by such a significant margin that even Tsunade-sensei agreed that the academy hadn't been doing him any good. Outside of reading and writing comprehension and ability, anyway. I'll teach you one jutsu, and you go straight back to the academy, and don't skip the academy and come crawling back to me until you're sure you've mastered it, understand? Sakura compromises, but sternly. Please 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 please. Minako begs again, willing to do anything not to be sent back to the academy. Alright, I want you to pay attention. Sakura knows that Minako is astute, so she gives her simple but not too much so rundown. This jutsu was made by Naruto and he taught it to me, you remember Naruto? Oni-chan. Minako confirms, though the time past may make her memories of him foggy. It starts out just like Genjutsu, you reach out with your chakra using these signs, she waves the signs slowly and precisely, saying them aloud with each one. You stamp something with the chakra that you just wove. And then, she weaves the remaining signs, bringing the total up to seven. 
The stack of paper on the desk he suddenly replaced by her backpack that had been laying inconspicuously in the corner. Sogo Kawarimi no Jutsu Mutual Substitution. Sakura states after the demonstration. Wa? Minako looks confused but intrigued. It's like the substitution jutsu, but instead of swapping you, it swaps two different things. When your chakra control is good enough, Sakura points out the window to her neighbor's room across the street. You can swap with things that are far away too. The bag on her desk vanishes and is replaced by the pot plant on the adjacent window sill, before it swaps back. And if you're really good at chakra control Sakura starts swapping multiple objects in the room, making it seem like a messy blur. You can do several at once and confuse people. Oni-chan made this? Minako asks in amazement. He sure did. He needed it for our Chonin exams, so he invented on the spot. Something dry slips into Sakura's voice, but it is also fond. Show me the signs again. Please. Please show me the signs again. I want to learn Oni-chan's jutsu. The begging is back in full force. Sakura hides an exasperated sigh. Promise me you'll go back to the academy if I do. Minako nods solemnly, light slipping out of her eyes. I promise. It takes only a few minutes before Minako gets the signs down, and she's already running out of Sakura's room, rushing past Mebuki as she's bringing her daughter a snack. Thank you Nei-chan. Bye Nei-chan. Bye Nei-chan's ka-chan. Mebuki sucks in her lip in amusement before entering Sakura's room. Taking on students now, oh great apprentice of the Hokage? Sakura groans at her mother's teasing. She takes the offered chance to have a break from her personal genjutsu study and sees her mother's face shrouded in the silhouette of someone outside the window. Kakashi and Shizun are scaling each side of the window, peering in with cheeky grins. That was some impressive chakra control, Sakura sensei. Kakashi gives her his signature eye smile and her face heats up. I hope Sakura grits out. Your mission isn't to make fun of me today. She cracks her knuckles for emphasis, leading the couple to take a cautionary lean back. Don't be like that, Sakura. Shizun waves it off sheepishly. We actually are here for a good reason. What's happening? They don't seem particularly panicked, but it could be an act not to agitate Mebuki. Jiraiya-sama and Sasuke have returned. They're getting stamped at the censor. Sakura is leaping out of the window before they can finish. Kakashi and Shizun follow quickly. Mebuki eyes the abandoned snack with discontent. HMMPF. Shinobi. Ringed purple eyes observe the barrier from the outside. I couldn't see this before. It's interesting. Something of a mischievous gleam enters his gaze. Sasuke is quizzing the censor Shinobi out of curiosity, just trying to understand what it's going to do to help Konoha as a whole. So this Sasuke gestures towards the floating water sphere. Picks up chakra anomalies as soon as they enter the barrier? What about wildlife and such, wouldn't that set it off? The division head, Dumaki, strokes his white goatee and nods a confirmation. HMHM, they certainly do. However, the beauty of the field is that it can distinguish types of life. Even if someone were to say, transform into a small rodent, they would still have distinctly human chakra that can be assessed by chakra nature, chakra strength and capacity, as well as a recording of any seal that enters the barrier. It's how we picked you up. See over here. Dumaki brings him over to the scroll printers with large jars of ink feeding into them. Sasuke sees a near-perfect rendition of his 8 trigram seal, along with colored kanji denoting his chakra natures of fire and lightning. There are a few blips that don't pass as anything legible above and beneath the markings showing his and Jiraiya's chakra alignments. The little scribbles are just wildlife really. The water sphere in the middle of the room helps us track them just in case but as you can see, this advanced design is quite sufficient at detecting intruders. If an outlier pops into the barrier, we investigate and see if they're a threat or a friendly that hasn't been tagged with the entry formula. Could a potential intruder tag themselves with the formula if they study the barrier for long enough? Sasuke asks, wanting to know if it's possible that Itachi or his undesirable allies could outsmart the formula. Not unless they take the barrier plan straight from our minds. Dumaki taps his temple. It's impossible to see the barrier. In addition, it's a two-stage system. The sphere displays anomalies and the printers record them in detail. We're right in the heart of the village, so it would really just be a stupid idea to come straight for us when we can alert every shinobi in the village to converge and protect the barrier recipe. You don't tell this to every Konoha shinobi do you? Sasuke feels that it would be unwise to readily hand out that information to anyone. Of course not. Dumaki scoffs. But I've seen you and what you've done for Konoha, Uchiha-kun. 
It takes a brave soul to defend Konoha by any means necessary. Sacrificing yourself to prevent Konoha's destruction by becoming a Jinchuriki is something that I can respect. His eyes show his age when he looks at Sasuke directly. I count myself among the most loyal members of Konoha's military and I believe myself to be a good judge of character. Word of your actions and devotion to the village have spread like wildfire. You've got something strong in you boy, and I'm not talking about your baijuu. Even in this age the will of fire burns strong in a good few. Sasuke is somewhat struck by the old man's tangent but feels flattered at the praise. I live to protect Konoha. Is all he says in response. No matter the cost. There are many things about this great village that must be protected and preserved. Dumaki nods solemnly with understanding. Children. The culture. The food is to die for. Brotherhood between shinobi. So many beautiful people. Midway through their spiel, the rest of the barrier corps join in. Best women in all the land. The tasteful thickness of Hyuga women. Wild in Betty Nuzuka. The things that Yamanaka girls can do. An intense sensation of camaraderie emanates from them. Things are silent between them while Tsunade and Jiraiya chitter in the background with hushed whispers. This would probably be one of the safest places to have a discussion about important village details in private, Sasuke thinks. His eyes are drawn back to the water sphere in the middle of the room with general fascination. Does it do this regularly? Sasuke observes a ballooning of the sphere on its equator, denoting where someone would be approaching on the main road. The three barrier shinobi all make exclamations of shock. What the hell is that? This chakra? I've never felt anything like this in my life. Maintain form. Dumaki narrows his eyes, seemingly unnerved by the size of the anomaly. Report. The old man orders. A massive amount of chakra just entered the barrier. Sir, it's far stronger than even Tsunade-sama. Bring me the record reel. Jiraiya and Tsunade evidently hear the commotion and hastily make their way over to them. That's not possible. Dumaki mutters in disbelief. Dumaki dono? This print says that the person who just entered the barrier possesses all five basic chakra natures. Many shinobi can use all five natures Dumaki dono. But possessing an affinity to all five? Dumaki cuts off Jiraiya. Suddenly, the room appears as if the water sphere in the middle of it is collecting the light and everything darkens for a moment. The water sphere ripples from the middle, becoming purple with black rings and a pupil from which they ripple out from. It looks at them before everything in the room goes back to normal, including the sensor sphere. Jiraiya in particular seems struck by the pattern. Tsunade is not so easily thrown off. Anbu. Teams 5 through 7, all of you muster outside of the main gate. Jiraiya, let's go meet whoever this is. Tsunade-sama, they just tag themselves. Dumaki calls out seeing that the sensing sphere has returned to its normal shape and the recorder isn't picking up anything else from the intruder. Impossible, huh? Sasuke murmurs, thinking that he might just know what's going on. Naruto withdraws his fingers from over his right eye. Sasuke has grown quite a bit. He comments. This Rinnegan stuff is going to your head. Precious Karen, always there to set him straight. Or so she thinks. He gives her ass a light slap. You perv. Karen tries to use her body weight to push him over, rather ineffectually. Naruto hides a smile. He doesn't need to tell her that he just placed the barrier passcode on her right cheek. Though nobody without the Rinnegan would be able to see it. What can I say? My girlfriend's hot. And don't you dare forget it. What's going on? Sakura asks, seeing the rush of Anbu towards the main gate. Something big is happening. Do you think it could be Akatsuki? Shizun looks toward her husband eyes darting toward the academy. Possible. Sakura, let's go. Shizun, Yulkakashi switches to captain mode before being cut off. I know. Shizun immediately leaps away, heading straight to the academy to make sure Minako is safe. Sakura and Kakashi leap to the rooftops to begin a fast dash to the gate. Do you think that they know Sasuke came back today? It might not be the Akatsuki at all Sakura, keep a level head. Hi, Sensei. But what could spook the barrier core into sending all these onbu? Naruto juggles Orochimaru's head between his hands, but at least it's concealed in a bag and Karen doesn't have to fear him for trying to chase her around with it. Do you think they'll let me keep this when I cash in his bounty? Naruto asks and Karen feels only disbelief. Why the hell would you want to keep it? Karen knows that Naruto can be ridiculously obtuse about stupid things but for what possible purpose could he need Orochimaru's head? Well, 
I was thinking we could get it taxidermied and put it up in the living room. Karen holds her hands over her ears. Soon enough, they see Konoha's massive walls pop up from the horizon. The village is bright and not a cloud is in sight, and the familiar flutter of activity begins to reach their ears. Minako is at the academy. Naruto smiles wistfully after his long-range sensing surveys the village. I've missed out on quite a bit, but it's good to be back. I have a lot to do. Karen is glad that there might be a chance for respite. Naruto is a brutal and controlling teacher. She knows it's for the best but two years straight of training has left her wanting to indulge in the simpler things. She is startled when two sets of arms sprout out from Naruto's shoulders, reaching out from the high collar of his coat. Didn't mean to do that. How do I put these back in? Karen is done trying to figure out all the crazy shit that his Rinnegan can do. Naruto's struggle to figure out how to control it is amusing in its own way but equally confusing. The mechanical arms retract back into his shoulders but his neck and jaw open up with neon red and blue lights. He uses this transformation to amplify his scream and his booming, deep voice echoes across the entirety of Konoha. Konohagakur. Bring me the Nibi Jinchuriki and your village will be spared. Karen takes a calming breath through Naruto's wicked laughter. She opts to sneak in another way and let Naruto have his fun. Kanahagakur. Bring me the Nibi Jinchuriki and your village will be spared. Sasuke struggles to keep a straight face as the sheer panic overwhelms the majority of the shinobi present. An amused huff in his mind makes it clear that he isn't the only one finding it at least a little funny. He watches as Tsunade barks out orders and the Anbu and off-duty shinobi arm themselves and stand in formation in front of him. As if it would make any difference. Sasuke, get to safety now. Hi, Tsunade-sama. Sasuke pretends to obey and starts sneaking off to see his family. Tsunade and Jiraiya steady themselves. Through the crowd of shinobi, they see a figure clad in black in the distance running at insane speed towards them. Beads of sweat run down the faces of those who are adept at chakra sensing, knowing just how out of their class this threat is. Get ready. Shaky hands grip their swords and others weave signs and set their chakra. The figure is getting too close for comfort. Attack. A sack lands at her feet after the order, causing Jiraiya and herself to be momentarily alarmed as it uncoils and strands of smooth black hair furl out of it. That's. Tsunade looks up too late. That damn brat. Jiraiya face palms. I see his sense of humor hasn't changed in the slightest. Roars of fake courage erupt and everyone charges before Tsunade can issue the order to stop. They can only watch as every one of them are completely and brutally bulldozed out of his way. The most elite Anbu are flung into the top of the gate. Jown and are thrown into each other and get knocked down like dominoes. Howls of pained horror resound and yet not one is severely wounded. Stand back. An Anbu issues while he and his three teammates whirl up a collaboration jutsu. Futan, day top a great breakthrough. Kaden, die end and great fire bullet. Naruto raises an arm while still moving into the village and the wind enhanced fireball impacts with a translucent shield that absorbs the entirety of it. A pair of arms erupt out of the ground and try to catch his legs. Naruto takes one longer stride and stomps the ground, likely smashing his foot into the head of whoever just tried to grab him. Sorry, Kakashi. Naruto's voice is unapologetic, which annoys Tsunade even more. Her fists clench angrily and she decides to teach this brat a lesson for messing with her and her shinobi. Tsunade-sama. Sakura lands next to her. You're here, good. We're going for the student-teacher punch. Tsunade knows that her beloved apprentice will be more useful if she doesn't know who exactly she's attacking. Tsunade. Jiraiya errs on the side of caution. This might not be a good idea. Naruto is still a blur of motion, too quick for even their trained eyes to see his face and eyes. All they can really see is his hair billowing behind him in the rush. Let's go. Tsunade and Sakura make a synchronized attack, both putting all their might into a combined blow that would leave that moron licking his wounds for the rest of his damn life. Yeah. Naruto pulls out his gun by at the last second and blocks all of the impressive kinetic energy they could muster. It gains a slight white glow from the wind chakra emanating from it. The gun by dips slightly, letting him view his assailants in the eyes. Sakura's arm slackens. Naruto? He smirks. Uchihagishi Uchiha return. There is a foreboding pause before the gun by's stored energy hurls them away, down the street and into the village while they tumble and flail. Did you really have two? Jiraiya asks weakly, predicting that Tsunade would vent that anger out on him at first opportunity. Naruto looks at him like he's the stupid one. The nerve. Kid is taking way too much after his mother. Stand down. 
Jiraiya orders the pursuing shinobi. He's an ally. Just tend to your bruises and go back to your posts. Jiraiya-sama? One brave female Chonin with her brown hair done in buns looks towards the threat on behalf of the men who'd just been made to look like academy students to a cage. She can only see his back, and is still poised to strike. Naruto actually looks faintly approving. Seems he appreciates someone who's willing to stand up after being beaten down and continue the fight. He turns to face her directly. Well done, Chonin. Naruto places his gun by on his back. You've passed our assessment drill of Konoha's response time to a threat detected in the sensor division. Jiraiya looks in utter shock and disbelief at Naruto. How could he just straight face lie after the shit he just pulled? What? Ten Ten looks up at him. Naruto sama? That's right. Naruto's purple eyes are eerie and yet his face displays someone who is proud of her performance. Maddening. This operation was set up by our Hokage in order to prepare for a potential invasion by the Akatsuki once more. To make the drill seem more real, she asked me to come at you with force. I hope that you can understand, I don't want to be on anyone's bad side here. He finishes his little speech with a charming smile and Jiraiya can only watch in mystification as most of the shinobi and Anbu converge around him to listen. I of course Naruto-sama. Ten-ten straightens out, leaving Jiraiya gawping. You all did well. Naruto raises his voice. I do, however hope that this experience has been revealing to all of you. The Akatsuki, or any enemy nation for that matter, will not be so merciful as to let you live as I did in a real invasion. We are no longer dealing with the likes of a pitiful skirmish as we saw two years ago and we must be prepared. Review yourselves now while you can because when an enemy with my kind of strength comes knocking on Konoha's gate, we'll all meet them with the full might of Konoha and the will of fire. Cheers and screams erupt. In the crowd, Kakashi's jaw hangs low. Didn't you just hurt Tsunade-sama and Sakura-san? One voice calls out over the noise, leading to a brief silence. Come now, those two have busy schedules. Neither of them have time to be here in person. What you just saw were two cage bunshine. Besides, don't underestimate those two. They're too strong to be defeated by one mere attack. Naruto chastises, and the person who asked looks slightly embarrassed. If you have business with her, go straight to the Hokage Tower. Before he can apologize however, Naruto makes a show of being a commanding presence. Remember to render aid to yourselves and return to your posts. Hi, Naruto-sama. The collective of shinobi call out before limping or vanishing away. Once all but Kakashi and Jiraiya are gone, Naruto's face dissolves into helpless amusement. PFFFT, ha 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 ha. His laughter keels him over and he looks red-faced. It might have been enough to set them off into peals of laughter if his own weren't so scary. Tsunade and Sakura come out from behind the building that they'd hidden behind once Naruto started his speech of inspiring bullshittery, looking red-faced for another reason. The embarrassment is clearly too much to bear for them. Kakashi puts a hand on Naruto's shoulder and looks annoyed that he has to look up to his once shorter student and little brother figure. One of these days, I'm going to strangle you to death. Naruto smirks. That day will never come. Kakashi's visible brow twitches but before he can retort, Sakura hides the shame at being so utterly decimated and wraps her arms around Naruto, barely managing to wiggle her hands under the gun by. I missed you, you giant idiot. She whispers into him. She feels the rumbling of his chest from his cute, happy laugh. It's so much nicer to hear than the scary noises he'd made in the past. It helps to remind her that despite the monstrous nature of him, that there is a kind, human contrast to everything about him that is oh so easy to admire. For all his conflict-seeking actions and words, inside beats a heart of devotion and love. Her face heats up when he pulls her close. I've missed you too, Sakura. Naruto smiles down at her. She keeps her face pressed to his chest, not wanting him to see how much she's blushing. Yes yes, this is all very touching, Tsunade grits out, eager to ruin their reunion. Where's your redhead menace? Karen is already in the village. She's dropping off our belongings at our apartment. Naruto pulls away from a reluctant Sakura but doesn't deign to look towards the Hokage. How? Tsunade's tone shifts to something serious. This isn't something to joke about. That barrier is the best preemptive measure we have against another invasion attempt, so you're either lying to me or you found a way to circumvent an advanced barrier that your father laid the groundwork to create. I suppose it wouldn't be conventionally possible, yes. Naruto's response is guileful and dismissive. Sakura takes a closer look at Naruto's face. Now drawn under her more attentive gaze, she does see that he hadn't just gotten taller and deep-voiced. What happened to your Sharingan? She mutters softly. 
I got the latest edition. Naruto winks before turning slowly to face the other three high-ranking shinobi. Jiraiya's breath catches in his throat. Tsunade looks as though she'd seen a phantom of the past, a long-forgotten memory dredging its way up out of irrelevance. Kakashi doesn't know what to make of it and just stares blankly. You don't have to fear for the integrity of the barrier. It's actually impressively advanced. But you should know that these eyes can make anything possible if I have enough will and understanding to make it so. Naruto starts meandering down the street, eager to make a visit to certain people. He already knows that he's not the first Rinnegan bearer that Jiraiya has met in person. Kiba stares blankly with a mouth full of unchewed food open to anyone unfortunate enough to look in his direction. A pair of impatient fingers snap in front of his face and his attention is drawn to his sensei. Kurenai stares him down, her intimidating gaze makes his stomach drop even more than his mother could hope to do. Kiba tries to defend himself. Oh come on, sensei. Any guy would look twice at that. Kiba thinks he's being reasonable. She gives a slight eye roll. Yes, I suppose boys will be boys. But I'd think twice about who you go eyeing up in the future. And chew your food. I didn't mean to do it. Kiba mutters around a mouthful. How could he have known some gorgeous redhead would walk past just as he'd been looking in that direction? You don't see beauties like that every day. Unless you're Kurenai's students, but that doesn't really count in his books. He is dragged away from those thoughts by Hinata, who tugs on his jacket timidly. Kurenai sensei had explained at length to Shino and himself that the past two years had not been cozy by any means for the former heiress. Her father is a real piece of work, going as far as to brand his own eldest daughter with a curse mark used on all branch members of the clan. Even now Kiba doesn't really understand it. They say it's to protect the sanctity of the Keke Genkai, but Kiba and the other Inuzuka that he deferred vented to about it, said that it was as good as admitting their weakness to everyone. After all, never had a Senju or Uchiha branded members of their clan, displaying faith in the abilities in their blood. But regardless of the ridiculous politics going on in that stupid clan, Hinata had become extremely withdrawn since having that seal applied to her forehead. She doesn't go anywhere without her headband over it and although she'd never said it, Kiba is pretty confident that the mark itself held meaning in the form of failure to her. Failure to receive her father's love and approval. She is getting very thin these days, and damn if he isn't trying to lift her spirits up. Shino hasn't been any help at all, preferring to maintain his clinical outlook on everything and saying everything matter-of-factly, which he doesn't seem to understand isn't helping Hinata. Maybe he doesn't even want to help. The only people she really even speaks to are Kiba, Kurenai and only two members of her clan, Neji and Hizashi-san. The two of them are exceedingly kind people with big hearts that are nearly worn on their sleeves. Any other time she's flinching away from people, and her performance during missions has drastically decreased as a result. Hinata had been off of missions for a few weeks now, pending a reassessment of her skills to see if she's still fit for active duty. Whenever they left the village, Sakura often replaced her. Neji's been asking me some weird questions. Sakura reveals to him as the dash through the trees. Asking about unexpected seizures in Hyuga clan members. Kurenai stiffens in front of them. Well, I suppose he's just looking out for his clan. Neji's like that. Kiba dismisses it. Karen-san. Hinata whispers to him, always gloomy and fretful. And Naruto-sama. Must be back. Too. I'll be damned. Thought he'd never come home. Kiba sneakily drops a few pieces of meat onto Akamaru's feet, where the dog is not so discreet about chomping it up. The dry look Kurenai gives him is one of exasperation, but not dissuading at all. They had gotten closer as a team, so she's often willing to look the other way when he does something he shouldn't strictly be doing. In a restaurant at least, he probably shouldn't push his luck when they let him have his dog in here in the first place. But it's cruel to eat in front of a dog and not give him any of it. I wonder what he's been up to? Kiba ponders, holding another piece of meat up to Hinata's mouth. She really does need to eat more. Hinata blushes a little and shrinks into herself. But she still nibbles on the food presented to her, and Kiba counts that as a win. Naruto-sama has been training. Shino deigns to speak up, pointing out the obvious. Kiba withholds a sigh. Yeah, but I wonder how strong he's gotten. He was already pretty crazy when he was here before. Remember when he held up that lake above the academy? One of my clan's brats has a huge crush on him, and calls him her hero. Shino pulls out a small book from his pouch and opens it to an entry about Naruto. He is responsible for killing Orochimaru. Why are you carrying that around with you? Shino puts it away before Kurenai can reprimand him for talking about things like that while they're trying to bond as a team. His disconnectedness from them as a whole has been getting progressively worse, little by little each day. 
Kiba has been trying to hold them all together because it seems Kurenai Sensei is struggling to do so. Kiba oddly wonders if it's the influence of that former Anbu Abarame who'd been reintroduced to the clan after the death of the traitorous Shimura Danzo. Keeping someone like that around kids doesn't seem like the best idea in the grand scheme of things unless your goal is to turn that child into someone like them. Maybe he's carrying around that bingo book in order to imitate Anbu, to try and become like them so that he could join them someday. He refrains from letting his inner frustration show. Never once did he think that he'd end up taking the responsibility of making sure that his team wouldn't disband, while also trying to prevent Hinata from sinking into despair any further and trying his best every day to train and study so that he could take the reins of his clan. As much as he doesn't want to admit it, Naruto and Sasuke had been role models to him over the past two years. Their relentless chasing of their dreams had been somewhat inspiring, as much as it made him feel inadequate for their progress compared to his own. But he is not them and he is chasing his dreams as fast as his body will allow him to. Part of him guiltily thinks that Kurenai should be doing more for their team but stops it there. There's no point dwelling on those thoughts. As much as he likes the praise from Kurenai and his clan for his hard work it still feels like he isn't afforded the time to chase more things that he would like to do. More mission variety, maybe learning things that Inuzuka don't typically delve into. Chatting up cute girls would be another priority. Here Hinata, one more. Kiba holds one last piece of meat up for her. She blushes again but does as she's told. She's a beautiful girl too, despite the increasingly pale skin and dangerously skinny body. Well, at least he's doing his best. There's only so much of himself that he will sacrifice before he gets fed up, but these burdens he takes upon himself make him stronger and wiser. He'll surpass those who came before him in the Inuzuka clan, and he reluctantly accepts that the Uchiha were who inspired him to improve. Hizashi and Neji are seated before Hyashi, both with identical scowls marring their faces. Hizashi likes to consider himself a patient a tolerable man, but there's only so much he can take before even he snaps. He used to have a good relationship with his brother, even after being branded with the caged bird seal. He'd even been willing to die for him during the attempted theft of the Byakugan no, Hinata, before Tsunade-sama set things straight. It had admittedly been a moment of weakness that he later shared with his son, to hate his life so much that he was willing to die and do the right thing for the clan but expressed that in reality he had been trying to escape the life of a caged bird. Hyashi changed after that incident and took things to heart that he shouldn't have. He embraced the power of his status and used it to further his ambition at the complete expense of the submissive souls of the branch house. Part of him wonders if he would have been better off dead, to maybe make his brother feel even a slight part of compassion for the loss of his brother, but he knows that Neji may very well have fallen into his own doomed footsteps without his father's guidance and lessons. Unfortunately, Hyashi's schemes had all but destroyed his eldest daughter and Hanabi had fallen completely to her father's cruel and unrestricted influences. You are both to assess the Uchiha boys. Report to me their weaknesses and goals. Get close to them so that the Hayuga may know the best method to remove them from Konoha's control hierarchy. Your softness will make it easier to approach them. Hizashi grits his teeth. He wants to shout and scream at this husk that was once his brother, but the fear of the pain that the seal brings him stays his mouth. No. Neji refuses. Neji? Hizashi mutters incredulously. Neji's face becomes like iron, strong and confident but not lacking in emotion. A stark contrast to the man in front of him. You cannot refuse. Hyashi states emotionlessly. I can, and I have. I am not your slave to do with as you please. I refuse to be at the whims of a coward like you. Hizashi keeps his mouth shut, the lump in his throat growing in fear of his brother's imminent reaction. Then you are a dissident and of no use to the main house. Hyashi readies a hand sign. Brother, please no. Hizashi leaps to his feet, standing between Neji and Hyashi to try and deflect the ire to himself. Go ahead. Neji smiles with something cunning on his lips. Torture me. Kill me. Hyashi pauses with some confusion. Have you lost your will to live, my son? Hizashi's throat clumps up tightly. I find myself curious as to what excuse you'll give when I turn up at the hospital with neural damage or maybe even dead this time. I think that Hokage-sama would like to know what happened to one her Jounin too, not to mention my team. Hyashi's Byakugan flare to life, the skin around them pulsing in anger. Neji continues unabated. I did some research, you know. Old criminal cases that were hushed up during the reign of the Sandaime Hokage, along with some reports that weren't followed up due to the Uchiha police force being decommissioned. Investigations showed that whenever a member of the branch house came forward with information regarding domestic and sexual abuse, strange things would happen to them. Sometimes, they would be inconveniently sent out on a dangerous mission and never return. 
Other times, they would suddenly have an intense stroke or seizure that would result in brain death that was chalked up to a genetic happenstance that occurs in Byakugan wielders that strikes at random. How? Curious. You mock your dead clanmates for their sufferings over a mere coincidence. Hyashi brushes it off. A coincidence indeed. A mysterious illness that only affects branch members. More interesting is that instead of giving me no information or torturing me like usual, you spoke to me. Do you perhaps have something shameful to hide that you need to make excuses for? Neji finishes with his own narrow glare. Hyashi's brow deepens to show his immense rage. I will not have you slandering the greatest clan in Konoha's history. His fingers move to use the curse mark and Hizashi reels back in horror. Neji. A voice booms from outside. Hyashi freezes as the fast and heavy footsteps invade the Hyuga compound. Neji gets his last word in. Funny how these incidents decreased in volume after Tsunade-sama became Hokage. I have already taken measures to ensure that if I die or find myself inflicted with any suffering from you and your pathetic house, then your clan is going to be under quite a bit of scrutiny going forward. The only way for my house to end is my death. Hyashi spits. Do you plan to kill me, weakling child? Kill you? Neji looked amused at that. What good will killing you net me? All that will do is open a vacuum for an equally conniving cockroach to fill your shoes. I am now someone who doesn't live within the control hierarchy of the Hyuga clan, what does it matter to me that you scheme away? You can do nothing. The truth will come out, and it will be a fate worse than death for you and anyone who has ever helped this clan of murderers, slavers and rapists. Hyashi's pale skin stands out. He turns on his foot before the owner of the slapping footsteps can see him. Neji. Rock Lee thunders, looking quite healthy and motivated. Hizashi looks at the two teammates as they whisper into each other's ears. Did it work? Lee mutters, unusually quiet. Yes. This conspiracy has lasted nearly 60 years, and it's high time that it ends. Do you really think that it's possible? Rock Lee, tempered by his catastrophic defeat at Naruto's hands, has become wiser and capable of seeing events for the great echoes of change they can create. I know so. Neji states fiercely to his friend. Whatever this is involves all of us. Every shinobi and civilian in Konoha, we're getting bound to politics and reputation instead of personal strength. Hayuga, Sarutobi, Uchiha, and Senju, all of us are connected somehow in conflict and I refuse to let this be swept away in time while there are forces snuffing us out. There has never been a better time to act than now. Hizashi's eyes well up with emotion. To think that his son would be the only one to come close to breaking this cycle of suffering. Things hadn't been all too great since Tsunade-sama removed Tenzo from Anbu, transforming him by giving him a name and placing him in the regular forces as a jounin. She insists that his abilities, skills and professional demeanor make him a good role model when he's in the eye of the public. She then went on to spout off psychological concerns that he paid attention to but didn't entirely understand. But apparently, the tiny amount of time that he'd spent babysitting Uchiha Sasuke while he played around with Baiju Chakra had caught the attention of some other training neglected kids. My dad said you were some super strong Anbu once and that I should ask you for advice. Yamato blinks at the Nara kid. He doesn't even know his name yet. Probably some knockoff of Shikaku's own name. Clans are weird like that sometimes, but maybe he isn't one to judge when he doesn't even have his own real name. The kid doesn't look like he wants to be there, but he's asking anyway so that probably counts for something. Don't you kids have a sensei? Yamato asks, or really points out. The blonde girl gives a sassy hair flip but her countenance has a frail edge to it, like she's afraid of an imminent rejection. How many people had these kids asked for training and had been shut down? Yeah but like, aren't we supposed to go out and find people that have different experiences or whatever? Our sensei was never an Anbu. The Akimichi one adds. True. But that doesn't actually reveal what they really want from him. Vailp, better just ask. No point in dancing around in conversation. So why did you come to me? The Nara looks like he wants to sigh but opts to hold it in. We want to see if anyone can teach us better than our sensei can. Our parents aren't happy with Asuma's training and they keep applying to get us a new sensei, but someone is blocking it before it gets to Tsunade-sama. That's quite a bold thing to admit in front of someone you just met, probably. Yamato isn't so good with the whole social thing yet and Kakashi is way too busy to bother him about every little thing he needs help with. But if Shikaku referred Yamato to the kids, then he probably expects him to keep this hush-hush. Okay. Yamato says bluntly. The kids are silent for a moment. Really? Yamanaka Gaki asks incredulously. Sure, Yamato confirms just as easily. But I want something too. 
We can pay you for services rendered. Shikamaru jumps on the opportunity. Yamato waves it off. Nah, I just want help. I'm not really good at socializing. I've been an Anbu for pretty much my whole life and I don't really know how to be normal. If you help me, I'll try my best to train you. They blink up at him with undeserved hero worship. Yamato slurps loudly on his ramen while Ino cheers him on. That's bowl 10. You can do it, Yamato-sensei. He's gonna beat his record. Choji eggs him on joyously. Go for it, Yamato-kun. Ayame cheers with a blush. 11. Tuchi cries out, declaring Yamato's new record. Yamato's bowl slips out of his grasp as he tries to put it down. He feels sick. Don't tell me you're gonna hurl, sensei? Shikamaru asks with a conniving smile. Brat. I'll show you all. He holds it in with as much concentration as he can. The curtains of the ramen staff pull open unexpectedly. Er, time for a mission. Quickly, the mood dims as Sarutobi Asuma enters with his own declaration. Yamato isn't blind or deaf. He prides himself on being like his own role model, the Naidaim Hokage. Always assessing. Always watching and listening and understanding. Meeting any conflict with calculated intelligence. And he knows that while his relationship with Team 10 has improved drastically, it has not with their former not officially, Sensei. Asuma, he has come to understand, is a bitter and grudgeful man. Sure, he hides it under a caricature of the carefree just an everyday normal man, but he doesn't like it when people impose on what's his. He isn't strong enough to outright say it, but Asuma is someone far too used to having things go his own way. Not unlike many Sarutobi, actually. Even the Sandaime took no advice from anyone, always demanding that his vision be seen too, no matter the cost. He was someone that didn't listen to the common people, only his advisors and members of certain clans and factions. Konoha had survived due to the leadership of better men than him through the fires and horrors of war. Hatake Sakumo and the Sanin. Namikaze Minato and Uchiha Fugaku, among many famed and powerful people. They disregarded the lunacy that was Sarutobi Hiruzen's battle strategies and forged their own path that more often than not, led to complete victory over Konoha's enemies. Yes, Yamato truly believes that the Sandaime had been the worst Hokage of all of them, and he had been Hokage for far too long. He snaps out of his thoughts when Choji and Shikamaru put a hand on each of his shoulders, while Ino hugs him from behind. We'll come back soon, okay sensei? Ino squeezes extra hard before reluctantly dredging away. Good luck. Yamato calls out. Remember, I'm proud of you. They straighten in pride while following their back hunched real sensei. Yamato turns to Ayame, who looks at him unabashedly while her father tends to the stock in the back room. You're great with kids. She practically purrs. I am? Yamato asks, bewildered at the statement. Is that meant to be a compliment? People like compliments back, right? Well, I think you're the best cook in the village and I like your hair. It's pretty. A great crack noise resounds next to him, and he is startled to see a large hand smack against the counter. Ayame looks like she jumped out of her skin in fright. One strange, ring purple eye stares down at him like he's prey about to be devoured. Flirting with my big sister, are you? The deep voice asks with little emotion, but there is still a tangible rage felt through the sound rather than the tone. Yamato swallows. He is given a ten-minute dressing down about how he must be responsible with her and treat her with utmost respect at all times, no matter how much Kakashi Senpai and Tsunade Sama try to drag the Uchiha away from the stall. He doesn't miss the furious blushing of the waitress nor the general amusement around Kakashi's eye. Stop harassing my Jounin, brat. Don't get jealous Tsunade Haim, a pensioner like you is too old for a handsome young man like. Jiraiya is sailing off into the distant sky before he can finish his sentence. He is pretty good looking. Is Sakura's only contribution. Sasuke takes a deep breath. This is the moment he's been looking forward to for the past two years. His shaky hand knocks on the door. His rudimentary senses hear the clattering of utensils and he can feel a tiny rumble of untrained legs slapping against a wooden surface. Tsukimi-chan, please stop wriggling around coming. He hears Imari's voice through the door and his breath catches. The door opens jerkily, and just the people he's been aching in his heart for show themselves to him. Himari has barely changed. She still has the distinct motherly aura that she always had. The tiny lines under her eyes show a labor of love in taking care of a little one. Said little one is more beautiful than he could have ever imagined. Tiny flecks of light brown hair lick off the top of her head like feathers, and dark green eyes take in his appearance with unreserved curiosity. She's also got her four fingers in her mouth, drenched in saliva. Ah, uh, hey Himari. 
I'm home. Himari reaches out with her free hand and clumsy as it is, it finds its way to his arm and skitters up delicately as if to make sure that he's really there. Her hand gradually makes its way to his shoulder, and then to cup his face. It it's really you. Oh honey. She pulls him into a one-armed hug and cries and God does it really feel like home. Contact with someone that he loves is so much better than the prostitutes that Jiraiya tried to shack him up with, always grabbing him and running their hands over him until he got annoyed and left them behind. You're finally home we need to catch you up Yuido will be so happy, wait you haven't met your little sister yet. Sasuke laughs as she stammers. She looks faintly embarrassed but soon extracts revenge by placing Tsukimi in his arms. He fumbles at the unexpected weight. Himari. There. Himari nods resolutely. You are now officially babysitter number one. Better get used to it, Sasuke-chan. She's more than a handful. There's a sense of foreboding there but he tries his best to ignore it and gets a better grip on Tsukimi. Green eyes look up at him. Bah? Tsukimi-chan. Sasuke tries and her big eyes show recognition to her name. I'm your oni chan PRLBLBLB. Tsukimi blows a raspberry at him. Sasuke takes it like a champ. Himari laughs. Come on, let's go find my dearest husband and you can tell us all about your training trip. Hi hi, Okaa-san. Sasuke's retort comes out as sarcastic. She takes his arm immediately and doesn't even try to contradict him. Found you. Karen pounces on Naruto. Well if it isn't the most beautiful woman in Konoha's history. Karen pulls him down into a long and full-tongued kiss. Right in front of his annoying chauffeurs through the village, persistently following him around as if he's going to listen to anything they have to say. So he ignores them and immerses himself in Karen's mouth shamelessly. A long streak of saliva between their mouths is quite visible to the jaw-hung spectators when they're finally done. In the middle of the street? Sakura asks weakly. Kakashi gives a thumbs up, having no words to describe Naruto's accomplishment at scoring someone who he is obviously destined to be with. Sakura. Karen perks up. You look great. Thanks, Karen. You do too. And you've changed a bit. Sakura makes a point of looking at Karen's exposed arms, free of the bites that plagued them before and she clearly takes notice of her now pupiled scarlet eyes showing off freely and without the lens of glasses obscuring them. Perks of having Naruto as my boyfriend. Karen states with a grin, apparently learning from Naruto how to give an answer and yet provide absolutely no information at all. How? Tsunade butts in with curiosity. Uchiha Kinjutsu. Naruto deflects quickly. He thinks if he keeps it close to his chest then maybe he can take advantage of it again someday, without being taken advantage of. Tsunade's nose scrunches up in distaste but pushes no further. You haven't seen Sasuke yet? Karen asks her paramour. Not yet, I keep getting distracted. Naruto admits. I'm going to see him now though. This is the part where I go. Jiraiya announces. I've had enough of that brat. You know how much money I spent trying to shack him up with total babes? I never want to see his face again. Tsunade pinches the bridge of her nose and Sakura looks disgusted. Stop being melodramatic. The will of a super pervert cannot falter. The geezer says sagely. I'll meet you in Tsunade's office, kiddo. We have some things to talk about. Later. Naruto waves. He's glad that things have quickly gone back in place between them, no awkwardness of having been away for so long. Jiraiya is just a lecher that for some reason everyone likes. The toad sage leaps off in the great journey to find research. Naruto wishes him well. Tsunade blows a strand of hair from her face and an unwitting smile darts across her mouth. All right, come to my office before the day is done. I won't hold your reunion up anymore. Bye, Tsunade-sensei. Sakura dips her head politely. Shall we? Naruto gives his hand to Karen and she takes it up gladly. Sakura takes up to his other side, looking slightly envious but happy to have their team back together at last. Sasuke keeps the tick to his brow hidden as Himaru laughs patronizingly at his suffering. Tsukimi insists on grabbing his bangs and gives tugs none too gently. Is that my baby girl I hear? Yuido's voice comes from his bakery. Himari leads Sasuke into the bakery and Yuido doesn't take so long to recognize him. Or is at least, less dumbfounded by his appearance. And my baby boy. Yuido laughs and Sasuke nearly cringes at the embarrassing term of endearment. Pa. Tsukimi gurgles at him. He scoops her out of Sasuke's reluctant arms and hooks him around the shoulders like he used to. Come on my boy, welcome home. We have some catching up to do, huh? I was about to say the same thing. A voice from the door resounds. 
Naruto leans against the doorway of the bakery but doesn't make any move to come in. He instead looks on at the reunited family with some understanding and fondness. The sunlight at his back shades his face and makes his visible eyes stand out to them. Himari and Yuido straighten and bow. Naruto-sama. Naruto gives a dismissive gesture. No need to stand in ceremony for me. Friends of Sasuke are friends of mine. Sakura's head pokes out from behind him and she too takes in the appearance of the happy family. She smiles too, finally getting to see her teammates in the same place at the same time after two years, with their sensei too. We'll come find you again, Sasuke-kun. Sakura's bright mood couldn't be soured if anyone tried. I can't believe you came back with a baby. Kakashi sounds comically surprised. Naruto sees through the game as Sasuke immediately rises to defend himself. Don't worry, Sasuke. We'll give you enough time to let you and your daughter get settled in. She's not my daughter. Her name is Tsukimi, you morons. Kakashi, Sakura, Naruto and Karen instantly vanish, leaving the Uchiha boy grinding his teeth together. I'm gonna kill them both. Yuido and Himari nervously quiet their laughter before Sasuke's claws get any longer. Sakura had ditched them, claiming that she's had her fill of Minako for today. Tsukimi, huh? Naruto hums the familiar name. That's a good name. They walk past several mystified parents and into the academy. Hey Shizun. Naruto walks past casually in the academy hallway. Hey Naruto. Shizun replies without even realizing. Wait, Naruto? I should have known all of the commotion would have been you. Me? I'm the picture of innocence. Your bingo book entry says otherwise. Shizun replies dryly. I have a bingo book entry? How much is my bounty? That's all you care about? Kakashi decides to fill him in. Between 50 million and 70 million, depending on which nation. Naruto frowns. What a pitiful amount. I guess they can't afford the shinobi it would take to kill me. Don't worry Naru, Karen attempts to cheer him up. Maybe next time you can wipe out the Akatsuki and someone will put a bigger bounty on you. I guess. Naruto mopes. What a stupid thing to be sad about. Anyway, I have someone to abduct from class. I take it you're here because of the village overreacting to my presence? Shizun narrows her eyes. Naruto puts his arms up disarmingly with a smile that wouldn't set anyone at ease. He swore he could feel her eye roll. The former assistant turns her attention to Karen. You look absolutely incredible, dear. She compliments genuinely. Karen blushes expectedly, hands crossing over her clean and silky arms as if to trace the bites that marred it. Thanks, Shizun. It was a surprise when I woke up like this but Karen turns a loving gaze to Naruto's back. My boyfriend was pretty relentless about it. It's good to know that he's still the same Naruto under all that scary reputation. Karen can't find the words to reply to that. She's been with Naruto for every step of his journey and his quest for power over the past two years. Just over two and a half, really. She'd never been on the receiving end of his raw battle prowess. Yes, he trains her, but that is something quite different to struggling for survival like all his enemies do. She can't think of a time that she'd ever been fearful of him or what he could do. And maybe that's just the physiological difference between Uzumaki and normal people. Maybe their brains are just wired to think that someone who shares the innate power of the Uzumaki is inherently a guardian and protector, someone to be reveled instead of reviled. She can't explain why she loves Naruto. She only does. And she makes sure he knows it every day, as he does with his affection for her. He's special to me. She says only, watching him open a classroom door without knocking. The teacher looks ready to relieve himself. From life. At the mere thought that an s rank shinobi wants something to do with him or his students. They observe as the students' heads perk up to the sudden noise. Minako even stands up, silky silver hair bouncing around because it looks like she knows who he is. Well? Aren't you going to give your brother a hug? Onii-chan. Ishigakur, Akatsuki mobilizing. I've heard your Atoto is good friends with the guy that offed Orochimaru, Itachi-san. Itachi's face remains blank. It might make it a bit harder to capture him. If you even want to, that is. Sure you don't have any feelings left for your baby brother? Kisame is trying to find a button to push. That much is obvious. But Itachi himself doesn't know the answers to how he's going to solve this problem. Akatsuki is a world-level threat with powerful members. It's going to quickly become harder to protect his brother from their wrath but he knows any action he takes will force the Akatsuki to take on a different strategy. One that he might not know. At least without interfering now, 
he can save that as a trump card of betrayal when the Akatsuki is on the brink of capturing Sasuke and are sure of success. The modus operandi of Senju Tobarama. We will adapt and plan around it. As always. Itachi provides stoically. Uchiha Naruto, huh? Hey, you don't see guys like that around anymore. Well, besides Pain Sama. Kisume ponders aloud. If leader Sama is fearful that we cannot defeat him, he can make an appearance on his own. He is not a man to be dissuaded from his goal. Least of all with Madara really holding the reins. Well, we still have a bit of time. Kisume shrugs it off. Maybe we can start a war here and there. Brew some chaos, draw the Jinchuriki away from the people holding their leashes. Itachi says nothing. He only thinks of how many more evil deeds he can commit to protect Sasuke. How far is he willing to let the rest of the world fall into despair to protect him? He tries to blink away the spots in his eyes but it's no longer illuminating. His sight isn't fuzzy like he thought it would become. No, it's just getting harder to pierce the veil of encroaching darkness that consumes the heart of an Uchiha. Otogakur, Hidden Base Yakashi Kabuto Kabuto swings a chakra scalpel at the unexpected intruder. It goes right through him and the swirly masked man is completely unharmed. He recoils. What kind of jutsu is this? I have a kamizen for you, young scientist. The masked man continues as if Kabuto hadn't done anything. I'd like you to research a most peculiar trait of the Makutan. Easier said than done. Kabuto snarls. Don't you think that I'd know more about it if I could get my hands on it? A white creature with a slight green tinge and green hair rises up out of the ground. This is a Zetsu. It's essentially a weak clone of Senju Hashirama. I want you to discover how well it can replicate the Keke Genkai traits of Shinobi and see if that adaptability can be passed on to a human. I can provide more than enough test subjects for this cause. And if I refuse? Kabuto says just to be petty. To feel some semblance of control for once in his life. The masked man takes no heed of it. Then we part ways. You, he looks over Kabuto's shoulder. Can go back to grinding up what's left of Orochimaru's corpses, or you can be a part of something greater and define yourself as someone who is more than Orochimaru could have ever dreamed of becoming. Kabuto swallows as sweat beads pure down his face in the humid lab. I accept. Splendid. The man is candid about it. However, killing intent erupts and Kabuto feels like he is drowning. If you double cross me, you will only wish you had died here and now. Amiga Kur, Payne's Tower. We still haven't received anything on the QB. Conan states, expressing some desire to halt the plan before they can locate it. It matters little. Payne states stoically. It will appear when the world becomes a calamity once more. It always does. That is only what Madara told you. Conan doesn't want Nagato to fall further into that man's lies and half-truths. He has been correct about a great deal of the nature of this world. Payne dismisses. Conan's nervous habit of pushing her piercing on the inside of her lip rears its head. If you're in there, Nagato, please just think this through. Chapter 15, Calm Before the Storm Sasuke didn't much feel like sparring anymore after Naruto whipped out six arms equipped with metal praying mantis-like blades, all sparking with the Chidori Jutsu that he'd copied from him years ago in the exams. And thankfully, Naruto quickly gave up his typical beating of Sasuke for fun at least, that's how Sasuke perceived it, and set to talking about the future of their home. I think we need to do something about our compound. Naruto reveals. We should search all of the houses and seal everything away in the shrine. Sasuke nods in agreement. The dilapidated state of the Uchiha compound makes it an unworthy eyesore, and that's just the exterior. Roots growing under the walls from unmanaged foliage have lifted them and caused imbalances and cracks in the roads. Shrubbery has invasively climbed the homes and feral fauna seem to be the only thing giving the abandoned homes some life. Dust cakes the inside of the windows and rain and storm damage have been left unmanaged, causing all kinds of paints to fade. The once bustling little corner of the village has become nothing more than a secret hideaway for vagrants to commit acts of vandalism and exchange illicit goods. Tsunade-sama once told him that she'd seen to it personally that anything of sentimental or secret value is now under lock and key in the Senju compound. Very few Senju still live. About as many as there are Uchiha now, and Naruto seems to find that as tragic as he does. So while the jutsu and memories of the fallen are safe, anything else has been left as free game. Doors ripped off their hinges by looters have littered the porches of these homes. Sasuke seethes at the disrespect. It'll take a while to clean up. Maybe even too long for the two of us. Sasuke doesn't trust anyone with handling Uchiha property. Yes, 
He's loyal to the population as a whole but the remains of the Uchiha compound are far too close to his heart to let anyone but Naruto and himself to handle. It might be easier to just dismantle everything and start from scratch. I can rebuild what we need but the maintenance costs will only continue to go up. This way I can find anything that might have been sealed and dispose of the rest. Sasuke hesitates. He doesn't like the idea of everything being discarded like that but he knows that Naruto has a point. It would be expensive to try and maintain the compound with just the two of them, and these grounds are hallowed. Allowing Nanuchiha to live here will only invite difficulties once Naruto inevitably kicks them out to make room for future generations of Uchiha families. It can wait a while. Naruto catches on to what is probably blatant on his face. But you should still look through everything. Sasuke nods slowly. It's a surreal experience, walking through this compound after everything that's happened. He has scarcely been here after the incident. Most of his memories in this place are of people who aren't around to share the creepy aura that empty and abandoned space gives off. How was your training trip? Naruto asks suddenly, dragging him away from doomed thoughts. Not as eventful as yours, clearly. Sasuke sends back dryly. I, for one, didn't kill a renowned traitor to Konoha or awaken a new dojutsu form. Naruto lays back into the long and wavy grass. Yes, I should have expected that your efforts would pale in comparison to my accomplishments. How silly of me. Sasuke's brow twitches at the teasing. Naruto states it as an absolute fact, which is even more annoying. I've come far using Matatabi's chakra. I think in ways that would surprise you. The creature gave itself a name? How cute. And it's only natural that the seal allows you better control over its power. That's what it's designed for, after all. Anything else would restrict its power. Sasuke isn't comfortable with the callous way Naruto refers to Baijuu. After training and speaking with the cooperative Nibi, he sees that the Baijuu are more than just weapons to be pointed in the direction of an enemy. Matatabi cherishes her name, despite deviating from the path that the Rikudo Senen put her on. The Rikudo gave her that name, she didn't pick it. Sasuke states with some annoyance on her behalf. And the Baijuu are misunderstood. They aren't just monsters that we can use at our whims. Baijuu have historically aligned with humans to achieve feats that aren't normally possible with the exception of the Aichibi and the Kyubi. I will admit fault on the behalf of humans for inspiring the world to attempt to control that power, especially in the case of Uchiha Madara and Senju Hashirama, but it is ultimately the choice of the Baijuu that leads them to facilitating that fear against them. For what reason other than pride or stupidity would they continue to align with human beings? In that way, mankind and Baijuu are alike. Always wanting to prove themselves superior. Naruto stands up and shakes off the bugs and grass, looking to make himself busy elsewhere. Don't take it as too disparaging of me to assume the worst of anyone or anything that I do not implicitly trust. There are too few people that can earn it. But Baijuu are just as accountable for their actions as humans are. If they're truly sentient, that is. Ringed eyes gaze down at Sasuke's dark ones, curling up with his smile. But maybe your naivety will help the Baijuu understand that. Maybe they can learn from an Uchiha who hasn't been taught how to hate yet. Don't forget however, that even if they speak like humans or help humans on their path, the Baiju are not humans and their motivations are beyond our understanding. Look out for yourself, Sasuke. Sasuke's lips pursed in discontent. You think I haven't learned to hate? Not in a way that gives you power. Naruto vanishes, and Sasuke is left with only his thoughts and his partner in crime. For all his quips and jokes, there is an unusual wisdom in Naruto Dono. Really? After he just trash-talked you and your siblings? Don't always take what someone says at face value. Your sensei told you as much long ago. Remember? Look underneath the underneath. On the surface indeed, he did make a crude assessment of us regarding our power. But what if he's right? The weak look at us in fear and the strong think on how to use us. Humans do the same with each other. It's up to your sensibilities to think critically about whether or not you trust us in the same way. But I will say one thing. My behavior reflects how I wish to be seen. Always. Sasuke ponders that. Is he being too idealistic? And besides, sealing a Baijuu and using its power is far, far more benevolent compared to the atrocities committed by Shinobi over the centuries. Your village is quite a bit more benign compared to where I was before. It is my choice to give you my power. Know that you are worthy of it. Naruto is perusing jewelry stores when a purple-haired Anbu drops in to relay a message. Naruto-sama, Hokage-sama wishes to see you. Very well. I'll find her shortly. The Anbu nods and flitters away. Naruto reaches out with his mind's eye of the Kagura. 
Tsunade isn't in the Hokage Tower, that much is evident. It's not too difficult to find her however. There are very few people in the village with chakra as strong as hers. Curiously, her chakra feels fogged. Perhaps there's a barrier designed to interfere with sensing abilities where she is, but evidently she knows that he's adept enough to find her if she didn't make the Anbu escort him there. He slowly makes his way through an unfamiliar part of the village. There doesn't appear to be any markets, and the only shops appear to be minor convenience stores. The homes aren't derelict by any means, but the absence of much activity makes Naruto think that this area may be something of a retirement plaza for shinobi who live long enough to tell the tale or simply couldn't go on with a life and desired some separation from the rest of the village bustle. The beginnings of Konoha's signature architecture can be seen as a prototype or origin point here. Strange bright paints and near vertical boards of wood acting as spillways for rain. The streets fluctuate up and down through compressed streets like a maze of a rabbit warren. His eyes fall upon something curious. A great red Tory gate, leading into an estate with walls that are nearly as high as it. It appears to be a heavily private villa with very, very few active homes in it. One of Hashirama's sealing jutsu? Naruto speculates to himself. It would explain the heavily muted sensation of chakra from within the compound. It's not applied to anything, but even being present would be good at fogging anyone's sensing jutsu. Given their suppressive nature, it would be a surprise if even a dojutsu could see into this compound without getting blurry vision. The Rinnegan is a different matter entirely, the core purpose of it being complete control over chakra of any kind. On entering through the gate, Naruto can feel more ambient senju chakra coming from merely four people. Tsunade stands out distinctly but the others are weak. Or rather, untested by training in battle. He takes in the surroundings with keen eyes, seeing how it has changed since Madara snooping around the village back in his day. The homes are of a traditional variety, well kept but cold and quiet. The sounds of chirping birds nesting in the gutters is prominent, along with some of the soft splashing of a fountain. Naruto's languid walk through the main path of the compound takes him to a small lake, with a quaint gazebo and a small jetty halfway to the other side. He sees Tsunade resting on a wooden rail under the shade, resting her bare feet up on it and seemingly at peace with the environment around her. The usually overt and testy woman is relaxed, even sipping away at a small jug of sake as she looks over the sun-reflective pond. Placing his gun by against a wooden support, he approaches the Hokage. Her gaze is set on a young boy, sitting on the jetty and splashing his feet in the water and looking rather sad. The last of the senju. Tsunade says without looking back at him. This is what we have been reduced to. An old woman, two cowards and a child. An S-ranked missing nin problem child, a hardliner loyalist Jinchuriki and I can think of a bunch of nasty things to describe myself. The Uchiha aren't in a place to judge what has become of our rival clan. And that's not to mention that there may be a fourth. Hmm. Tsunade hums dully. Two missing nin? You failed to mention that on your return. I don't know if he's alive. Naruto admits readily. Tsunade turns to him, more alert although her head now rests on her propped up knee. You know things. Things that I should know. Yes. This information needs to be handled with more care than I can trust Jiraiya or Kakashi with. So they have personal stakes in the identities of these menaces. Tsunade reads through the lines quickly. She is quiet for a moment. She takes another pensive glance at the lonely boy on the jetty, who is gazing down at the fish swimming under him. Tsunade seems to be in deep contemplation. Naruto waits and simply watches alongside her as the boy picks himself up at the behest of his parents, before they walk out of the compound the way that Naruto had come in. I don't know everything, she says after a while. But I can tell you some truths about the Uchiha incident. Why tell me anything at all? Naruto's curiosity peaks, but he knows that knowledge can be a double-edged sword. Because it may pertain to the downfall of my clan as well. Now that surprised him enough to turn him silent. You are too young to remember this obviously, but don't you find it odd that the two premier clans of Konoha are now nearly extinct? The Uchiha clan disappears in a single night, and the Senju clan are slowly whittled away until we're in the same position. At first, I thought it had been the wars. The Senju were steadfast and always on the battlefield. But then I started looking into the deaths of the Senju who were getting sent out to the battlefields over the past two wars. 70% of them died before their 16th birthday. The average age of a non-Senju on any battlefield was 20. Naruto's eyes lock onto hers. Senju died younger before the founding of Konoha. The entire point of founding this village was to allow Uchiha and Senju children to grow into adults. Why were they getting sent out that early? Tsunade looks back, mouth twiddling in a gesture that shows her discomfort in talking about it. At first, 
I thought it might have been hero worship on the part of Sarutobi Sensei. He fought alongside Senju Toborama who was his sensei. He knew firsthand what kind of potential is in the Senju bloodline, and he saw how quickly I excelled as his student as well. And as stupid and misguided that naive mistake could be, Sarutobi Sensei wasn't the only one drafting missions in wartime. All requests went through him though, and he had to approve them. The mission archive shows that every member of Toborama's personal detail was responsible for drafting those missions with only one exception. Uchiha Kagami. The only Uchiha on the team. Nothing concrete. Coincidence at first glance. Naruto nods along anyway, waiting for anything else. The Second Shinobi World War is in progress. Senju Tsunade is recommended by Hitake Sakumo to be dispatched with Orochimaru to the battlefield against Iwagakur Shinobi through Takigakur, stating that the more attritious nature of that front would require skilled medical nin. The request is unanimously denied by the War Council consisting of the Sarutobi Hiruzen, Yudutane Koharu, Mito Kato Homura, Hayuga Akikazu, and Shimura Danzo, despite the tactical advantage of it and Senju Nawaki is sent in her place. A 12-year-old boy who struggled with any kind of ninjutsu is sent to replace the most skilled medical nin in Konoha. He dies on the battlefield to an explosive trap. Naruto doesn't say a word about her quivering voice, but he is still failing to see how exactly this pertains to the Uchiha, his main concern. This is a rather tragic set of circumstances but I want to hear about the Uchiha clan first before we continue. Why do you think these incidents are tied together? Naruto goes straight to the point, not unconcerned with the current fate of the Senju but he has his priority set. Tsunade exhales something of a frustrated sigh. The date of your birth, reports come in that some shinobi had seen the Sharingan in the eyes of the QB when it was released from your mother. Subsequently after the QB incident is resolved, the Uchiha clan are placed on the border of the village where they are easily monitored and controlled. This decision was made by the ruling council of Konoha at the time. Naruto nods along, motioning for her to proceed. This isn't surprising news and it would be logical to an untrained ear. Six years after the QB incident, Uchiha Itachi is recommended for Anbu in statement by Sarutobi Hiruzen and Shimura Danzo. It was refused once by team captain Hitake Kakashi on the grounds of poor mental health, before later being accepted once that improved. Naruto's head tilts while his eyes narrow on Tsunade. Sasuke is under the impression that his father wanted Itachi and Anbu and Fugaku being a parent, merely congratulates his son on his feat of achieving Anbu status of his own merits and desire, all the while unaware that someone behind the scenes wanted Itachi. Fugaku had been against the idea of the Uchiha clan being an Anbu, citing that it would make it more difficult to protect the Sharingan if the clan isn't aware where the clanmates are during deployment, given the clandestine nature of the missions. Dark clouds roll overhead, casting the compound into shadow. One year after Itachi's induction into Anbu, he brings forward news that the Uchiha clan is planning to revolt and stage a coup. The Uchiha clan believe that it had been the victims of unjust discrimination by the higher-ups, and plans to take control of their village back. Diplomatic attempts by myself to prevent this from occurring ended up in failure. Uchiha Fugaku claims that this had been happening since before his time, and increasing as time went on. If they abandon the village, they would be hunted down as traitors. If they stay and don't do anything, they face more isolation and propaganda against them. If they fight, there may be a few of them alive to take what belongs to them back. Two of these scenarios end up with the same result. The extinction of the Uchiha clan. Naruto hums, unintentionally clenching a fist. So Itachi takes the initiative and strikes at the Uchiha clan before they can make a move either way. On orders of Sarutobi Hiruzen and Shimura Danzo. He hadn't been a part of that sect of the clan, being raised in his own isolation compared to them. But they had spawned Sasuke, so they couldn't all be as bad as Madara wanted him to believe. And who's to say such an event wouldn't be attempted again? That's right. After the incident, I put Danzo under permanent house arrest and stripped Sarutobi of all political power and official influence that he held over my shinobi. However, that's where more problems start. Some of my Anbu must have been collaborating with those two because it was made clear during the Chunin exam invasion that Danzo had still been operating a private division without me finding out about it. Two elderly shinobi still being helped by members of my forces despite having all official power stripped from them. Don't you find that as strange as I do? Presuming that you're telling the truth, yes. Naruto hasn't decided if he actually believes her yet. He still needs to fish for more information. He couldn't have done it alone. Naruto shakes his head. Itachi is considered a prodigy by everyone in this village but even he wouldn't be able to wipe out the Uchiha clan on his own as a child. Even if he was groomed from the start. You're right. Tsunade confirms grimly. 
Itachi came into contact with a masked man claiming to be Uchiha Madara, who told him that he would assist in the Uchiha massacre and leave Konoha alone in exchange for joining his organization. Naruto stares into Tsunade's eyes and he knows that the answer is also a question. She is providing sensitive information for equally sensitive information about the Uchiha clan. It's not Madara. Naruto denies quickly. The old man died in his sleep and I incinerated his corpse. This man is still strong enough for Itachi to think that he is Madara. No surprises there. He is Madara's apprentice. Uchiha Obito. Obito? Tsunade struggles to remember the name. I don't believe I'm familiar with him. You weren't in the village as I recall. He allegedly died while on a mission, but not before giving Kakashi his Sharingan. Madara found him and put him back together to achieve his goal posthumously. Obito was the one responsible for releasing the QB, I just didn't know for sure if he managed to survive my father. His goal? Naruto doesn't even know how to begin to explain the convoluted plan. Look, you're already aware that the Akatsuki is hunting down the Baijuu. The Eye of the Moon plan is based on an Uchiha relic that explains the history of the Uchiha and Senju. The ultimate end game of the plan is to merge all of the Baijuu into the husk of the Juubi that the Rikudo Senen sealed in the moon before he split it into nine separate beasts. The Jinchuriki of the Juubi is said to be able to reflect a powerful Genjutsu off the moon that would capture the entire world, and place every last soul in it in an eternal illusion of catered happiness. There would be no more winners or losers, and the world would be at peace. A tempting idea. That's insane. Tsunade blurts out with wide eyes. I can't even begin to describe. I know, and that's why it complicates things to know that Obito is still alive and working towards that goal, with the help of several S-rank missing Nin and a wielder of the Rinnegan. The downfall of our clans is tragic but there will be nothing left if we don't stop this plan. Tsunade looks pitying. Kakashi's teammate. No wonder that you don't want him to find out. I know you probably don't want to face him battle. No. Naruto cuts her off. Obito has to die. If he succeeds, the entire world as we know it will cease to exist. There will be no winners or losers, there will be only flat, colorless, lifeless existence that is worse than death. He's a member of my clan and another of my grandfather's mistakes, it's now my responsibility to put him back in the grave. Also, he killed my parents. We both have a lot on our plates right now. Something in Tsunade's eyes seems to glimmer approvingly, like she has discovered something about him that she didn't know for sure. But I still don't understand. If Madara had enough love and compassion in him to raise you, then why would he groom an apprentice to kill his daughter and steal the QB? A person who possesses the Rinnegan is capable of bringing the dead back to life at the cost of their own life force, and when that person has eternity at their fingertips, the dead are theirs to do with as they please. Madara believes so much in this plan that it never mattered what got in his way. He never learned to accept death until he finally realized that his way of doing things had killed his daughter and orphaned his grandson. He understood that he had the chance to make peace with reality and he had squandered it, so he took a page out of your grandfather's book and left the future to those who are here now. He leans against the wooden rail once more. Right now, it doesn't matter if the Uchiha clan revolted on their own or if it's an active conspiracy against us. I could have handled the Akatsuki alone but Obito is on a different level to the rest. Conventional tactics and ninjutsu will not be enough, I need time to prepare and the status of all Jinchuriki and Baijuu in the world will need to be assessed to make sure that they aren't stolen in one fell swoop. I have a few ideas. Go on. Tsunade gestures to him, leaving the jug of sake she'd been nursing forgotten. You could call for a Gokage summit. The first since Hashirama's time, but it would absolve Konoha of some of the responsibility if the nations are warned beforehand about the impending threat. And if we publicly announce that the Uchiha and Senju alliance is still going strong, it might be enough to dissuade certain factions in the village from moving. Mobilizing shinobi of all backgrounds in Konoha may stir enough chaos that they'll put the welfare and continued existence of the village first. The first sign of any Akatsuki members will need to be dealt with swiftly, and we need to weaken them as much as conceivably possible. They'll go for the Aichibi first, and then Sasuke if they don't decide to capture a stronger Baijuu and rend it under the Genjutsu of the Sharingan. I'll summon the council. Tsunade bounds to her feet. You'll need to be present as well. Tsunade whistles loudly, an unfamiliar tune and sound amplified with chakra. Naruto can feel it resonate over a long distance before the cat masked Anbu who'd been absent since informing Naruto of his little meeting appears before them in a flitter of motion. Yu Gao, I need you to gather the council for me. Tell them it's an emergency meeting. Two hours. Understood, Hokage-sama. Yu Gao nods professionally, before presenting a small box. And your previous request. 
Tsunade takes it from Yugao before the purple-haired woman flitters away again. I know this might not be the ideal time now for what you were planning, but... She puts the box in his hand and opens the lid. A glimmering ring shines from its decorative casing. It doesn't take a genius to know what you were looking for when Yu Gao told me where you were. You're young but if things get too busy, you might not get the chance to ask again for a long while. Chakra Crystal? Naruto looks closely at the shining teal gem. This is no cheap item to come by. Thank you. Price matters very little when it comes to my family, Naruto. I wasn't sure if you were aware, cousin mine. Tsunade winks. Don't be late. Tsunade. Naruto calls out, to get one last word in. Why did you tell me this about the Uchiha clan? Do you not fear retribution from me? Because you've never given me a reason to doubt your ability to view everything as objectively as you have. I've watched you from the start of your career, Naruto. I know that you give everyone a fair chance. I know that you don't hide things without a good reason, and I know that you'll want the complete truth before you act impulsively. Just because others in the village don't trust you, does not mean that I don't. I wanted to tell Sasuke but for all the progress he has made, he doesn't see things the same way that you do. Naruto stares deeply into her eyes, her own amber orbs not flinching at his eerie gaze. I'll train the boy. Her eyes widen a bit in surprise before she smiles again. And I'll hold you to it. He's still reeling a bit from his newfound knowledge when he finally returns home. You might not get the chance to ask again for a long while. Naruto ponders Tsunade's words as he enters his apartment. He doesn't want to do it right away, he wants it to be special for Karen. For him, he could just sign a piece of paper and be done with it, but... Naru, welcome home. Karen wraps her arms around his waist. He responds in kind and hugs her tighter than he usually does. She sinks into it expectedly, letting out a content hum that practically sings and gives him an emotional reaction that he just can't find anywhere else. Hmm, you're cuddly. Karen snuggles in more. Unusually so. Have I finally broken through the cold exterior? Naruto's lips twitch up. The cold exterior had been a running joke between them after eavesdropping on some of Sasuke's fangirls that were gushing about how dreamy he is. Finally? My heart has been yours for a long time now. Naruto speaks out with something intense in his voice. She looks up at him, scarlet eyes shining with what he understands now as love. He didn't really know what it was like to be on the receiving end of it until he met her. Everything about her is addicting. Those precious, big eyes. The beautiful hair that frames her fair-skinned face. Every movement, every smile and gesture. I love you. She goes red, and conquers her embarrassment with an overt display of affection. Karen leaps onto him and wraps her legs around his waist. She pushes his hair out of his face and gives him a tender, long-lasting kiss. He continues to hold her up by her hips after their lips separate. I love you. She gives him another kiss, fueled by emotion. I really wish we could continue. Naruto bemoans, dragging Karen to the couch and trailing his lips up her neck, making her gasp in desire. You better come back from whatever you're doing quickly. Karen whimpers as his hand crawls up her blouse, fingers rubbing her nipple teasingly. Oh oh. I will. Naruto kisses her again. He would always return to her. The love of his life. Naruto is pleasantly surprised when there is a seat next to Tsunade's with the Uchiha crest painted caringly on it. So he sits next to her, but understands that this is already a non-verbal statement to anyone in the room. Soon enough the other clan heads and advisors trudge into the room, seemingly not understanding what an emergency meeting is. If Naruto can be here on time, then they can too. At least the Anbu commander got here early, before he did even. Thank you to those who arrived on time. Tsunade's words are biting and it's nearly enough to make Naruto grin. Tsunade-sama, may I ask why Naruto Dono is present? Homura questions immediately, stern and dignified. The purpose of this meeting is not to discuss the leader of the Uchiha clan's presence on this council. I will be sending qualified members of the Shinobi Corps to deliver a request for a Gokage summit. We'll be assessing any neutral territory that may be used to convene everyone, so that we can play fairly by their rules and keep the five greater nations civilized through diplomatic negotiation. For what purpose? Koharu asks, experienced in getting to the point rather than wading through veiled insults or posturing. The ongoing threat of the Akatsuki and the repercussions it poses to all human life and free will. Tsunade states bluntly. I have conferred with Naruto Dono regarding intel Konoha has uncovered since the QB incident, and Naruto Dono believes he knows what the ultimate goal of the Akatsuki is. And why were we not informed beforehand? Koharu asks crossly, narrow eyes sparking with unease. 
Because the man with the master plan is an Uchiha. Naruto speaks up before Tsunade can give a half-truth answer. Tsunade conferred with me due to the sensitive nature of the situation. We piece together what we know to uncover the identity of the leader of the Akatsuki and have determined that. An Uchiha. Hyashi spits out, cutting Naruto off and evidently seeing it as a political opportunity. That makes two missing Nin Uchiha criminals, this is not a matter of Konoha but whether or not the Uchiha clan will continue to defect. Naruto stays silent and calm as several voices expressing the same sentiment pipe up unsolicited. His face is set in stone while insults are thrown by the less than tactful representatives of smaller clans. It's certainly different to the grateful well-wishers that he is exposed to in the streets. It seems the common folk like him a bit more than some rotten politicians. Go figure. If I may be allowed to speak again? Naruto's voice is quiet but not unconfident, and it carries over the room using the same technique he'd witnessed Tsunade use earlier to amplify her whistle. His ringed gaze goes from person to person. Some flinch at the eyes, but the most indignant see them as nothing more than another shinobi parlor trick. He wonders how confident they would be if they knew just how much the eyes are capable of. I will spare you the legends and historic conjecture and give you the quick and easy rundown of why all of Konoha must band together. Firstly, the Akatsuki is composed exclusively of S-rank missing Nin, two of which are Uchiha with an advanced form of the Sharingan and another who possesses the Rinnegan. A myth surrounding the Uchiha and Senju and exemplify their own sense of self-importance. Hyashi interrupts again. Part of Naruto wants to roll his eyes. Are these people even looking at him right now? They can quite clearly see that he isn't parading the Sharingan around anymore. He knows that Tsunade won't be too pleased either but she has literal decades of experience in controlling a temper tantrum. Secondly, Naruto continues as if uninterrupted. The surface goal of the Akatsuki is to acquire all nine Baijuu. The Baijuu are historically used as weapons by the nations who control them, and in doing so maintain a geopolitical balance of deterrence. If one organization or nation came into the possession of several Baijuu, let alone all nine, they could either seal them into more cooperative hosts or use them as immediate weapons of destruction. With the Sharingan and Rinnegan capable of manipulating and controlling a Baijuu respectively, you may be able to see the issue approaching. This is a tangible threat that cannot be ignored, seeing as the existence of the Akatsuki has already been proven. Naruto is careful with his words, using half-truths of his own instead of giving them a lecture on unproven history that has been forgotten by nearly all common folk and clans. He idly wonders how Nagato learned to believe it, or if he even believes it at all and is instead working towards a different endgame than Obito. And the Uchiha clan's role in this threat? Shikaku's question cuts across the room like a knife. His narrow and dark eyes are focused and his posture is upright. It seems if nothing else, he is willing to listen and ask hard questions, not what takes him up the ladder to a higher position in Konoha's control hierarchy. I take responsibility for the wrongdoings of my clanmates. Naruto states stoically. But do not mistake this as any more than what the average shinobi does for Konoha. It was always the responsibility of the Uchiha clan to handle these messes. Another member of a small clan erupts. Jeers and revolting comments make Naruto disappointed with the proceedings of the council. He tried to do things their way, but he is so utterly above their level that he can feel his brain cells dying to even attempt reaching that low. You are, of course, correct. The Uchiha and Senju have traditionally been the most powerful clans in Konoha based on shinobi skill, and there are no others capable of handling a threat like this within Konoha. So naturally, the continued existence of the village is dependent on our actions as per usual. It is unsurprising that two of the greatest threats from the Akatsuki are Uchiha, there are too few others to pick from in Konoha. Tsunade's lips twitch behind crossed fingers. And as I recall Naruto speaks up again before any dissenters can interrupt. The actions of these few criminal outliers have impacted the Uchiha clan most of all. Do you know how old the youngest person killed by Uchiha Itachi was? He was a six-month-old Uchiha boy. Naruto takes in a breath while council members look at each other unsurely. So yes, I will be taking a direct hand in this situation in order to protect future generations. I know that many of you are living in your own little bubbles of safety, turning against each other and vying for imaginary political power, but dedicated Konoha shinobi are out there in the wilds gathering intel on threats like this and to waste time as pathetically as you have tonight is a disgrace to their sacrifices. While you are squabbling, an Anbu dies to send word of the identity of an Akatsuki member. While you argued whose daughter will marry who, I killed Orochimaru, a long-standing traitor to this village. There is stillness in the chambers, but Naruto isn't done yet. This is why this is all you will ever be, sniveling politicians incapable of seeing the big picture. But do not forget, you obey the Hokage under all circumstances. 
Shinobi culture doesn't work as democratically as you may naively think, it is based on the tangible conception of physical power through chakra and shinobi arts, and nothing will change that. You will obey the Hokage, or you will be left to the wastes that exist outside of this village. If you are lucky. His chakra unintentionally permeates the chambers, leaving everyone sweating and struggling to take in air. We are not here to talk about the Uchiha clan, because these menaces will be handled as all Konoha traders are, irrespective of clan or creed. We aren't here to talk about how a vaunted council member only three years ago was found dead with Senju cells and eleven implanted Sharingan. We are here to stay alive. Naruto stands up, not bothering to reel in his chakra and simply flexes it some more to compound the issue. In one month, I'll be heading to Kirigakura to assess the status of the Sanbi and Rakubi Jinchuriki. I hope that you don't disappoint as you already have by not making yourselves useful. In a control hierarchy that isn't based on strength, Naruto would be reprimanded for disobedience, making thinly veiled threats and making his own decisions. But this is the way of Shinobi, so Tsunade nods and bids him good luck. Politics. Naruto spits out spitefully. It would be too soon the next time he is forced to sit through this nonsense. The Uchiha clan status can come after this threat is dealt with for good. One week later. How much will the world take from you before you're willing to give it your lives too? Senju Takehito and his wife Mika are startled when Tsunade barges into their little part of the Senju villa with a giant of a man in tow. She demands of them an answer, not asks for one. He knew that a confrontation would be inevitable after Fujita's birth. Tsunade had been patient for eight years, letting them raise their boy in peace and by their own desires while keeping them out of political affairs. Fujita's civilian school teachers had been warned extensively that the boy's surname is not to reach the ears of other children or parents. Strictly. But their clan had dwindled away. Takehito had been too fearful of shinobi life to continue past his Janan days, when his family had been cut down before his eyes during the Third Great Shinobi War, taking up work as a carpenter instead. There had only been three of them left after the war, but the uneasy felt at being the last of Senju Toborama's descendants had never left him. His childhood had been lecture upon lecture of shinobi arts and studies and the importance of the continuation of the clan. He doesn't want that life for his boy. As much as Fujita had cried and begged to go to the shinobi academy, both Takehito and Mika had been too scared that they would lose their only child to the tumultuous nature of shinobi life and refuse, letting him go to civilian school instead. Please, Tsunade Takehito lets out a weary sigh with his request. Mika gives off a little noise of distress too, looking like she's fighting the urge to run up the stairs and run away with their son. I understand, Tsunade nods but does not break her posture. She is a woman on a mission and would not be dissuaded, it seems. But this is the future of our clan. I cannot and will not let us go quietly in the night. I will fight for our survival, and it's more important now than ever before that the boy becomes capable of defending himself. Mika shrinks into herself as she realizes the determined nature of Tsunade's spiel. Indignant aggression wells up in his chest. You should have thought about that before abandoning us. Takehito hisses, spittle flying from clenched teeth. We were dying. My brothers were getting killed before my eyes while you ran off and drank away your sorrows. You had the chance to spawn your own progeny and you didn't. Tsunade is famously an aggressive woman, but she has a unique patience with her family that she does not exercise anywhere else. So she merely puts up her hand as a polite gesture to make him stop. I am taking my own measures to ensure the continuation of our clan. Tsunade subconsciously rubs the waistband over her stomach and both take Hito and his wife's breaths shorten. So I'm catching up on my part. Even at my age, a Senju can still continue the legacy. They're speechless and can't respond to that bombshell. I'm not pushing this lightly. Tsunade goes on tiredly. But the world is about to become a dangerous place. I've uncovered something that might not end until certain people are convinced that the Senju will not be an entity in Konoha any longer, and there are madmen preparing to assault the entire world to achieve their own lunatic goals. What I need you to do right now is trust me. It will be all of our lives if you don't. We have a wealth of resources to help begin anew. I suggest you read up and practice a bit to pass anything on to your son while you can to make his new apprenticeship easier. This is too much, Tsunade-sama. Mika looks on the brink of tears. Mika had always been a shy woman since Takehito had first started interacting with her. Born as the bastard daughter of a wealthy family years ago, her noble blood had meant little to a clan that sought to sell her off as good stock and be rid of her and keep her distant from their name. Takehito met her once when he'd still been a Janan, his Jounin sensei unintentionally interrupted her transport to the family she was to be wed into while fighting off Asuna Jounin. The escorts had been killed in the process and feeling responsible, his sensei had offered her safe passage to Konoha. 
Takehito offered her a place to stay. After all, there weren't any people around that really cared what the Senju had been up to after the death of Senju Tobarama, so the clan welcomed her in with open arms and after a decade of getting to know each other and helping her feel like she had some control and order in her life, she leapt into his arms after he'd asked her to marry him. Her existence had been swept under the rug by those close to the Senju clan in order to prevent her former family from collecting some good Senju stock, blood with a prestigious name. And with that control rapidly depleting, Mika becomes increasingly distressed. Tsunade stands up straight, and Takehito knows that no will not suffice as an answer. This is happening regardless of what they want. You won't get to choose your destiny without strength on your side, because conflict is gonna come knocking regardless of how low you keep to the ground. The best chances for your and the boy's survival has already been organized. Uchiha Naruto will be his sensei when he is ready. Uchiha Naruto. Takehito whispers. He doesn't keep up to date much on shinobi names but even he'd heard about the rising star. S rank war machine as the stories go, whose every jutsu was another shinobi's final trump card. Tsunade turns to leave. I'm not taking chances that I don't have too, and I know that Naruto values the senju for his own selfish reasons, but those reasons will see to it that we stay alive and we can build our legacy again. If it really turns out that it had never been our fault from the beginning for the decline of our clans, I will be the first to demand answers. Naruto and Karen are laying in bed, not eager to get up and make the day theirs just yet. She preens as his hand snakes through her hair, and he just admires the little grin on her face as she rests against his bare chest. Wanna go out tonight? Naruto asks candidly. Yes. Somewhere nice. Her body arches in a stretch as the sun peers through the bedroom window. Good thing I made reservations for somewhere nice then. I was worried I might have to ask my side bitch. Naruto hisses as Karen pinches his nipple for the teasing. She wriggles on top of him to a straddling position, letting the sheet fall from her shoulders with little regard for modesty in the privacy of their home. Karen is thin, with defined abdominals as the visible merit of her hard work. Her breasts are inviting, but no more than the hips spread across his own with the visible, tidy red strip drawing his attention. His hands move of their own accord, scaling up her smooth and flawless skin. He subtly uses the Asura path to make two arms under his shoulders, pushing them both into a more upright sitting position, and they're quickly face to face. Love. Devotion. Honesty. Hope. Legacy. There is so much in this woman, so much that exists and so much of a future that he can see having with her. And he hardens his resolve. Tonight is the night. Very funny. She whispers huskily. Now, get in the shower. Can't forget that she's a total babe either. Naruto really does think he's the luckiest man around. Tonight. I'm doing it tonight. Naruto pulls his hair back into a low ponytail not unlike Jiraiya's, with his hair parted to the sides of his face similarly. Not for the first time, seeing as he keeps pulling off the hairband and messing it up in nervousness. Yes Naruto, I got that after the fifth time you said it. Kakashi and Jiraiya watch in amusement as Naruto paces back and forth and Sasuke tries to calm him down. What if she says no? Oh four. Sounds like you're going to have a wonderful night. Shizun spends an inordinate amount of time styling Karen's hair. It takes more willpower than she cares to admit in order to stop herself from even dropping a hint. Shizun. Karen laughs it off. Come on, you're not usually this henish. Karen Chan, I want to help you out sometimes too. I can't trust girls your age to teach you everything about fixing your hair. Shizun plays it as well as she can. Minako looks on in awe. Karen nay, you're so pretty. Nah, thank you sweetie. Karen tugs her into a mini hug. Your hair's next, you know that right? Does your toe-san know how many boys he's gonna have to scare away? Karen nay. Minako turns red. Shizun hides her sly smile and the two babble on. Alright, I'm fairly convinced that he's actually gonna go through with it. Jiraiya tells Tsunade readily. He damn well better. I didn't commission that ring for nothing. Then I suppose it's high time that I get one for you. The slight pause before Tsunade's answer made his heart thump in his chest in fear of her response. You damn well better. She shuffles into his side without turning to look at him. Jiraiya grins, heart rate slowing. Turns out he'd been right all along. Senju and Uzumaki simply view relationships very differently to the average person. But one thing is consistent. They find someone, get glued to them and refuse to part ways until something catastrophic happens, and the grief that overwhelms them. Tsunade's life has been wrought with tragedy, but she is a strong woman that can bounce back and find motivation and meaning in her life. Age and time matter little to these peculiar specimens. 
he just counts his lucky stars that she chose him after all this time. Even if it's not normally viable to have kids at their age, Tsunade is equipped with the knowledge and genes to make things work. It takes many nails to build a crib. But only one screw to fill it. It's a hard time for Konoha right now. Their relationship has been on the down low for a long time but the world has gotten to the point that Konoha doesn't need one grand spymaster to do all the work for them. It's time to guide the next generations, not do everything for them. The coming battles will be hard fought, but Konoha will pull through. Such is the will of fire. Shame you have to quit drinking too. Jirai attacks on unhelpfully. Tsunade's groan tells him that she's already aware. It's happening. Sakura hushes the hiding crowd outside, many of them are transformed into pot plants and tables while the others hide behind cover and observe impatiently. The darkness in the street is but a weak background to the bright and decorative lamplights of the restaurant. It's not even near closing time but the restaurant staff appear to wait with bated breath, subtly moving over to various tables and asking for a minute of quiet. They can practically hear Naruto's heart thudding in his chest. He looks ever so handsome in his indigo yukata, and Karen is unimaginably beautiful with her flowery pattern one of her own. Naruto and Karen stand up, giggling and practically all over each other already. Come on, Naruto. Sasuke quietly cheers on his friend and Sakura feels much the same. Kakashi and Shizun look on with delight, already knowing what's going to happen. As Karen begins to peel away to the door, Naruto drops to one knee and grabs her hand, making her turn on heel. He pulls out a small box and presents it to her. Karen's hands fly up to cover her mouth, and her knees grow weak. Naruto's mouth moves wordlessly to them through the windows of the restaurant. Karen's head bobs rapidly three times. She leaps into his arms with a screaming yes that can be heard far outside. Every single person hiding and in the restaurant leaps to their feet with crying cheers. Chapter 16, Hard Truths The encroaching darkness in his eye never fades away. It does not give him pain, nor does it ever feel strained. But there is an absolute truth in the secret power of the Sharingan for one who hasn't been born to use its cursed power. There is only one natural child born with the unholy union of the Uchiha and Senju, but he himself is not Madara's progeny. Through already unnatural means, his eye clings to the light for far longer than it should have. By all rights, he should have been blind well over a decade ago. But the patchwork is not flawless, and one day it will become a burden too hard to ignore any longer. He will lose his light if he doesn't do something to evolve. To become the greater version of himself. What little remains of his actual flesh on his right side aches predominantly. The scars warping around his face are familiar creases and the softest blow of the wind can make them tingle uncomfortably. But these minor things are parts of what little identity of his own that he has left, and he clings to it. It is motivation, this burning hatred that screams in his mind whenever he sees the injustice of this disgusting world. Every pore of his body emanates rage that those born lesser in this world are doomed to be ruled and abused by the strong. It would end, of course. For that is the persona that is Uchiha Madara. There will always be an Uchiha Madara, for Madara is he who rejects this cursed world. Madara is he who commits the foulest, most evil of deeds so that none more may ever need to. It is a life of sacrifice in the name of absolute, inarguable peace. His real self will be allowed time to flourish in the dream. He will shed the skin of evil and rejoin a pure life that was robbed from him for the crime of being born in an evil world. Obito stalks through the walls and rooms of Kabuto's underground lab. He keeps his chakra clamped in his body while his Sharingan scans each and every surface for traps and anything that may be capable of surveillance on him. His decision to turn Kabuto into a research slave had paid off immediately, but he is no fool. He knows that having Kabuto do this research in the first place is a risk, so naturally he learns as much as possible from the boy's notes now while he can before Kabuto decides to get too big for his britches. The plan is ever in motion, and sometimes that requires him to consider each factor contributing to its ultimate fulfillment. Whether or not Nagato becomes disagreeable and attempts to forge his own cursed destiny, or whether or not Zetsu as an extension of Madara's will, also becomes sympathetic to Naruto who has shown no inclination to follow Tsuki no Mi. Irrespective of reason, he has to try and make things work, which is why he approached Kabuto in the first place, so that maybe he could discover the power required that he wouldn't have to rely on subordinates to get things done for him. That had been why he'd helped that poor child Itachi in his quest to destroy the Uchiha clan. You never know when you need spare eyes. Madara would have been able to acquire the Baijuu in one fell swoop back in his prime, provided that he had the Rinnegan. Swift like the wind and like a ghost, but Obito does not possess such velity yet. For as unnaturally powerful his chakra and Sharingan are, he isn't built like Madara. 
White Zetsu's matter had been an expedient solution to replace his limbs and organs, but it does not contain the same innate potential that human flesh does. Naruto is proof enough of that. Obito glides through a wall and spots Kabuto toiling over a microscope. The lab is surprisingly well lit for one of Orochimaru's musty old hideouts, the new lamps on the walls decorating spiral dark spiral architecture make an almost stylish picture. The scent of burnt Zetsu is prominent, not unlike that of natural forest ashes after a purging fire. Zetsu clones are lined up against the walls, some of them malformed from Kabuto's prodding experimentation. One of them has taken an appearance similar to that of Orochimaru, although the strange quiet chittering coming from it and the other Zetsu makes it seem as though they are struggling to let their typical strange eccentricity surface while under the influence of foreign chakra. Kabuto. Obito greets almost casually, and the boy doesn't startle. He has good training as a shinobi, such talent has been squandered until now. What do you have for me? The silver-haired boy takes off his glasses, showing Obito dark orbs that are transitioning into slitted yellows, not unlike his traitorous mentor. He is calm, sometimes smug, and other times has an inkling of childish joy at success in his field. He is a prodigy of research, it is his calling and he loves it clearly. It is his purpose and his passion. The modifications he is performing on himself have seemingly stripped the deep-seated genjutsu that once rented him under Sasori's control, and he seemingly relishes it. He'll have that and more. Later. Every last being will. Your theory was correct about the white zetsu not being capable of producing chakra. Kabuto waves an arm gaily over his requisition test subjects. They aren't good for much more than infiltration. Once the chakra that they steal has depleted, they're basically useless. I'd say that they're better off being farmed for prosthetics for a living chakra source. Obito rolls up the sleeve of his right arm, showing the spongy matter that replaced his arm. I am aware of that utility. Obito drawls, embellished in Madara's own smug persona. Hashirama was not a gentle fighter. Enough of my body has been replaced that I do not need much sleep. Kabuto's sharp gaze assesses it curiously, it's a good replacement, I'll give it that. It's like you said, it can take on the traits of a human while passing on the benefit of a weaker Makutan to its user, but it consumes chakra far quicker than natural organs. I'm surprised that you can walk around and fight at the rate it eats your chakra. It has too many fringe benefits not to have an equal cost. Ah, Kabuto. People have always underestimated me. Obito feels his cheeks pull into something nearly like a smile under his mask. Can these traits be transferred to human flesh? Obito questions, it was his original question that he acquired Kabuto as an asset for, after all. It's been done before. Kabuto reveals simply, making Obito blink somewhat confusedly. Orochimaru-sama, he catches himself for a second. Orochimaru successfully implanted Senju Hashirama cells into a human child. It's dangerous, but the boy was compatible enough with the cells to receive every one of the Shodai's genetic chakra traits, just not nearly as strong as the man himself. He was the only test subject that survived a full transfusion. Is this procedure theoretically possible for an adult? Obito asks, knowing that it's possible to obtain the Makutan at least but not for his current survivability. Kabuto shifts somewhat. Only if the recipient has extremely powerful chakra, and a body strong enough to withstand it. I'm sorry to say that your current body wouldn't be a viable candidate. The Zetsu research has helped show a safer way of performing it another Keke Genkai ability transmission, but without real flesh, I would die. Obito nods stoically. Kabuto nods as well, eyes calculating. Very well. Your research has been a boon to me, so name something that you want in exchange before I give you your next project. Kabuto looks openly surprised before it shifts into something of an understanding expression. I take it my next study is finding out how to regenerate original flesh and bone? Kabuto sighs, but his demeanor is confident. All right. I want you to keep Konoha off of my back. Obito nods. Is that all? Kukaku, anyone else would pale at the thought of fighting Konoha now. Kabuto chuckles. That's all. I have everything else that I need. In that case Obito walks over to a glass cabinet containing Orochimaru's statue ring. Then there's only one thing left. He picks up the ring and offers it clearly. I am presenting to you the opportunity to officially join the Akatsuki. You are free to refuse, but you may come across some interesting things for your personal research should you choose to become one of us. Kabuto looks at the ring and takes it gently out of Obito's hand. You know, Madara-san, Kabuto slides it onto his finger. No one else has ever given me a choice. It's always do this or die. Obito puts his hand on the boy's shoulder, and Kabuto looks into his Sharingan. You and all others will be a part of the world I am creating. 
a world where everybody will be ruled by their own choices, and not of others. Where every soul has the agency to choose their destiny. The goal of the Akatsuki does not discriminate by the circumstances of one's life. Kabuto is a frail and easily manipulated boy, lost in a cruel world. But a useful tool in securing the fate of their entire species. But he is like a cornered animal that can only run away so many times. Best keep a person like this close to him. Kamui. He whisks them away with a whirl of space. Soraku. Kabuto blinks when he's suddenly in a completely unlit room. His enhanced eyes help him see that it's barely the size of a bedroom, and there is moist dirt under his sandals. The only feature of the room is a stairwell with roots seeping in from the trapdoor access. Madara pokes his head through the top of the entrance, appearing to be intangible. He seemingly assesses the outside before he bobs back down and knocks open the hidden entrance. A dark canopy of leaves shadows much of the light that might seek to enter, but the rushing winds and grey background make it clear that the beginnings of a storm wouldn't let much light through anyway. We have some rules. Madara explains briefly, not so much as motioning for him to follow. You are to never divulge the nature of any goal of the Akatsuki, short or long term. You will represent an image of strength when in battle, no matter how deviant your personality you choose to wear. And lastly, never take action against a potential asset of the Akatsuki. What constitutes an asset? Kabuto asks, wondering just how much it will take to actively piss off a man as powerful as Madara. If Orochimaru could slither around for as long as he had, then it must mean that Madara didn't consider him even worth taking out. You'll get the full list and induction from Payne, the foe leader of our organization. But the closest asset between your bases of operations is here, Soraku. It's a remote city in Haino Kuni, bordering on Ame. Kabuto could probably have thought as much on his own. They step out of dense woodland to see a near-abandoned city. Few strangers bustle around with raincoats and dark clothes. Some buildings have lighting and others look destroyed. Perfect for covert gatherings. Madara continues, small droplets of rain beginning to fall on his mask. It is a city of those who have been abandoned. The Uchiha clan once had a strong presence here as a hired police force for the local lord but they weren't easily replaced and this place has since been claimed by every kind of scum you could imagine. Black market contraband, human traffickers, murderers, rapists and everything else. Uchiha Fugaku's occasional presence here was enough to convince Ame that this place was more trouble than it was worth. If this exists in Haino Kuni, I'm surprised the Hokage has done nothing about it. Kabuto says, pulling his hood up to hide from the increasing downpour. The wind seeks to drive it off his head and they both have to raise their voices to be heard over it being this close to Ame is its greatest deterrent. Tsunade, pitiful as she is, may still be fearful of Hanzo of the Salamander. Any mobilization of her shinobi anywhere near this place will be retaliated against with extreme prejudice. War takes a very large toll on any nation involved, and fighting Ame after many consecutive tragedies in Konoha wouldn't be wise when they're already aware of Akatsuki's goal of taking possession of Baijuu and Jinchuriki. They need to gather their strength if we're to even capture one Baijuu, and that gives this town some safety from external conflict. Kabuto toils over that. He wonders just how much Konoha can know about the operations of the Akatsuki at all when they're so busy contending with Baijuu attacks, clan massacres, increasing missing nin numbers and multination invasion attempts. It would be impossible to police a place like this when they have so much on their plate to deal with as it is. You must have a leak for that kind of information to be out in the wild. Kabuto comments idly. I am aware, and don't think that it isn't intentional. The five great nations are greedy, if even one speaks up about a threat to all of them then it will immediately be presumed as a power play to lower their guards and steal from each other. With a nation as hated by the entire world as Konoha, the risk of all the nations mobilizing is low compared to the benefit of sowing more discourse between them, and the addition of nurturing Uchiha Itachi's eyes full of potential should I ever need some spares. Even if I'm bound to hold my word to leave Konoha alone for now, Itachi will end up getting himself killed sooner or later. Hatred runs strong in that boy. My, my. You really do think everything through. Kabuto can't quite hide the admiration in his voice. Beware of an old man in a profession where men usually die young. Be on your guard, Yakashi Kabuto, else you may just learn something. They weave through the streets and not one person gives them a side by glance. The pouring rain is annoying but not completely intolerable with a smattering of rusty metal sheets forming verandas. Kabuto notes that many buildings that he presumes to be apartments, do not have stairs or ramps leading to their doors. Instead it seems that the high-density apartments must be accessed by walking up the walls. A haphazard strategy to fit more people into what few of the habitable buildings remain. This place is where the ultimate truth of shinobi culture rears its head. 
Madara speaks up as they stop in front of something a bit more cozy looking. This is where all of the platitudes of peace and loyalty will fall apart, and everyone defaults to their true selves. The only truth a shinobi understands. Is power, and order through it. They step into the well-lit warehouse. Dust cakes every crate and surface, but there seem to be a few spots where animals may have been sitting that have a lesser gray layer covering it. His enhanced hearing picks up purring and an occasional meow. He didn't even know pet life could survive in a desolate place like this, and happily too. About time. An old woman's voice summons from a living space. Nekoba. Madara nods to her, presumably in a kind of respect. Is my order complete? The old woman blows rings from a thin pipe, looking upon them both casually. Her head ticks in the direction of some fresher looking crates. Everything. Giant shuriken, metal stakes, standard weapons, and your cloaks. And your end. Nekoba is not subtle with her demand for recompense. I will personally escort you and your granddaughter away from this place. Madara ensures. I'll take you to Nami no Kuni. It is remote enough from shinobi conflicts, and I'll give you double the price of this requisition so you can settle in easier. Nekoba nods. Tamaki. A teenage girl steps out from a storeroom. Or bedroom, Kabuto can't really get a handle on the ridiculous layout. Cats are walking around and hissing at him or running away, from all kinds of directions. Are your belongings packed? H. Hi, Bakken. Tamaki confirms shyly, not wanting to glance at Kabuto himself. Probably not too keen on strangers. A loud crash from behind them has Kabuto whirling around to face the disturbance. As I said, Kabuto. Madara says as if nothing is happening. These people are governed by power alone. Leftovers of the great nations. I told you, there's a girl living here. Fresh and pretty, she'll fetch us a good price. Madara is unmoved. Tamaki-chan, please help my new employee find a good fit for his clothes and cloak, hmm? Tamaki shakes violently but gives him a weak, hi, Tobi-sama. There were light steps of what had to be twenty experienced, strong shinobi that had once been gifted and functional members of their villages. And then there was a lot of screaming, agonizing screams of terror and pain that shattered the silence of the warehouse. The girl doesn't speak a word to him, she only holds up Akatsuki uniforms to his body and judges if they're to his stature. Kabuto doesn't try to entice anything out of her, keeping to the rules about Akatsuki assets. And when he comes out of the storeroom with new clothes and spares, Kabuto says nothing of the splattered pieces that were once human beings, all skewered by roots and ripped apart or had their bodies crushed or sliced open. It is a veritable shower of blood, and if he didn't have a healthy fear of Uchiha Madara before, then he does now. To think. That this is Madara's weaker self. Nami no Kuni. In contrast to the bleak weather in Soraku, there is sunlight shining in a thriving seaside village, complete with signs of life as far as the eye can see. Seagulls harass the locals for pieces of food and dolphins splash playfully further out. The citizens of this place are happy, Kabuto can tell. After leaving Nekoba and Tamaki to their own devices with stern warning not to reveal anything about them, Madara gives him the quick rundown before his official induction. The ring will allow you to communicate with pain when he summons you and the other members of the Akatsuki. You won't be involved in the process of sealing the Baijuu until we start losing those who are involved. I need you to do those little important things we've been talking about. Madara takes out a ring and puts it on his finger, and suddenly Kabuto is submerged in darkness. Phantom images of other Akatsuki members start appearing before his eyes, although much of them is obscured by their flashing forms. The red clouds stand out, as do their eyes. A pair of Sharangan stands out the most, along with the rippled purple eyes. Ohio, Pain Sama. Madara screeches out in a high-pitched voice. Kabuto blinks in confusion. Toby. Pain, the man with what is quite clearly the Rinnegan greets deeply. Such powerful, mystical eyes. It seems the legends are true. I did as you asked and got a new recruit for the super-secret plan. Toby, Sasori interrupts, a grating growl of a voice. Datara is rather upset that you stole his ring. Eh? Datara senpai Toby flails his arms around fearfully. Oh no. I just wanted to help Pain Sama. The silhouette of who Kabuto supposes is Hoshigaki Kisame, chuckles openly with mirth. Don't worry, Toby. I'm sure your senpai will forgive you if you apologize. Phew. Toby wipes imaginary sweat from his. Mask. The new member. Pain's voice crackles over the dramatic acting. Introducing left. Yakashi Kabuto. He's strong, smart, and he can keep a secret. Perfect for what you asked. Good. Pain seemingly picks up that as a foe leader, 
he is taking responsibility for Madara's recruit. Welcome to the Akatsuki. With this organization, you will be a part in changing Shinobi history and culture forever. Speak with me when the others leave, but to reiterate to the other members, infighting is forbidden. You are never to hinder your fellow members in any capacity. Kabuto listens to Payne's drawl as the other members slowly flitter away, and thinks that this man and Madara truly believe in what they're saying. They want to change the world. Even for people like Kabuto. And it was his own choice to join. Sounds like something he can get behind. Unknown location. The blizzard pelting him begins to let up for the first time after many months. He is hidden. He is distant. And he has been learning. To master himself so that no other may take domain of him against his mighty will again. He has a hunger not for food, but for a different kind of fulfillment. He had a purpose once. Those wicked children of a man who let him feel love had robbed him of his purpose. He was a weapon. A being that could be subdued. He is that no longer. They toyed with a force beyond their ken. He would remain loyal to that man and his vision. He too, can change and move past years of tragedy for the sake of a dream. It is his time to return to the world left to him, left to all of them. That fiery woman was a vessel of base instinct. She was a lesson in learning what you truly yearn for. She made a sacrifice that too few others would, and it has inspired him. He admires this world now. Not for what exists in it, but for its future and potential, and perhaps it has taken him too long to understand himself in order to see it. To think as that man did once, as that woman did. To earn a better future through action and hope, and he is strong enough. The strongest of all of them. His breath melts the snow in a desolate wasteland of pure white. It takes more than a moment to remember how to move all of him. First come his paws, then come his claws. And with one great flick of his nine glorious tails, the sky clears and radiant light shines down upon him. It is the turning of an age. Best be present to see it. Kanahagakur. A small unit of Naruto's close acquaintances and friends are present in the Hokage Tower, waiting for him so they can say goodbye. It's hardly private, with Shinan and their teachers running around and giving him scared looks, but it will do. Don't suppose I can talk you out of doing this alone? Kakashi is persistent. I am enough for whatever is happening in that wreck of a nation. Tsunade can only spare so many strong shinobi for a mission that might not even be successful in the way that we want. He's right, Kakashi. Sasuke affirms. We need to be here or warning the other nations. If what Naruto said is true about how strong the Akatsuki is, we're in deep now. I know, Kakashi sighs in defeat. But I still worry. Me too, Kaka-sensei. Sakura frets, bounding over to Naruto with her long pink hair dancing behind her. She locks him into a bone-crushing hug. You're ready? Tsunade leans forward in her chair, fingers clasped in front of her mouth. I am. Tsunade nods and slides over a small scroll to him. Good luck. Karen looks at her fiancé and thinks on how he has grown. Not physically, as impressive as his stature and muscle are. She thinks about how all that selfish focus had been simple, young child that he was. And now he is taking the continuation of the entire human race on his shoulders, a soon-to-be wife, the legacy of the Uchiha clan, and maintaining himself as a figure of strength and deterrence against those who would even dare to touch a hair on the heads of Konoha citizens. He sees things very, very differently to others his age. He has a calm, accepting attitude to the world as it is and doesn't think about how it should be. Naruto once told her that to remove all struggle from the world was to remove its soul. No one can truly accept a perfect life because it is one vacant of the sensations granted by success. He see conflict of the mind and body as the perfect crucible to ascend to higher levels than humanity is on right now. When Naruto told her of this dream world, she had to admit that the temptation would be far too strong for someone like her if she hadn't met Naruto. Her life had been nothing but suffering with no reward, she would have taken any escape to give her some agency in her life. But she still has her struggles, only now with a bit of help, she understands that they make her stronger than ever before. She would achieve her dreams on her own terms and the reward would be ever sweeter. Her love looks to the stars when he speaks of these things. He ponders if they're alone in the vast blackness of the sky. Naruto is always looking towards the future, to a hope that no one else sees yet. And he tells her, what if we're not strong enough? It's hard to grasp that Naruto might not think that he's strong enough as a protector to save them. But what if he's right? It would be their end, to surrender completely to a dream instead of the eternal struggle, the eternal growth of humanity. These thoughts send chills through her and make her stomach sink, so she tries to leave the worry wording to him. He prefers it that way. A soft clinking drags her from her doomed thoughts. 
Naruto's crimson plate armor is quite vivid. I'm ready. He breathes out, saddling his gun by to a hook on the shoulder plate. Do you have two? Karen asks weakly, desperately, wanting to spend every waking moment with the love of her life. For your sake. Naruto nods resolutely, eyes determined. And for the sake of all of us. An action will only make things easier for them. She leans on the tips of her toes and throws her arms around his neck. She breathes in his scent, and the metal and oils. Come home safe, love. Always. She walks outside with him, eyes never leaving him as he slowly rises into the sky with light blue chakra fluttering around him. He takes off in his perfect Susano to the awe of many spectators. She can't be impressed with the light show. She just wants Naruto to come back. Chapter 17 Bloody Mist Naruto makes his Susano dive into the ocean several kilometers from the coast of Mizu no Kuni. His arrival is far, far quicker than it would have been by foot, and he hopes that this is what gives him a bit of time to figure out what the best course of action is. Kirigakur is so far removed from the majority of the shinobi nations that it's often hard to get any information from them. But his mission remains, ascertain the status of any Jinchuriki and only take action if the situation isn't viable for defense against the Akatsuki. It might be too much to ask for a warm welcome, given that someone of his growing reputation would be seen as a potential invader, which is why he decided to kit out with armor. He is strong, not stupid. It's said that the Mizukage has something of a temper, and the seven ninja swordsmen are all powerful shinobi. Presuming that there are any left that haven't gone rogue in some capacity. So he would approach as diplomatically as he can manage. Not worried about his own safety, but more so for the success of the mission in warning them of the Akatsuki and asking them to agree to a cage summit. The mist is honestly the biggest pain. It's so loaded with chakra that even his sight can't penetrate all the way through, but it's raising red flags in his head. Such a dense Kirigakura no jutsu would only realistically be used in an actual battle scenario unless it's how Kiri detects intruders. Resurfacing on the sea water by foot, he starts walking his way to the nearest chakra signatures to try and find out exactly what's going on. Using the affinity to Sutan given by the Rinnegan, he draws all water from his form and lets it rejoin the sea. A slight flitter at the end of his senses has him on guard, and the tiniest poke against his sandal has him leaping into the air and drawing his gun by. He swings it forward to meet a slim blade with alternating sharp prongs. A good ten feet behind him, its twin launches out of the surface of the water, riding upon a thin fang and heading straight towards his back. Half a dozen more water fangs spear out with precision and chase him. Naruto swings across them, punting one of the swords into the water and dodging the spearing torrents. The oppressive mist is making things harder, so he charges his gun by with wind chakra, making it glow white. He whips up a gust, not enough to agitate the surface anymore but to at least make it clear who he's fighting. But the mist regenerated quickly, and he didn't spot anything within his vicinity. The water under his feet is extremely dense, but he can't pinpoint the person or people doing it. It's disturbing that even his legendary sense can't accurately find anything. Fighting Kiri Shinobi with their home field advantage is proving more annoying than expected. But he can adapt. Uchiha Naruto doesn't give up. He makes a few signs with his left hand and dips it into the water. Raten, Bakurai Depth Charge. The dark blue water glows and crackles as the lighting chakra spreads through it, but all of it is channeled and caught into a network that sends it straight into the twin blades. They come back swinging and stabbing, now sparking with lightning. Naruto narrows his eyes. Even through the mist, he could see the resemblance between those pathways and a human chakra pathway system. And then he grins, now understanding just what kind of threat he's facing. He focuses chakra to his eyes and uses them to send a genjutsu straight into the water. Fusikoi malfeasance. His chakra overpowers the control needed for the shinobi to stretch themselves over the large body of water, and the glowing ley lines shrink to human size. The tendrils holding the blades sink in and vanish. Hozuki clan Hydenjutsu, hydrification. Naruto speaks to the mist and sea. Wielding blades that perfectly circumvent its weakness to lightning chakra. Are you one of the seven ninja swordsmen of the mist? You could say that. A man's voice reaches his ears from every direction at once. You're in the bloody mist now, stranger. I'm on a diplomatic mission to speak with the Mizukage. I guess you haven't heard, Kek. The Mizukage went nuts and started killing every Keke Genkai shinobi in the village. You won't be able to talk to him if you tried. Naruto exhales a sigh of annoyance. That makes things complicated, and he hasn't even really started yet. Who do I speak to then, to resolve this? Naruto dodges two charged blades with a cartwheel backwards. Kiri shinobi are quite clearly mad without an insane Mizukage. 
we got something of a resistance going if you feel like helping out a bit. Another high speed slash, blocked with his gun by before the man immediately retreats into the mist. Even as he gives the olive branch, he still won't stop attacking. Why don't you stop attacking me so that you can introduce me to your faction then? Kek, sorry Konoha Shinobi. It's just customary to greet outsiders warmly in Kirigakur. Ah. Kiri doesn't want to let outsiders in at all, so they're trying to scare them off before they get close. Things must be bad. As much as I love the thrill of the fight, I am here on business. Naruto stows his gun by. Evidently, it's not enough to dissuade the Hozuki and Naruto feels several dozen projectiles of water launch at him quickly. Naruto sighs again, flipping through the volley and dashing towards his original goal, actual land. You're holding out on me, Konoha Shinobi. The voice follows him eagerly. You have no idea how much. Believe me when I say that I don't like being interrupted when I'm busy. Show me. Another enormous volley of water projectiles are sent straight at him, along with lightning currents from every direction. Naruto raises both arms out, projecting a translucent shield in front of his form. Gakito. Every shred of chakra being sent at him and permeating the atmosphere is steadily absorbed into the shield. The Kirigakura no Jutsu vanishes quickly. When sunlight finally peers through, the stunned man that had been fighting him is revealed to be barely older than Naruto himself. Well. The man starts uncertainly, but with his sharp tooth grin widening. You certainly made me eat my words. And you ruined my silent killing technique too. The man readies his dual blades again, sparking with chakra. I'm Hozuki Mangetsu. He introduces merrily. And is stabbed from behind, through his shoulder with a black rod that completely annihilates any control over his chakra. I am Uchiha Naruto, is Naruto's whisper into his ear. And you're going to show me where I can find your leader. The Naruto that absorbed the ninjutsu splashes into the sea, revealing it to be a water clone. Meisama. Ao calls upon her, taking her attention away from grimy map stained with dirty handprints. Ao. May greets in return, blowing a sweaty bang of auburn hair from her eyes. She took a while to adjust to being called Meisama with reverence rather than standard formality. True, she did come from a well-known family famed for various keke genkai and shinobi skills, but she'd always been treated with disinterest and later on, disdained by the general population once whispers began to spread about the abominable mutants known as Keke Genkai Shinobi. May becomes increasingly bitter when she understands that Yagura's crazed behavior had been leading to this from the start. The vast majority of the resource-providing civilians had been of the mind that since it didn't really affect them, then they could remain apathetic to the decreasing human condition of genetically gifted people. They'd stayed in Kirigakur, providing their trades and services to the people that would hunt them down for the crime of being born. The resistance has survived this long on strength and hardiness, thieving when needed and dominating territory to gain tactical advantages with their superior power over the opposition's numbers. Some hadn't stood for the blatant tyranny of the Mizukage, even without having a Keke Genkai for some extra sympathy to their cause. Two of the seven ninja swordsmen were displeased with the bloody mist culture that engulfed their nation since Yagura had gone nuts. Mangetsu doesn't care as much for the survival of Keke Genkai Shinobi alone, but rather for the state of weakness that their village has been reduced to. The constant infighting is leaving them vulnerable, and even a bloodthirsty fighter like him is questioning the end game of Yagura's plan. Their isolated island is not completely invulnerable to the woes of the world. Enemies would find easy prey if only they looked. Mangetsu is back from border patrol. Al continues stiffly. Good, we're about to strike at. He's not alone. May narrows her eyes. An intruder? In a manner of speaking. A deep voice echoes through the hall before the meeting room. A pair of footsteps breaks some of the silence of the dank hideout. Mangetsu is first, with a black rod poking from his shoulder. Water splashes ineffectually around it, making it clear that it's not a wound but something that's preventing him from completely liquefying. Mangetsu gets pushed forward and he stumbles to the floor. The figure behind him retracts the strange rod into his hand and steps out of the shadows. Mei and Ao harden their guard and Mangetsu doesn't bother to redraw his kiba. I wouldn't bother, hey. Mangetsu chuckles darkly. Guy could've killed us already if he wanted to. Like that somehow reassures Mei. The giant of a man looks like he's equipped for a war. Crimson armor clinks in a distinctly unstealthy way, and the gun by on his back is already eye-catching on its own. The Konoha forehead protector hiding under a long bang is still clear against above eyes unlike anything she'd seen before. And his chakra, Never has she felt anything more powerful in her life. Who are you? Why are you here? May questions sternly. I am here on behalf of the god I'm Hokage. 
my mission is to confirm the status of your Jinchuriki, and to give the Mizukage an invitation to the Gokage Summit. I've been made aware that particular goal may be out of the question, so I sought to meet the possible replacement of this mad Mizukage and aid them in exchange for an agreement to attend the summit. Why is the Hokage calling for this summit and why do you need to know the status of our Jinchuriki? In addition to that, who are you and what good is one man against the majority of Kiri's military force? May rapid fires are questions, thinking this to be a Konoha trap. Tsunade requests the summit in order to negotiate a ceasefire between the five great shinobi villages. The status of all Jinchuriki is being assessed because of this. A group of s rank criminal shinobi have allied in order to obtain all of the Baijuu and use them against the greater nations. Doing so will give them absolute military superiority, which is the bare-bones ultimate goal of this organization. A tumultuous village is one that is easy to infiltrate and acquire a Jinchuriki or a Baijuu, so the Hokage sent me just in case there's trouble. May watches stiffly as the man approaches casually and unconcerned with them. I am Uchiha Naruto, leader of the Uchiha clan. I am more than enough to end any conflicts occurring in this village, with either faction. So I implore you to consider me carefully. She recognizes the name. An anonymous drop of intel from Konoha's monster Janan team under Hitake Kakashi listed this boy as the greatest threat on the team three years ago. And now he's all grown up and claiming to be the perfect solution to their woes. He looks like the picture, she just hadn't imagined that child could grow up to be this frightening. Chojuro. Escort him outside please. Amiga Kur. Pain isn't too pleased with Madara's prodding. The man had pulled two syringes and taken a sample of his blood along with poking another into his eye after applying some eye drops. The vision in his left eye is blurry, but Madara assures him that Kabuto's solution is safe and would wear off in a few hours. It's always wise to have a backup plan, Pain. Madara slots the blood and enzyme vials into a clear bag. Pain has never lost in battle. Conan defies Madara's word with little inflection. But he is still not immortal. Madara counters. The Rinnegan is an exceptionally versatile and powerful dojutsu but even a master with a pebble can defeat a novice with a shuriken. Why not just take the Rinnegan? If you believe yourself so infallible, you could take these eyes from me and get the job done yourself. Pain interrogates boldly. Think before you speak, boy. It would be a complete waste to rob you of your power for an eye that my body probably can't control. But if it's any consolation, I'll pluck those eyes out if you fail the plan and find someone who can control them. This is part of your destiny as a wielder of the Rinnegan to be a savior of this world. Don't demean yourself with such things. Madara shakes his head in clear annoyance. Madara looks like he's about to whirl away until Zetsu comes sprouting out of the floor. Uchiha Naruto has arrived in Kirigakur. How exciting. Pain's eyes narrow. Madara is unperturbed. I'll make sure that Konoha doesn't acquire the Sanbi, one way or another. Mizu no Kuni, Resistance Camp. Naruto perches cross-legged on a rock with his gun by beside him after being dismissed by Mei while she discusses this development with her council. He is surrounded by a large number of beaten-down shinobi, though he isn't responsible. It seems that this civil war has run them ragged, but they jump up at the opportunity to serve this strong woman. He keeps his amusement hidden as a timid young man shies away from his gaze. Any censor in their group would easily be able to tell just how out of their league he is. It doesn't seem like any of them know who he is however, which leads Naruto to believe that information going into the country is just as scarce as anything going out right now. Who is this guy? One fighter whispers to another. Beats me, but you saw how he manhandled Mangetsu. Crazy strong people shouldn't be here. He's scary. Look at the size of him, and that chakra. Naruto thinks that Mangetsu is strong, but below the pay grade of someone like him. He has potential but then again, Naruto had only seen him with the battlefield advantage. He wonders what else that man has up his sleeve. Kiri's trials of ritual combat to determine who would be the next wielder of one of those legendary blades had produced exceptionally powerful shinobi swordsmen. It is something bloody and unlike anything in the other nations, save for maybe anyone stupid enough to try training shinobi to be completely emotionless. Even Konoha, famed as it is for producing a single genius shinobi regularly every generation doesn't have anything quite this brutal, with academy spars being non-lethal. Every generation in Kiri has the seven swordsmen, and they are always powerful. At least that's what they teach in the academy, but it must have some merit if the intel acquired on this culture long ago was accurate enough to teach to shinobi students. Stay where you are. Chojuro, the boy who escorted him away from the others, keeps a massive blade pointed towards Naruto. Ho? Oh? Is that another one of the seven legendary swords? Naruto asks casually with a tiny grin. 
that's four of you that I've met now. All of you are quite strong, I wonder how you compare to the rest? Chojuro scowls and grips the sword, as if to strike at a moment's notice. What do you say, up for a spar while we wait? Naruto's hand shuffles over to his gun by. Enough. May thunders from behind. Uchiha Naruto. Come here. Naruto stands up and stows the gun by, walking past Chojuro who refuses to put his own blade away. At least one of them has good instincts. Maybe the myths about the swordsmen have truth to them. Here's the deal. You help me overthrow Yagura, and I'll agree to attend the summit as the Mizukage. You'll do your utmost to not destroy the infrastructure of the village, and leave as many civilians alive as possible. May arbitrates. I can agree to that, Naruto acquises easily enough. But I'm also here to verify the safety of your Baiju. May, Ao and the two swordsmen exchange uncertain looks. You know our nutcase Mizukage? He's the Jinchuriki. Mangetsu provides. We believe that he's under the control of an enemy. His personality has taken a drastic shift over the past years. Ao speaks up, likely to convince Naruto to stay here rather than to go over to the Mizukage personally and aid him instead. We don't think that it's a mental illness, per se. His change was overnight, he started making strange choices like sending unqualified shinobi out on dangerous missions and when we got tired of it and rebelled, all of his efforts went to putting all of us down instead of continuing like he had been. It's like his only goal is the destruction of our village. May explains coolly. Naruto considers this, not really caring if it's a lie but seeing an opportunity to gain agreeable representatives to meet at the summit. The chaos happening in the country would have to end. A united nation would be far stronger against the threat of the Akatsuki than one that is divided. And what of the Baiju? Naruto asks, getting to the point. We will try and capture Yagura, May states. If we can do that, then we can seal the Sanbi into a new Jinchuriki. And if he dies? May's eyes harden in a scowl. Then so be it. It will give us time to set this country in order before it regenerates. Naruto likes this woman. A leader with her head on straight. Very well. In exchange for my help, you'll attend the summit. Deal? May puts her hand out, and Naruto takes it. Deal. The dark alleys of Kirigakura are encompassed in a fine mist. The paths have little visibility after a few short feet, and if not for the street lamps and house lights, it would be nearly impossible to navigate the streets without knowing them like the back of one's hand. Thin wires can barely be seen overhead for long wire fighters. They'd be invisible if not for the tiniest glimmers of light reflecting off of them. This district is isolated by comparison to the rest of the suburbs, being accessible by only two bridges over a wide moat. But ever vigilant, loyal Jounin patrol the streets and keep trained eyes on any suspicious movement. Any signs of rebellion are put down swiftly, although civilians have little to worry about in that regard. Some wonder how long it will take before they are targeted to satisfy the Mizukage's bloodlust. Most shinobi loyal to the Mizukage's bloody mist regime are all for the idea of civilians earning their keep through conquest and battle. To take the fight against each other to the rest of the world. Anyone criticizing this has their life swiftly ended. Or at least, live to fight another day with Terumi Mei's pathetic rebellion. A Jounin looks up as a wire slaps against another, and another wire launches across the rooftops. He straightens and puts his respirator over his mouth, not wanting his lungs burned from the inside out by Boyle Shinobi. He looks down at his gloved hands, and sees faint speckles of green dust sweep across them. Glancing up, he feels a cold wind on his exposed cheeks and eyes. Around him, civilians returning to their homes begin to stumble. Chemical attack? He asks himself, catching a woman before she and the baby she is carrying fall to the ground. He looks at the pale and unhealthily skinny child, and wonders how long it will take for the terrorist to be put down. He jumps at the sound of an explosion, but it sounds muffled. Almost inert. It's like thumping noise, coming down the street and getting closer and closer. He shimmies the fainted woman into a stall and lies her and the child down. He peeks his head back out and sees flashing coming closer, along with the terrible noise. He readies his kunai. All of a sudden, a great thump sends a person practically rolling down the street. He assesses this man, and sees a large signature sword in his hands, less a blade and more of a reel of explosive tags. Shibuki? He sputters, looking at the foggy blast sword. The bearded man holding it growls at him and bears jagged shark teeth. Don stand there boy. The bloodline mutants are here. Swallowing, he readies his kunai and dashes horizontally along the building to flank from the trespasser's side. He can see a white glow in a strange curved shape through the mist. Several of his comrades converge on their location, and they leap into the mist to attack Jinpachi's foe. 
as their various blades strike, they are all stopped by thick roots that spontaneously erupt from the ground. A hollowing scream echoes through the street, and the Jounin only has time to register one skewered torso fly past him and land with a wet slap. And my legs. The other man rasps weakly through his own respirator. He faces forward after glimpsing at the mutilated Chounin, knowing that one would only have a minute to survive at best. A massive wrapping of explosive tags launches around the mysterious assailant, all of them pointing directly towards a singular, contained explosion that would vaporize anything inside its radius. He doesn't bother moving, he instead looks for other threats. He doesn't see or smell anything, but another mute explosion is a strange thing to hear when Jinpachi is the one fighting. He's right next to the action and yet, the entire battle doesn't seem chaotic. There are flashes of light where the explosions should be, but looking at the scroll of explosive tags, he sees that each explosion is seemingly swallowed by a translucent shield that's transferring all of the energy into a fan-like weapon. On closer inspection, it's almost as though the man's armor is glowing white, and is absorbing much of the explosive force and diverting its energy as well. And then he is looking at one eye. It's not a familiar one. There is something eerie and frightening about this inhuman eye, and it feels as though time is slowing down as he aims his kunai straight for it. Uchihagishi. Everything feels hot. Scorching and blinding. A single second feels like an eternity as he tries to chase away the flashing in his eyes by blinking. The chaos around him doesn't stop, but everything feels so gone. When the brightness in his eyes leaves, his respirator falls from his mouth with a long trail of spittle. He realizes that he's propped against a wall. Everything still feels hot. He tries to move but only his eyes obey. They trail downwards. Stumps is not the right word, given the shattered bone fragments poking out from where his elbows used to be. His breath stops entirely. He can't drag in any air, and his eyes go further and see that there is nothing left from his ribcage down. Blinding panic consumes his mind but what is left of him does not respond. As if by instinct alone, his mouth opens and shuts soundlessly like a fish out of water. The mysterious monster deflects another onslaught of explosive sword swings before stopping right in front of him. This will all be over soon. A hand is placed on top of his head, and his world is plunged into blissful, unsuffering darkness. Naruto withdraws his hand from the little Jounin's mind after doing a bit of searching in it through his last moments. Suten Ninjutsu. An upcoming birthday. How to surf and surf life-saving techniques. General hints towards what life is like and the different kinds of struggles they deal with in comparison to Konoha. It's all very interesting, but there is an explosion-happy swordsman trying to kill him so he supposes it's not the best time to scour through the minds of dying men. The blast from using his jutsu had virtually obliterated a building, so maybe it would be best to use a few less destructive jutsu in order to keep to his word about leaving most of the infrastructure intact. This is sad, Munyashi Jinpachi. Naruto taunts provocatively. Zabuza was far more competent than you. Is this really the best you can offer? I thought that the seven swordsmen were meant to be strong, but I see they were scraping the bottom of the barrel with you. Jinpachi bears his jagged teeth but doesn't bite. Seems this one is smarter than he looks. What will you do? To Naruto's surprise, the swordsman shouts a retreat from the district. Regroup. Fall back. The mist begins to dissipate and every shinobi in the area flees to the lake like moat surrounding the main village district a huge home field advantage, and a massive wall to add to defenses. Tactically sound, at least. He catches one shinobi lagging behind the rest and focuses chakra to his eyes. Fusikoi malfeasance. We need the advantage, get on the water and prepare some sutan in jutsu. Jinpachi growls out. That jutsu of his, he can absorb energy and send it straight back at us, but there's gotta be a limit. If you're shit at ninjutsu, use weapons and tags. I gotta look at his headband. He's a Konoha shinobi. One Chonin points out, who'd been slower than the rest. We should sound the alarm that we're under attack. As soon as the man is finished speaking, sirens begin ringing with deafening loudness from the main district. They had a good way on the water surface before Jinpachi speaks again. I get the feeling, Jinpachi spits. That he's working with the rebels. Never mind, get ready. The Chonin nods and pulls out a kunai, and goes to stab Jinpachi. What the hell are ye doing? Jinpachi deflects the attack. You gone mad, boy? No more than your Mizukage. The Chonin smirks, voice smooth and calm. He weaves through the men trying to stop him with unseen grace, continuing to assault Jinpachi. I don want to kill you boy. Snap out of it. The Chonin smirks at him and continues to attack. It's Genjutsu. We gotta snap him out of it. Jinpachi would have just killed him, but they're low on healthy troops as it is. 
That prick is controlling him, then it's probably to see what I can do to break him out of it. Kai. A Jounin attempts after grabbing the still Cho Nin's shoulder. Nice try, but you'll need more control to throw off my chakra. The possessed Cho Nin grabs the hand, pulling it into a lock and snapping it at the elbow. Jinpachi unreels some blank scroll paper from the blade, but before he can try and seal the Cho Nin to snap him out of the Genjutsu, a wire goes spearing through the Genjutsu victim's heart. The needle sweeps around as if by its own will and lands in the hand of a tall and gangly blonde man. Hey hey hey. You've gone soft, Jinpachi. Kushimaru. Jinpachi nods at him. At least that's one problem solved. Someone tend to that broken arm. I could tend to that, I'm something of a medic nin. The possessed Cho Nin speaks up, seemingly unaffected by having his heart skewered. A talking corpse? Hey hey hey. You should be dead. Kushimaru chuckles flamboyantly. The persistent smile on the Cho Nin's face doesn't leave. He pulls one explosive tag out of his pouch. Gojo Kibaku Fuda moodily multiplying explosive tags. One tag becomes two, then four, then eight, and the remainder of the squad only has time to run before the inevitable consecutive explosions. One of the braver ones dives into the water and pulls the Cho Nin under, and essentially diffuses the walking bomb at the cost of his own life. Fuck. Jinpachi curses. The ability to control another's actions is a trait of the Uchiha clan, Kek. I suggest not looking at his eyes, you might yet live to tell the tale, Jinpachi. Here he comes. Jinpachi mutters, eyeing the armored monster casually approaching them on the water. They should really be with the main force to stop the rebel invasion, but this man. I am Uchiha Naruto. He introduces with the same nonchalant inflection he used when speaking through his Genjutsu captive. You're dead meat boy. Jinpachi snarls. You're in shark-infested waters now. Looks like sashimi from here. You've been struggling as it is. But since I'm generous, I'll give you one chance to surrender and join Terumi Mei's resistance before I skin you alive. Should I keep my eyes closed to make things even, or are you perhaps overconfident? Those abominations are more dangerous to Kiri than we are. Jinpachi readies himself. Don't underestimate him, Kushimaru. You know what these Uchiha are like. Jinpachi gives some signals behind his back, ordering the other shinobi to engage in some preemptive action. They circle around Naruto, who does nothing to dissuade them. It would be wise for you to surrender. I have you surrounded. Naruto states with offhanded, joking arrogance, grating on Jinpachi's nerves. Heavy rain starts pelting the lake's surface, but it's turning the surface black and murky. Rain? Naruto holds his gloves hands out, wiping the black droplets from his wrist as if to test what it is. Jinpachi slams the blast sword against the darkening water, causing it to erupt in fire. The surrounding shinobi all weave hand signs without pause. Oil! Naruto exclaims, appearing to be excited at the unique fighting method. Sutan, because we show ha exploding water colliding wave. An eruption of water makes the lake unsteady as it's dragged into the giant, oil-filled flaming well. The wave itself eclipses the wall surrounding the village. Thin, nearly invisible wires circle around Naruto limiting ways of escape. Jinpachi throws out a long scroll from his blade, filled entirely with explosive tags. Naruto gives a light swing of his gun by. It generates the tiniest of gusts to redirect the oil rain to in front of him rather than on him, and as he stows the weapon and puts his hands forward, the oil is seemingly drawn off of him and ditched into the lake. Most impressive Naruto smirks darkly and uses the horse sign. Katan, Goka Mekiaku Great Fire Annihilation. A wall of flames unlike anything Jinpachi had ever seen collides with the wave into his frustration, actually contests it with sheer velocity alone. But to him, it doesn't matter. The fool has failed to consider Jinpachi and Kushimaru's attacks. Or so he thought. Until the etheric blue glow of a demonic ribcage simply absorbed most of the explosive force of the tags and keeps the wrapped wires tight around its form instead of Naruto himself. The blue construct appears fractured but not broken. The skeletal shield unravels into dozens of similarly colored chains, tipped with dragon-like heads with glowing yellow eyes. They spear out and begin a deadly chase of every one of the Kiri shinobi. Very quickly, many of them find themselves staring at their own hearts that are plucked from their chests in the mouths of the shackled dragons. If they aren't already dead from the quick maiming, they soon would be. As the chains crash into the waves through the inferno, the oil in the water is either burned away entirely or dissipates as uncontrolled chakra does. Jinpachi manages to deflect the fast-moving chains and dodge them with some effort, but his explosive weapon is rendered seemingly useless against the chains. 
Hutching them makes his weapon harmless, so all he can do is try and set it off midair with a carefully manipulated sutin against the edge to knock them back. Kushimaru has less trouble, being far quicker between the two of them but can't find an opportunity to attack. But they are whittling down, already it's just the swordsmen remaining. If they don't act now then they wouldn't live to fight another day. This is getting boring. Naruto's lips tilt down with dissatisfaction. Kushimaru, Jinpachi hisses. Listen, he can deflect kinetic attacks and ninjutsu but he hasn't shown he can do both at once. All in. Let's end this prick. And look, his feet are exposed when he uses the skeleton chakra, and he dose move. Gotcha. Kushimaru makes some water clones under his feet, and they all swim out with speed for his next assault. Jinpachi forces as much chakra as he can to force it to spawn more tags, and unleashes everything he has in loops around Naruto. Have you gone senile? You've tried this one already. Naruto casually dodges multiple wire blades thrown from the clones. Sutan, Swaryu Udan Water Dragon Jutsu. Jinpachi cast with anger. Naruto leaps into the air after needle blades poke at his sandals, right into the effective radius of the explosive reel. The water dragon surrounds him in laps and the wires thrown seemingly at random, suddenly tighten with extreme speed on Naruto's form. The water dragon drags the explosive tags closer and the wires all align within an unsafe area for Naruto to deflect. You're fucked now. Jinpachi grins wickedly. Naruto grins back, equally evil. Shinra Tensei. Yagura stands with his arms behind his back, chuckling carelessly as he sees the massive shockwave expand and push all the air and debris in the area away. A veritable tsunami is pushed around the moat before it settles not long after, albeit not as calmly as it was before. He knows that the swordsmen are dead long before anyone else. Yagura-sama, please. The rebels are here to seize control, we must push back with full force. Yes, yes. I understand. Yagura turns away from the window to his emergency council. All reserves should be deployed at the main battlefield and at the moat with those intruders. Intruders? It's just one man, dear counselor. Yagura giggles. Yes, perhaps it's best that I make an appearance personally. Looks of relief spread around the room and Yagura's smile widens. Who will be handling troop deployment in your absence? One asks greedily. None of you. Yagura replies, spectacularly candid. Before they can even blink, he whips around with his staff and uses its hooks to dismantle every last person in the room. Yagura laughs madly, leaping out of the window deftly and leaping through the mist of the village, cutting down any of his allies as he did so. Yagura's on the move. Ow! Having witnessed the meeting with the Byakugan, informs Mei. All right. Mangetsu, Kujuro. Take our troops and mop up anyone who doesn't surrender. Ao and I will tend to Yagura before he gets out of hand. Mei barks out. Gotcha. Hi, Mei-sama. Naruto spots the massive moving ball before he bothers to try and sense it, but it rolls through the village and crushes every building in its path without losing any of its momentum. It's coming straight for him however, which makes things a bit easier. He doesn't want to be responsible for more carnage right in the middle of the village, so he takes the active measure of retreat to find some open space without anything at risk of damage or death nearby. But the transformed Jinchuriki bounces off the wall like a child's ball, leaping straight after him and bounding off the air itself. Naruto substitutes with multiple imprinted items that he'd left a trail of before finally arriving on the beach that he'd landed at when first coming to Kiri. Makuten, Hobi no Jutsu. A dragon-shaped wooden mask combination of Makuten and Fuenjutsu sprouts from the beach sand and conceals Naruto. The technique and the ground shake violently from the force of the curled-up sandbi, colliding multiple times as Naruto collects its energy into his gun by. The mouth of his jutsu opens up, and Naruto expels as much wind chakra as he could back at the sandbi before it smacks down again. Naruto hasn't fought a fully transformed by Juu before, but he certainly wasn't expecting it to shrug of the jutsu in its entirety so he is forced to leap away and assess the situation while dodging. Too fast to catch with my chains, but too eager to press the advantage for single attacks to deter it. A repeated assault is the next reasonable step, determine how much damage it can take consecutively before it budges and gives an opportunity to disable it. A full frontal assault may be key, seeing as it can bounce off of anything else. Kanzi and Renge o Lotus King A construct of wood sprouts from the sand, armed with hundreds of arms stored behind its back. Naruto strikes quickly as the Sanbi makes a returning run, using every hand to smack into the Baijuu. The arms get blasted away, virtually into sawdust by the spinning monster, but the creature slows down just enough to engage a different way. 
the almost ornamental faces decorating the wood statue above its forehead all shoot out ninjutsu of each basic chakra nature. The sand bee howls angrily and stops in motion entirely, being pushed back by the force. Mukhutan, Mokur Yuu Wood Dragon. Naruto summons wood dragons to bind the three swishing tails, effectively capturing them and preventing the Baijuu from becoming mobile again. Almost got you. Naruto huffs, not quite used to rapid expenditure of chakra on this scale but with plenty left in the tank. He looks at the sanbi in its eye and attempts to subdue it with genjutsu. But it seemingly slips off, not unwilling to rend it under his control but almost as though it's being blocked. His mouth turns down with confusion, but he soon realizes that if Yagura is already under someone's control in his poor state of mind, it wouldn't be so easy to get through to him. Someone as unstable as this couldn't simply be coerced into doing what he wants, especially with the Baijuu defending its territory so to speak. Either one alone would be easy. Together, Genjutsu doesn't have much of a chance. Near translucent blue orbs and dense red ones start appearing in front of the Sanbi's face, and Naruto thinks he may be a bit too close for comfort. Mei and Ao startle at the explosion, more so when an arm of wood as tall as a building lands beside them with a deafening thunk. Naruto lands in front of them after fleeing a barrage of Baiju Dama. We should retreat, Yagura's transformation is perfect synchronization. Mei looks at the rampaging Baiju fearfully. Don't be so hasty. Naruto disregards her fear, remaining in a crouch. Boy, I don't think anyone is strong enough to defeat that. Ao grabs Naruto's shoulder, trying to pull him away. Naruto shrugs him off and brushes his bang off his eye. His two Rinnegan observe the Sanbi as it charges another attack. Focus. Naruto orders for himself. We need to go. Not yet. Naruto leaps into the air, suspending himself with the gravitational forces provided by the Rinnegan. The Baiju Dama grows to eclipse the Sanbi. This would be much easier if I could use Susano. Naruto sighs, but the destructive force of Susano versus Baiju would certainly leave nothing left to defend against the Akatsuki. He sees this as even more motivation to stop them before they can get the Baiju the destruction they wrought is far too potent for anyone to stand a chance against, let alone the Juubi or its Jinchuriki. The Sanbi launches the Baiju Dama, and Naruto looks directly at it. Limbo, who can consecration? May honestly thought she was about to die. As did Ao, given the way he dropped to his knees. Right above them is the massive Baiju Dama. Motionless. As if time itself had stopped and left it paused in the world, a dangerous thing that no one alive gets to look at this close. It's almost mystifying. But Naruto puts his hand on its surface, and sends it straight back at Yagura at the exact same speed. It collides and explodes against the Sanbi's shell, sending chunks of its tail sailing through the air and into the ocean. Her jaw hangs open as pieces of the Sanbi tear away and slowly, all of it is in the ocean. Magnetized to itself, but Yagura is separated. His corpse falls lifelessly to the beach, and the killed Sanbi dissipates into chakra to reform elsewhere. Naruto lands back in front of them, fetching a scroll from his coat. Set your nation in order. I expect you to attend the summit, Mizukage Dono. Looks like you didn't need to do anything, Madara-sama. I would have preferred to keep Yagura locked up somewhere safe, but this is fine as well. Predicted regeneration? A few months at most. I'll be watching. Notify me as soon as it reappears. Chapter 18, The Big Picture. Tsunade tries not to get too distracted from Naruto's slow pacing from one wall to another in her meeting room. He looks twitchy, unable to stand or sit still. He's at least discarded his armor to the floor so it would stop the annoying rattling, but he seems mentally exhausted more than physically. His hair is all out of his face, something unusual to her given how long he's kept it over one eye. He has mastered a prototype of Mugen Tsukiyomi. Naruto reveals grimly. She doesn't need to guess who he is. The Sanbi Jinchuriki was under a powerful genjutsu unlike anything I've seen before. I believe it exploited the Sanbi's chakra to increase its power. Yagura was seeing something that no one else was, living his dream in reality and completely unaware of what he was actually doing. The perfect tool to cause national chaos, using a village's weapon against them, yet alone that weapon being hosted by the Mizukage. I'm confident that he was behind it. Probably saw it as an opportunity to test his jutsu and get revenge on Kiri. So what actually happened? Naruto, I've never seen you like this before. Naruto shakes off some of his fatigue and gives her a brief rundown on what happened. The Mizukage was killing off Keke Genkai Shinobi and Kiri. I ran into a civil resistance that was trying to overthrow him and offered my help in exchange for a guarantee that the new Mizukage would attend the summit. She'll be corresponding soon. 
and the Jinchuriki? Dead. Yondaime Mizukage Yagura transformed into the Sanbi and I couldn't hold it down long enough to seal it. I had to kill it, so we have a few months tops before it regenerates. The Akatsuki won't sit idly by while we track down all the Baijuu, my actions will spur them into motion. Has Suna been informed? They have. Tsunade nods, trying to ignore how he casually stated he'd killed the Sanbi. What's the concern? It won't make a difference anyway. Naruto mutters with a shake of his head. It'll take time to extract the Aichibi. We would have better luck preventing the sealing into the Ghetto Mazo than we would actually saving the Jinchuriki. It has now been proven to me that Obito may not actually need all the Baijuu to engage Mugen Tsukiyomi. As long as he has a good lot of them and a decent amount of chakra from the rest, it's now feasible that he'll be able to use his prototype version once becoming the Juubi Jinchuriki. It's more important now that we find where the statue is sealed and destroy it. Tsunade stands up midway through his rambling and approaches him. How do you know it's sealed? She asks, leaning against her desk and being more face to face with him. Naruto's ringed eyes look down at her and he pauses his pacing. Because I can't summon it. I should be able to with the Rinnegan but it has to be locked down somewhere that keeps it hidden and disconnected entirely to anyone besides the other Rinnegan wielder. I should begin to search for it, but I can only think of a few likely places. Naruto. Tsunade interrupts sternly. He doesn't deflate. Naruto only looks at her, posture rigid and dare she say, stressed. She touches his collar, dragging out the trademark high brim from where it was tucked on his neck. The smell of his sweat escapes but it doesn't bother her. One thing at a time. Tsunade ushers him over to the cushioned couch. You have to remember that we don't have another you. What you need to do right now before shit hits the fan, is take some deep breaths, relax a bit, spend some time with your fiancé and let others carry burdens too. It will make them strong, and it won't leave you doing a thousand things at once. Tsunade pushes him down into the seat and sits across from him. He lays down on it, arms going slack and legs hanging over the armrest. Naruto is mostly quiet. Deep breaths from strong lungs and the ticking of a clock are the only sounds in the sunset-lit room. Do you know what will happen if they're given a taste of a perfect life? Naruto asks after a moment. I like to imagine that they would take strides to improve their lives so they could get as close to it as they could. Tsunade returns. I am not so confident in them, Naruto retorts, voice reduced to a quiet timbre. Even in our walls, there are fiendish degenerates whose most wild, happy dreams are those of horrors best kept from their victims. They fantasize evil and chaos, but they are kept in line by the light. For as long as moral scrutiny keeps them in line, then they stay their corruption. For as long as there are powers to protect the weak from them. If this dream comes to life, do you think they would accept being broken from it? Do you trust that they'll stop at nothing to achieve their perfect life at the expense of all others? That does not sound any different from how the shinobi world is already. Tsunade counters. Many times it's not a deviant but simply a powerful person that seeks to gain joy by exerting their power to abuse the resource that is the weak. How many have been ripped from their potential because of you? You seek power to gain what you want, and it is those weaker that are than you that pay the price. And yet, this harsh reality based on the hierarchy of tangible power, is a vital tool in the development and continuation of humanity. What good is the escapism of a perfect dream if it costs you your entire species? While everyone's heads are in the sand, they'll be blind to the snakes and spiders that lurk within it. I will concede that my ambition has cost lives, perhaps many innocent ones too, but I will not roll over and die. It is the natural order of life to endure competition. This dream is as good as giving up. There is no room for growth, there is only temptation to give up all your worldly woes when the truth is, that is what makes you strong. Naruto turns onto his side and looks at Tsunade once more. What do the weak do when they do not get their way, and yet they still live? They drag the names of their heroes through the mud. They take out their frustrations on the innocent instead of taking responsibility for themselves. What makes you think that they won't want to be in a reality that is free from all earthly concerns, where they can live out their fantasies and grow fat and weaker from a lack of true struggle, the fight to survive? And that is something very easy to say for you. Tsunade states bluntly. All things considered, you have a good life Naruto. You were born with the most powerful genes the world has seen up until now. You were mentored by people who understood exactly what you needed, and you were blessed with a cunning and intelligent mind. Not everyone is so lucky, and so they have their own struggles that aren't comparable to yours. Perhaps it's time to accept them for all their faults, and learn to see the good in them too. They have potential in their own ways, and they're struggling to survive in the same systems that you are. Maybe it's time for you to grow in not just your power, but in your mind, and overcome your cynicism and turn it into wisdom. From the time they started talking, 
The sunlight fades away completely. Dim lamps are all that light the room, casting shadows of their figures on any surface that would take them. Naruto sits up, and for the first time that she can remember, actually looks like he's having a struggle in his own head. Maybe you're right. He gets up shuffling over to scrape his armor and gun by from the floor. He looks at them dispassionately before making his way to the door. He turns the handle. Maybe it's time that I grow up. Naruto, Tsunade calls out, one last time. You're young, and you have time to learn that you can't take on everything yourself. Don't spread yourself so thin. You've got a lot to live for these days. The old man once told me something about picking my battles, HMPF. Naruto chuckles wryly. The next morning, Kakashi and Shizun are surprised to see Naruto and Karen appear at a taijutsu practice and minor examination of their daughter's class. The parents were there partially to see how Minako is doing, and equal parts of having nothing better to do. All of the students had been carted away by Iruka and another teacher to the Chunin exam stadium, likely to see how they would fare in a larger environment to spar in. Didn't think this was your kind of scene, Naruto. Kakashi comments idly. Karen shakes her head. I don't know what's gotten into him either. Probably wants to make the kids cry with his scary face. He definitely has a face that can do that. Kakashi thinks with some amusement. Kanahagakur is no stranger to scary and eccentric appearances, but Naruto can be a different beast in that regard if he's annoyed or angry. Naruto looks uncharacteristically serious, not a smile nor a deep frown to be seen. He's in his usual get-up of the black Uchiha coat, and his spiky slate hair is in its usual place over his eye. Kakashi can't even remember the last time he's seen Naruto's full face. Just checking in on my new apprentice. Naruto shrugs in a nonchalant manner, unconcerned with the off-filled looks from the parents who know who he is. Apprentice? Shizun asks with wide eyes and more than a little alarm. Understandable, given that Kakashi doesn't think that Naruto would be a very good teacher either. A few of the spectating parents only heard Apprentice and all but flood around Naruto. Some of the kids look over curiously but Iruka manages to rein them in. Are you scouting for an apprentice, Naruto-sama? One hopeful father asks, I gleaming at the potential opportunity. No. Naruto shuts him down curtly. Without a word or a stray look, Naruto walks away from the pack and towards a nervous man and woman who only have eyes for one of the children in the class. Kakashi shares a mystified glance with Shizun and Karen before they follow along, leaving behind the somewhat indignant group. The two are very formally dressed. The woman in particular has an aristocratic beauty that some would slave over themselves to get. As they get closer, the two realize they're being approached. Naruto Dono. They dip their heads respectfully. Naruto is fine. Naruto corrects casually. How is the boy doing? He is. Struggling. With the training, that is. The father gets out with a wince. That's to be expected. This is new to him. It'll take a bit of time before his body adjusts to the new stimuli of physical conditioning and chakra awareness. Naruto explains clinically, but Kakashi feels it's something reassuring to the parents. So it's a common problem? The woman asks hopefully. That's right, Naruto nods, gaining his signature lecture pose that nearly made Kakashi want to tune out. Once he learns to control his chakra, his body will slowly adjust and his tenketsu will train themselves to express it. The human body has eight natural gateways that regulate the flow of chakra so that it won't flow too quickly and burn through the paths. Physical training will help those gates ease up just a little so that he can get a good feel for it. But that is with time, how about his classwork? Good. She beams up at him, perhaps unintentionally but excited at the prospect of her son doing well academically. Fujita is in the top bracket in his class for his studies, or so Iruka sensei tells us. The father responds, rather proudly. Ah. Naruto? Care to introduce us? Shizun asks, somewhat sheepishly. Naruto turns to her with a smile. No. Kakashi hides a snicker as his wife huffs in annoyance. I'm Hitake Shizun, I'm the mother of that little silver-haired menace over there, and this is Kakashi. Shizun introduces, purposefully standing between Naruto and the two unknown parents. Not that it did much, given that Naruto is annoyingly tall and he could just peer over her. Said silver-haired menace is in front of Naruto in a flash, hugging his legs just as she used to. Kakashi and Shizun both roll their eyes, knowing that Minako's attention has been stolen by her big brother and Iruka is unlikely to get it back. They separate and Minako does a little dance, a seemingly familiar game with how Naruto copies what she's doing flawlessly. Seeing him act so ridiculously helped dash some of the uncertainty in the eyes of the unfamiliar parents. My name is Takehito, and this is my wife Mika. 
Take heat or response, formal and dignified. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Mika dips her head courteously. Without further fanfare, Naruto picks up Minako and holds her behind his head. He vaults her straight back into the makeshift ring of students. Take Hito and Mika gasp in horror. Onii chan. Minako screams at him while flying into the fray. Go back to class, brat. Minako huffs midair, twirling gracefully and landing on her feet in the middle of the wide ring. Minako has volunteered for our first match. Do we have any volunteers for her opponent? Iruka calls out to the kids. The prodigy girl? A parent mutters to another. Kakashi feels Naruto bump his elbow. He looks at his former student as he creates a wooden stake and tosses it next to Minako. The wood vanishes, and in its place is a boy with the same spiky silvery hair as the father beside him. The poor boy appears startled and frozen in place. You're cruel, Naruto. Karen shakes her head exasperatedly. Fujita and Minako. Seal of Confrontation. Minako does so without pause, left hand held in the seal while Fujita mimics her shyly. He flinches a bit at the jeering whispers of his classmates. Not much to pick from in the class. Naruto comments candidly and none too quiet. Best get the two with the most potential out of the way first. Kakashi thinks that's a poorly veiled excuse to just do what he came to do and leave. A busybody like Naruto wouldn't want to lurk around for an entire field day for the academy. Hajime. Minako dashes at Fujita, no doubt used to roll her classmates with ease, and this boy is no exception. The clumsy guard he puts up is swiftly locked behind his back and Minako forces him into a kneeling position, arms held in each of Minako's. Kakashi feels Naruto vanish and appear next to Iruka. The sensei was about to call an abrupt victory to Minako through the cheering, but Naruto put his arm up to stop him. Iruka feels like he's in the presence of a different kind of beast whenever Naruto is nearby. It hadn't been so bad when Naruto was just a student. Iruka's rudimentary ability to sense chakra had been used to assess just how well students were adjusting to learning how to use their own. There are a few outliers in every class that are just a little cut above the rest, showing off reserves just big enough to illustrate to each other that they can keep going when others lag behind. Naruto's class had been full of students from shinobi backgrounds, clans at that. People who live for the trade and pass on unusual traits to their kids. Across the board, that class had many children with larger than average reserves. But even back then, one boy dwarfed them in their entirety. The teachers would often discuss Naruto's frightening proclivity towards anything they had to teach him. He devoured it, mastered it, and met everything that was meant to be challenged for experienced students and crushed them like he was born to do it. And now, as if a terrifying premonition is coming true, he stands beside Iruka as one of the legendary shinobi of Konoha who stands as of the present day, peerless. And as much as he doesn't want to admit it, Naruto's outright inhuman ability scares him. Don't call it. Naruto puts an arm up to stop him. This match is finished, look at the boy. Iruka hisses. Monster Naruto may be, but Iruka is the teacher between them. You haven't been out in the field for a while, have you? Naruto's mocking mutter tests Iruka's nerves. Letting him struggle when he has already lost is just going to give his peers another reason to bully him. Letting him give up without a struggle will destroy his ability to claw his way back from defeat. At least this way he can have a chance to test his tenacity. Would you surrender just because an enemy has a kunai to your throat? Iruka bites his tongue, wanting to snap back but finding himself answering the question in his head. He teaches his students to maneuver situations like that very carefully to preserve their lives, primarily through negotiation. It's not until they reach Jounin or primarily Anbu that they learn the whatever-it-takes style of missions. He probably would surrender, knowing his limits and that it's not possible for the average shinobi like him to make the best of all outcomes possible in that scenario. This boy can't be taught the same way you teach your normal students. He is destined for more, and he won't reach that potential unless he has a teacher that understands what he needs to grow into that. This is hardly the first time an academy student has been poached by a skilled shinobi. There are channels so that you can ask for permission to take on an apprentice, and I'm telling you that no one in their right mind will give control of training a boy like this to you when he's clearly not ready. Iruka does not appreciate Naruto's offhanded comments about the quality of the academy training. I have permission from the only people who matter. His parents, and the Hokage. I dare say that the old witch is happy about the arrangement. And besides, who could stop me from training him anyway? Well, maybe the Anbu. But Konoha doesn't do brainwashing anymore, does it? Iruka feels cold at the insinuation. Does Naruto really think that entities in Konoha would conspire to manipulate a child to hate someone? And don't fret too much. 
the boy still needs to be taught the basic crap that I can't be bothered to teach. Reading, writing, blah blah. He'll have as normal a life as he can, but I will be primarily in charge of the rest of his studies when I'm not busy. The sensei looks at the struggling boy, miraculously still holding on despite Minako's attempts to get him to surrender. Fujita's arms very slowly edge forward, showing unusual strength for a child, especially when placed into such a helpless lock. With a roar, Fujita swings his arms overhead and throws Minako off of his back. Minako lands on her feet, still holding his arms but the boy pushes her forward, inching her towards the edge of the ring to win on the technicality of out of play. Minako rolls like a crocodile on the rough ground, spinning Fujita across it and putting him in an arm bar. Iruka thought this would be the end of it, but the boy surprises him again by overcoming the pain and throwing Minako to the ground on his other side again. The moment of triumph doesn't last however, and Minako regains control one last time with a deterring punch in the ribs and a kick to his collarbone. With little fight left in him, Fujita goes slack on the ground. The Uchiha hums, apparently satisfied with what he's seen, and Iruka takes that as his cue to actually call it. Winner, Minako. What did Naruto say the kid's surname was again? Er he didn't. Takehito and Mika look nervous and it's somewhat revealing to Kakashi. Despite being awful at fighting, the kid has some insane physical strength for his age. To outright overpower Minako, who has been training virtually from the day she could walk on her own two feet, is something that is not ordinarily possible. To have that kind of natural tenacity, you'd have to be seriously genetically gifted. Oh. We won't say anything. Kakashi assures quickly. And it's probably best that Naruto got this out of the way now before anyone picked up on it. If he's publicly stating that Fujita is his apprentice, that'll deter pretty much anyone from trying to get him. He thought it odd that Naruto would do the same thing that other academy teacher did at Naruto's graduation. Let a fight go on for longer than it should and see what arises from it, but he sees that the decision had been made before Naruto had some here in the first place and that his former student was just testing to see how much work would be needed to bring Fujita up to speed. Kakashi has to wonder what Naruto's motivations are in all of this though. It's hard to read into what Naruto is up to most of the time actually, and committing to train a child from a historically rival clan is definitely up the list of weird and quirky decisions that he's made. But then again, how much can he expect from a man who was taught by a ghost? One week later. Naruto watches as his new student slogs through a brutal physical regime that he'd set him on. He's a little surprised that the kid is doing it without any complaints, but the frustration Fujita has at his inability to use ninjutsu thus far is starting to get to him. So maybe Naruto was wrong in his initial assessment and things might need to change. This isn't working. Naruto's lips purse in thought. Kid, come here a minute. Fujita doesn't drop the log he's pushing up and keeps it above his head as he approaches Naruto. Sensei? Blue eyes peek up at him through white spikes of hair. Sit down kiddo, catch your breath. Naruto sits down with him on the grassy plains of the training ground. The ambient noise of the adjacent river is calming but it's barely heard over Fujita's panting. Did I do something wrong? Fujita rasps out. No, what? You've been doing what I've told you to do just fine. Naruto assures. How much do those academy bullies knock down newbies? They'll be in for a surprise when the brat comes back swinging. I still can't use jutsu. Fujita explains his insecurity, disheartened. We just need to figure out how to best bring out your chakra. I want to try something, you know the leaf sticking exercise they teach you in the academy? Yeah. Fujita nods simply. Naruto puts his hands into a ram seal. All right, try the ram sign. I want you to try and focus on calming down, take some deep breaths. Fujita mimics with some confusion. What are the two main components of using the chakra that's inside you? Physical energy and spiritual energy. Fujita parrots the academy lessons. That's right. Now focus on the physical what's happening in and on your body right now? Keep holding the sign. Naruto nudges Fujita's elbows up when they droop. Fujita takes slow and deep breaths. My arms feel sore. I can feel my heartbeat. Good. Now what are you feeling? Are you happy or sad about anything? Are you excited? Do you feel angry? There's a pause before Fujita can answer, with Naruto bumping Fujita's elbows up again when he fails to maintain form for the sign. I feel bad. Why do you feel bad? Naruto presses, but quiet. Private. I don't have friends. Fujita sniffles. And the kids at school are mean to me because I'm not good like they are. It's okay to feel that way sometimes. Naruto assures. Because when things are bad, they can always get better. 
you're starting at the bottom, so you've got everything to win and nothing to lose. Remember your match with Minako? You didn't give up just because she was more skilled than you, you kept going. Why? To prove myself. I don't want to disappoint anyone. I saw you and didn't want you to not train me because I sucked. Fujita chokes out. Turn that into focus. Feel the rhythm of your heart, feel your desire to prove yourself, feel the hot wind in your lungs and your arms hurting to keep going. Feel it, and know it, know that you can only go up. Fujita straightens and keeps his arms up alone this time. His eyes are clenched shut and he breathes deeply. A noise of strain comes from his throat on the exhale. It's right there, Naruto coaxes. It's in your body and your mind. All you have to do is drag it out. A thin veneer of turquoise chakra begins to leak from the tenketsu on his arms. Naruto watches eagerly as Fujita finally manages to access his latent power. The chakra builds up on the boy's skin and flicks off like waves into dust. With excessive effort, Fujita screams and pulls out as much as he can at once, causing the chakra to burst outwards and knock the sitting Naruto on his back. The boy nearly faints, splaying his limbs out on the grass and Naruto laughs. You did it kiddo. Fujita manages to huff out an elated giggle before fainting. Sasuke looks up at the ceiling of the sealscape. He is laying in the ankle-length water, a soft purple glow emitting from the floor but with no obvious source of the light. What is above him appears to be a curved dome of dark, curving clouds with dense and artistic outlines. I don't know what I'm doing with my life. He says aloud. Matatabi pauses her grooming, tongue flicking off fiery paws. The bamboo gate does little to show that she's a caged animal. I feel stagnant. I don't know if I should be going vengeance like I was before, or giving myself to the village entirely. I feel lost. Do you think that perhaps you need a goal? Something to strive for? Matatabi rests her head on crossed paws languidly. Killing my brother was at the top of my list for a long time. Kakashi kind of broke me out of it and helped me find value in things that aren't death. My family. Sasuke breathes in and out while in thought. Naruto. Sakura. Jiraiya Sensei, and everyone in the village that's helped me become more than the child I was before. But where am I supposed to go from here? I know not the motivations of Itachi, but I would not discredit the threat he may still hold to that which you have gained. Matatabi's voice echoes but it's the wisdom in the words that makes something in Sasuke's spine tingle. He's still out there. Sasuke pushes down his personal horror and fear. That will not be changing any time soon, unless action is taken. How many lives is he destroying out there? Perhaps you could inquire into avenues about confronting him at long last. If it will bring you peace and allow you to search out what you desire to do with your life going forward. Be weary, however. Defeating your brother poses a great challenge, but I do not imagine that he will be the feat that will satiate you for the rest of your days. Think carefully on why he must be removed from the equation, think what may come after he is gone. What if by destroying one evil, you allow a worse one to take its place? And that is presuming that the evil is outside the walls of your home, rather than in. You said it yourself that Konoha is more benign than Kumo. Sasuke points out. You should also be speculative of everyone and everything at first glance, especially if you do not completely understand them. Being able to know that you trust someone is a gift, but every human has their own motivations that may clash with your own. The ambition of man leads to butting heads, as you say. Be sure of yourself when you say that you trust someone or trust your village. Matatabi's head nudges forward, a gust of hot wind huffing from her nose. So, what is it that you want? Sasuke is quiet for a few minutes, clearly in thought. Hmm. He vanishes from the sealscape as if he were never there. Sasuke manages to find Naruto after asking Karen where he disappeared to this time. The redhead was willing to lead the way and show him just where he was haunting, all the while filling up a picnic basket and oddly mentioning that Naruto would probably be spending a bit more time in the village from now on. Why do you want to find him anyways? Karen asks, dumping the basket in his arms and letting him do the carrying for her. I just need to ask a few people what they think about what I want to do. Sasuke says with a shrug. What, get a girlfriend? Sasuke manages to smile at the cheek. Nah, more like get permission to kill baddies more. I have no idea what that's supposed to mean so I'm going to ignore it. Karen walks faster toward a training ground. Naruto really is lucky to get a girl like Karen. Fiancé, even. Sasuke will admit that such thoughts hadn't really crossed his mind yet but figures he has the time afforded by youth to figure it out as he goes along. Naruto's training again? Sasuke asks idly, knowing that's probably the case if he's gonna be in the village more. Kinda, Karen alludes.
he's on standby in case there's news from the Akatsuki, but he's getting training in here and there between all the other crap he does. They're in the massive field in no time. Sasuke spots Naruto easy enough, given that he's awkwardly perched on a training post with his legs crossed and his arms clasped into clap. His eyes are closed, and it's something kind of weird to see Naruto so perfectly still. You told me you were training. Not relaxing. Karen shouts indignantly. Naruto seemingly ignores her, or at least isn't aware of her, which is even more unusual. Karen seems taken aback by the lack of reaction and huffs. Under the dense shade of a tree is an ornamental wooden bench, and resting on it is a white-haired child. Conked out and drooling a bit. Clearly exhausted. Hey munchkin, Karen coos sweetly. Big blue eyes slowly open. The kid sits up, blinking and rubbing his face. Sensei's girlfriend? Sensei? Someone gave Naruto permission to teach a child? Aha! You can call me Karen, sweetie. I bought you both some food so you can get back to training. Cool. The kid perks up. I can't believe he just let you lay here like that. Karen ruffles his hair. What's the big bad Naruto doing anyway? Dunno, Ju woke up. Let's go wake up that lazy bum. Sasuke, help yourself. Sasuke takes Fujita's place on the bench and does exactly that. Karen makes some good food, he'd be stupid not to get some before Naruto can devour what's left. He observes as Karen lifts the boy onto her shoulders and lets him pull on Naruto's face, making him do silly faces while the two giggled happily. All right. Naruto shouts at the top of his lungs. I get it. I'm paying attention now. Satisfied? You should be paying more attention to me in the first place. Sasuke felt the raw emotion in Naruto's groan of pure annoyance. Naruto picks up Karen in a bridal carry and shakes her threateningly over the river. Don't you dare. Karen laughs, clutching onto his shoulders. Yes, yes. I suppose I should take care of you. Just this once. Gross. Fujita cringes, making Sasuke smile. Naruto and Karen make their way back to the bench, swinging around and in their own little world before Naruto extends it into a loop. What's up? Naruto asks, diverting attention from his needy fiancé. Know anything about Anbu? Mid-sip, Naruto looks at him directly. I can answer that. Karen states matter-of-factly and puts on her best Uchiha Naruto impression. Killed a few in my day. Not really sure about him to be honest, they're just masked fodder to me, same as everyone else. Sasuke's lips twitch. Naruto's quiet protest of I don't sound like that is resolutely ignored, despite it being way too accurate. Look, she's right. I don't really know much about Anbu at all. I know Kakashi had a long stint with them, same with that Makutan friend of yours. But if someone as prolific as Kakashi can get in, I think you probably have a good shot at it too. That's what I'm confused about, actually. Lots of Anbu are recognizable, even in uniform. I think Kakashi used to tell us that he used Chidori and a Sharingan on his missions, so I'm starting to think it's not entirely about just being stealthy and covert. Sasuke utters his skepticism. Um, Fujita chimes in shyly. Tsunade Ba-sama told me that different teams do different things. It um. Might be the same, right? A reasonable comparison. Naruto acknowledges quickly, making the kid beam. Come to think of it, actually, I know that Iwagakur has a famous Anbu division based around demolition specialists, some of which are shinobi using the Bakuten Keke Genkai. The Naidaim Hokage fought an Anbu division of 20s rank shinobi from Kumagakur, and there's the hunter division in Kirigakur. There's bound to be sects of Anbu that do different things or simply act as elite unit versions of Janan squads, covering each other's weaknesses and taking on the most difficult missions. Sasuke listens carefully through the nuggets of truth that Naruto sometimes deigns to let free. But on the other hand, I haven't been in Anbu so I don't know how it works internally. There's probably a whole bunch of bureaucratic crap you'll have to slog through too. I guess I'll go see our sensei then. Thanks for the food, Karen. You're welcome. Karen chirps. The food makes it all worth it. Naruto puts an arm over his eyes to block out what sun is coming in through the leaves, but the tiny smile on his face lets Sasuke in on something already. Oh? Karen sounds unimpressed. Am I not enough on my own? You might be too much for me to handle. Karen flicks her sassily. Yep. I'm definitely too good to you sometimes. It's hard when you don't treat me like I deserve. Yep, the smile on Naruto's face widens as he looks cheekily at Sasuke. Never seen her satisfied. Sasuke lets out an uncontrolled snicker at the surprise innuendo. Karen's face matches her hair. Not in front of Fujita. 
Karen hisses in embarrassment. And you. Don't encourage his stupid jokes. Gross. Fujita proclaims once more, accurately guessing weird adult stuff. Yeah kid, Sasuke agrees with another snicker. Gross. Sasuke explains his talk with Naruto and his motivations for asking about it in the first place to Kakashi, who listens carefully as usual with his students. We do have a hunter division. You might call them bounty hunters, even. Kakashi reveals calmly, almost reminiscent. But the risk can't outweigh the reward when it comes to hunting missing nin from Konoha. Orochimaru got away with it for so long because realistically, he was too strong for so long and it's too much to expect an Anbu squad to be able to take him down. Anbu will go after easier targets simply for the fact that they're less likely to die, or they pose a security threat in the way of intel. When it comes to people like Orishimaru and Itachi, all you can really do is change security in the village and try to gather intelligence on what they're up to so if they come back, you'll have the home field advantage. Anbu have to get paid too for various personal reasons and if they have responsibilities like families, they can't really go out of their way to kill Nin of that caliber only to die and leave everyone behind. But it's possible that someone skilled enough could be sent after threats of that level to the village? Sasuke questions, not concerned about money or strength. Fact of the matter is, he has grown strong and Matatabi has only exemplified that. If your name is Naruto, sure. Kakashi says offhandedly, making Sasuke scowl a bit. Don't take this the wrong way. Getting into Anbu is the easy part, it's gaining a mission record and definitive accolades that warrant risking your life to take these people down. That's the hard part. You've been gone for two years and the only person who really knows what you're capable of is Jiraiya-sama. Naruto taking down Orochimaru means he would be a shoe in for basically any threat that might need to preemptively need action taken on. You'd need some experience on paper if you want to go after Itachi. You'll be starting from the bottom. That's fine by me, but Itachi and the Akatsuki won't wait. Anbu or not, I'll do whatever it takes to protect Konoha from them. Kakashi slumps on his sofa. Look at you kids, all grown up and talking about stuff like this. It's enough to make a man feel old. You are old. Sasuke gets out before a bottle cap nails him in the forehead. But in all seriousness, Anbu isn't just about covert ops like some believe. The mask isn't about hiding your identity, it's a personal acknowledgement that you're surrendering your very being to the village and all its inhabitants. Sometimes, you're gonna do things that you don't agree with for the sake of Konoha. Are you prepared to sacrifice your life, knowing what you are and your deterrence value to the village? Could you risk your life and Konoha's possession of the Nibi? I'm certain of my power and my devotion to the village. There are things I want to protect, and I'll do it from the light or the shadows. Kakashi heaves a great sigh as he stands up. He puts a fatherly hand on Sasuke's shoulder. All right. I'll draft up a recommendation for you. Sakura shifts uncomfortably while reading through a stack of papers. Sitting across from her in her new apartment is Neji, who'd asked her to look into the damage caused by cursed seals a while ago. Initially, she hadn't thought much of it. But Neji had presented a very real and non-theoretical mark, and offered himself and his father as subjects to evaluate the progressive damage over time that prolonged activation of it could cause. She was fascinated, and that fascination turned to acute horror on realizing that Neji had been getting exposed to it for as long as he could remember. I'm pretty sure this is illegal. Sakura bobs her head with wide eyes and pursed lips. If Tsunade-sama knew that the mark actually did damage, she'd say hell to the Hyuga and either kick him out of the village or force them to remove the marks. And that's only a part of the issue. Neji daintily puts his teacup down. As far as I've been able to gather, the seal only came into use a few years after the Sandaime Hokage came into power. It was pitched as bloodline protection that would destroy the eyes of a dojutsu wielder in the event that they passed. It doesn't get used outside of the compound and with clan hide and jutsu protection laws, I can't really go up to Tsunade-sama without any proof that it's essentially a slavery and torture seal. Neji looks tired and burnt out. The bags under his eyes are getting worse every time that she sees him. On his shoulders is the freedom of his clan, and potentially their lives as well if the situation isn't handled delicately. If Tsunade-sama finds out the truth then she will act as she is wont to do, quick and decisive action to remove the problem from the equation entirely. Neji has the chance to figure out how to protect the innocent ones in his clan and to remove the wasteful stains that are the abusers and manipulators, but Sakura thinks that this is a bit much for someone their age to have to do. To be honest Neji, I can only assess the damage done by it. If you want to figure out how it does, then you're probably better off going to see a Fuinjutsu specialist. Sakura feels her lips purse, dissatisfied that she hasn't figured it out entirely yet. You've done enough, Sakura. Neji soothes with a crooked smile that comes out more like a grimace. It's what comes now that has me worried. 
You're going to take this to Hokage-sama? Sakura asks quickly. No. Sakura feels disbelieving and confused. What? What do you mean no? I can't. This is written into the law, if Hokage-sama abolishes it, it will reflect poorly on her and any opposers to her leadership will be up in arms to drag her down for interfering with clan protection laws. She can't be seen making moves to change or abolish legislation like that, it'll stir up civil conflict when Konoha needs to be united to take on the threat of the Akatsuki. Sakura's jaw clamps shut. Neji heaves a weary sigh. Nothing can be done. Propaganda can only really work after this international crisis is done, so all I can really do is wait until they slip up, which they haven't for nearly 50 years now. I don't know if I can petition the daimyo either, for all I know, he's in bed with them too. I don't know what to do. I think you shouldn't underestimate Tsunade-sama. Sakura insists firmly. I'm not, but she can hardly go marching in through the Hyuga compound and demand clan secrets. Sakura thinks hard about what can be done. Her thoughts travel to her teammates, thinking on what they would do in this terrible situation. Sasuke would probably have the same approach as Neji himself. Wait until just the right moment and exploit it as much as conceivably possible, but only after this time of strife is over. Careful and calculated. Watching with the eyes of a hawk, always. Butcher them. Naruto would say. Can't torture you if they're dead. Thanks, you brute. Sakura unintentionally scowls. Maybe. Sakura trails off. I'm all ears if you have anything. Neji's wry comment comes out like a question. Maybe you don't have to spectate your own clan. Maybe you can find out who the big boys are friends with, and wait for them to trip up and make a mistake. Build a big profile of whispers that turn into a shout that no one in the village can ignore. The general population can worry about shaming them and keeping them under wraps while Tsunade-sama doesn't lose manpower dedicating her smart and strong shinobi on figuring out how to do it. Neji's face locks into a stony visage, clearly lost in thought as his mind toils through the possibilities. I think. You may just be on to something. A panicked Cho Nin is on the warpath. Tsunade-sama. What's got you in a tizzy at this time of the day? Sunagakura requests backup. The Kaze Kage is in critical condition and the Aichibi Jinchuriki has been taken by the Akatsuki. Damn it, just as I told them to take a break. Get me Naruto, Sakura, and Team Guy. Alright everyone, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it please consider leaving a like and subscribe. Also I have already posted the entire story over on Patreon if anyone is interested in that. Anyways, until next time, peace.